This is Me and the Helpful Hurricane. Sweet Small Town Romantic Comedy in Good Grief, Idaho. Book 3. Written by Jesse Gussman. Performed by J. Dice. Chapter 1. Lee. I am in trouble. So much trouble. With my boss. I guess for those of you who read the books about my sisters, Claire and Tammy, you might be thinking that you're about to read a romance. I'm sorry, but that's not what you're getting in this book. My name is Lee Harding. Harding is my maiden name, although I was married for two years. I never changed it. I guess that shows how committed I was to the marriage. Kids, we were stupid, right? Anyway, it's been 15 years, and I have no desire to get married again. So, this book is not going to be a romance. I'm sorry, but it's probably going to be mostly about me complaining about my insufferable, arrogant jerk, and since I'm an honest person, I also need to say, very handsome, very smart, very compassionate boss. His name is Doug Ripley. And he is going to kill me when he sees what the ladies at the Cherry Tree Senior Living Center and I have done now. It's Saturday, and he shouldn't be in, but he thrives on doing the unexpected. Or maybe I should say he thrives on catching me doing the unexpected and then slapping me with a reprimand. I'm still under the last reprimand that, if you read Tammy's book, you know about. Just suffice to say, my boss saw more of me than I was planning on when the ladies at the assisted living center and I spent the entire night in the kitchen using plastic wrap and aluminum foil to make ourselves prom dresses. Hey, Sometimes you just have to make your own fun. Doug doesn't understand that. That's what we're doing right now. We, as in me and Gertrude, who has salt and pepper hair that is naturally curly and cut close to her head. She's in her late 70s and she's a hoot. Although the leader, always the leader, of our little group is Agnes who has snow-white hair and looks like the grandmother in Little Red Riding Hood. At least, the way I always picture the granny to look. Kind of old, very sweet, the cooking-baking kind of grandmother, except Agnes has a lot of tricks up her sleeve. She's 80, and she's celebrating her eighth decade on this earth by getting me into as much trouble as she possibly can. <clears throat> Let me rephrase. She doesn't want to die without completing all the items on her bucket list. If you keep reading, you'll hear Agnes talk a lot about her bucket list. It's my job as the activities director at the Cherry Tree Senior Living Center in Good Grief, Idaho, where the ladies are all residents, to provide entertainment and activities. Agnes is my right-hand lady. Sometimes, I think she would do my job better than I do. But she's too busy coming up with crazy ideas and plans to actually have a job. She says now that she's retired, she just retired a couple of years ago in her late 70s, from her job as administrative assistant at a potato packing factory, that she's busier now than she was when she was working. I think Agnes is the kind of lady who was always very busy, but hey, I don't argue with her. Now. I suppose before I tell you why I'm in so much trouble and why I'm sneaking around with a flower shovel in one hand and a bag of dirt in the other, creeping across the yard of Cherry Tree, right behind Agnes, I should tell you about the third member of our group this evening. Her name is Harriet, and you won't be able to miss her. Her hair is dyed bright orange and has been for the last 30 years. Before that, I think it might have been black. But when it turned gray, she decided she'd always wanted to be a redhead. Once she chose the color, it turned out bright orange. She decided it gave her verve and made her flashy, and 
she didn't want to change it. So she's the easiest to pick out, although Agnes's snow white hair sticks out too. Regardless, despite being a redhead, or orange head, whatever you call someone with orange hair, Harriet is the most laid back of the three and most likely to be in the back. Unless I am. Most of the time, I'm okay going along with everything we do, but this is kind of pushing things, and I'm already skating on thin ice, as Doug would say. He has a tendency to use old cliches like that, that we might have grown up with back in the olden days of the 70s and 80s. I assume, although I could be wrong, that he's older than I am, which is pushing 40. Only when men age, they look good. His hair is salt and pepper, but it makes him look distinguished. My hair, which is still more pepper than salt, but is getting to the half and half stage, doesn't make me look distinguished. It just makes me look old. I don't know what Doug looked like when he was younger, but he's getting a little thick around the waist, which, again, doesn't look bad on a man his age. Me? The thickness I've gained around the waist stands out like flashing neon lights on a nativity scene at Christmas time. It looks terrible, in other words. All right, so you already know I have a shovel and a bag of dirt, and I'm crouched down following Agnes, who also has a shovel and a bag of dirt. We're dumping the dirt at the far end of Cherry Tree. I'm not too worried about people inside finding out what we're doing. First of all, there are only ten total residents, three of whom are outside with me. Of the ones who are still inside, most of them are not going to care. None of them are going to be surprised to see that Agnes and Gertrude and Harriet and I are up to some kind of craziness again. The facility was built to hold 50 people. If we don't figure out something to get more people, and fast, it's going to be closing. Gertrude, Agnes, and Harriet don't want to lose their home. All of them have lived their entire lives in Idaho, and they want to stay here. I don't want to lose my job. Not because of getting fired, and not because of Cherry Tree closing. The first being more likely than the second today, for me, anyway. But what else do I have to do on a Saturday morning, very, very early, than to work on digging a hole to China? This is on Agnet's bucket list. I told you, you were going to be hearing about that. All of us know that we're not actually going to get to China, but we're hoping to get a cave big enough at least to hide in. That's what the lady said anyway, and I'm all for it. Well, all for it except I know Doug is going to be extremely upset when he finds out that we've been digging a cave in the beautifully manicured lawn of Cherry Tree. Now, just so you know that I'm not completely crazy or rude, we're not doing it right in the middle, even though that was the softest spot and we thought it would be the easiest. We aren't trying to make trouble on purpose, just trying to have some fun, so we decided to dig our hole off to the side where it would be least noticeable. But we have to put the dirt somewhere, and on the other side of the nursing center in the back, there's already some dirt left over from when it was built five years ago. That seems like the best place. Red, least noticeable place. Another truckload of dirt on that pile won't really make a difference, right? Agnes and I are on a team, and we carry dirt while Gertrude and Harriet dig, putting it in their burlap bags that Harriet whose late husband also worked at the potato packing facility south of town, had from way back, back when they used to use burlap bags. I'm not sure how she managed to get them into Cherry Tree under the watchful eyes of her children, who helped her move in and made sure that she didn't take more than what would fit in her small allotted rooms. But Harriet is one of those people who just seems to have everything you could ever need somewhere on her person or in her possession. She's actually a handy person to have around when you're dealing with someone like Agnes, who never runs out of crazy, seemingly impossible ideas, 
which often have you needing those odd bits of paraphernalia, like duct tape or yarn, which is what we use to sew our coverings together. Our coverings didn't impress Doug much either, not really because we took the leaves off the trees in the front yard of Cherry Tree, but more because we wore the coverings to Walmart. Considering that Agnes, Harriet, and Gertrude are adults in their 70s and 80s and are no strangers to burning their undergarments, they had a small bonfire in the front yard of the assisted living center, which my mom was called to put out. If you've read my sister's books, you know that my mom is the fire chief in good grief. Of course, my mom being who she is, she didn't put the fire out but joined in the party, tossing her own undergarments on the blaze. Since the fire company is all volunteer, she couldn't be fired. Actually, it gave the town something to talk about for a good long while. Winter in Idaho can be long and hard, and people love having us give them something to talk about. Everyone in town except for Doug. But even he knows we need to do something in order to attract new residents to Cherry Tree, or the place is going to close. Agnes has the idea, and I have to agree, that if we're known as the hippest living center in the Northwest, people will want to retire here in droves. I mean, come on, what does Florida weather have on a place where people make coverings, burn their undergarments, and go on whitewater rafting trips? Okay, so we haven't actually gone on a whitewater rafting trip, but that's the plan. Once I sweet talk Doug into it. That is Gertrude's idea. She feels like I need to put more honey in my interactions with Doug. She always says, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. I personally don't have any idea why anyone would want to catch flies. But Gertrude just smiles at me like she knows something I don't and suggests that I be nicer. Then, of course, Agnes comes up with a crazy idea like this that I know is going to cost me my job and is certainly not going to get me any brownie points with Doug. I think the only reason I haven't been fired already is because he hasn't been able to find anyone to take my place. Good grief isn't that big. While the ladies are fun and I enjoy my job, they're known as somewhat of troublemakers around town. We dump our bags of dirt on the pile, and Agnes straightens, a hand on her back. I imitate her position and wonder how someone who's 80 can have so much energy. Hurt? I ask her about her back, knowing that it must. Mine does. It does, but it's hurt for the last 45 years, so this is nothing new. Agnes looks young for 80, but she still has those fine wrinkles around her eyes, and her face wreaths in a smile. The smile wrinkles are deep and pronounced because Agnes spends the majority of every day with that look on her face. I wish I were half as happy. When a person is hanging around Agnes, it's kind of hard not to be happy. That's a beautiful sunrise, she says, looking off to the east where the orange glow is melting with pink and blue above the mountains. It is indeed. I've had plenty of jobs over the years, so I'm not entirely worried about this one, but I do like to be responsible. That light is going to make it more likely that Doug will see us if he happens to drive by, which I think he does every Saturday just to check up on us. Agnes nods, a little bit of twinkle in her eye. You're right. We need to work faster. She hunches down and walk lower. Come on, our hole is almost big enough for one of us to fit into it. If we work hard, all four of us might be able to get into it by this evening. Hey, I don't have to be in it. This is for you ladies, I say, although there is a part of me that thinks it would be fun to hang out with the ladies in their cave. I know, this is not the type of thing that ladies typically enjoy doing, especially senior ladies. But Agnes, Gertrude, and Harriet are not your typical ladies. Agnes shoots me a look that says I'm crazy, but she answers me anyway. We are most definitely making it a four-person cave, 
even if we don't make it to China. I think if we can fit four people into it, I can cross the China Tunnel off my bucket list. My bucket list is so long, I'm not sure I'm ever going to get to the end of it. I'll have to make some alterations, I believe. I've never actually seen her bucket list, but she's not kidding about it. She has a lot of things on it. We hurry back, scrunched over, with me wondering how in the world this lady does it. I guess she grew up in a generation that wasn't afraid to work, and she's done it all her life. You think she'd be happy to retire and play bingo and knit? You'd think wrong if you thought that. Not Agnes. We pass Gertrude and Harriet, scrunched over and carrying their bags of dirt, and Agnes hisses in a whisper. Get down further. If Mr. Ridley drives by, he's going to be able to see us now that it's light. If I'm going to cross this off my bucket list, we've got to hurry, and we can't let him see us. Harriet smiles, although it's kind of lost in the glow of her hair, which is reflecting the sunrise and is rather blinding. At least I don't have to worry about losing her. Not that I would. Agnes would never allow anyone on her team to get lost. I think that's how she sees us at Cherry Tree. We're people on her team, everyone helping to knock off the items on her bucket list. Wait until you see how much dirt we got. Gertrude says, slightly less hissy and not quite as hunched over as we are. That might cause Agnes some consternation, but it will not cause her to love them any less. Agnes is fiercely loyal, and she and Gertrude and Harriet have been friends all their lives. I'm a recent addition to their circle, but they've embraced me wholeheartedly. Probably because I don't shut down their crazy schemes the moment they come up with them. Regardless, if we're going to get this done, Agnes is right. We need to work quickly, and we can't let Doug see us. Chapter 2 Doug I am proud of myself. It's Saturday, my day off. Normally, I am tempted to run by Cherry Tree Senior Living Center where I am the director, because that's just the way I am. I constantly need to check up on things, to check and double check to make sure everything is okay. I take my job seriously and want to do it well. Unfortunately, my activities director has made my life a living... I want to say hell, but that would not be accurate. It's more like a living circus or a zoo with no cages, never knowing when the lion is going to jump out and eat you or someone else, or a whole bunch of someone else's. With my personality, it has been a rough time. But I've convinced myself, and I'm sure I'm right, that Lee, Ms. Harding, is going to behave herself today. She's on a two-week reprimand from the stunt she pulled last week. I don't know how she talks the ladies into these things. I mean, come on, they're 80 years old or thereabouts, and they can't possibly want to do the things she's getting them to do. She got them to go to Walmart wearing nothing but leaves. She called them coverings. Good Grief is a small town, family-oriented. Everyone goes to church. No one was very happy to see ladies in leaves at Walmart. It was a blight on Cherry Tree, one that I haven't been able to erase. The most recent trick she came up with was having the ladies stay up all night using every scrap of plastic wrap and aluminum foil in the kitchen to make themselves skimpy little dress-type things that had woman parts falling out of them all over the place. Well, the only dress I really saw woman parts falling out of was Ms. Harding's. And I turned my back on that. I can say that she was wearing pink nail polish. Bright pink. On her toe. The whole thing was embarrassing, to say the very least. Anyway, sometimes I feel like I've turned into my ex-wife, who was most definitely a princess. It was apparently very shocking to her to find out that when men are at home, they don't smell like woodsy aftershave all the time. In fact, 
After I get done in the restroom, it definitely does not smell like woodsy aftershave, and that seemed to surprise her. Surprise might be too low-key of a word. She was astonished at that. She was also astonished that my body produces gas constantly. I don't know why men's bodies are different than women's and constantly produce air that needs to be expelled, but they do. Anyway, enough about my ex. She's in California with our kids. California is where I grew up, but after she left me, I took the first job that would hire me. That's how I ended up in Idaho. The people are nice here, and the scenery is gorgeous, but it's a dangerous country and also very conservative. Senior Living Center residents can't run around half-naked. I'm never going to get cherry tree filled up to capacity if that's what I have to contend with. Regardless, Ms. Harding is on reprimand, and I know that today will be a quiet day at the assisted care facility. Still, after I've done my yard work and straightened the bricks in my flower planters and hosed off my driveway, I have a little time before sunset, and I decide to take a ride. If my ride takes me past Cherry Tree on the outskirts of Good Grief, then I guess it does. After all, it's Good Grief, and there aren't a lot of places to ride, unless you have an ATV or a snowmobile in the winter. Ms. Harding did take the ladies on snowmobile rides one night this past winter. It was a full moon, and she claimed it was as bright as day. But still, the ladies should not be out in that cold weather. Plus, I'd like to attract some men to our facility. We only have two. But with the ladies being as crazy as they are, it's going to be very hard to find men brave enough to risk living around them. I'm driving down the road. Cherry tree is on my right, and I casually look over, knowing that there's not going to be anything to see. If I had been maybe seven seconds later, that would have been true. Without those extra seven seconds, though, I see something that's enough to make my eyes narrow and my hand hit the turn signal. It's a shadow, dark, and maybe I would not have paid any attention to it at all except there is a bright halo of orange on top of the dark shadow, which looks suspiciously like Miss Harriet's hair. Now, Miss Harriet by herself is a sweet lady and one of my favorite ladies in the nursing home, if a director is allowed to have favorites, which really I don't. But when you get Miss Harriet hooked up with Miss Agnes and Miss Gertrude and Ms. Harding, I can guarantee there's going to be trouble. I don't see any of the other three ladies that I just mentioned, but it does seem a little suspicious that Miss Harriet appears to be hunched over and walking the way you might expect a Marine going through an obstacle course to walk. Even with her Velcro strap shoes that look kind of like army boots, Miss Harriet still does not look the part. I haven't seen the other ladies, but I can almost guarantee you they're there. I pull into the drive slowly my eyes roving across the front lawn. How did I miss the fire truck? Funny that I would see Miss Harriet's hair before I see an actual fire truck sitting in the lawn. It looks like a couple other government cars are sitting in the nearby parking lot. At least, they have official-looking words on the sides of them. Like I needed to see it before I could believe it, my phone rings. I answer, using the hands-free, of course, since I'm still pulling slowly forward toward a parking spot. Hello? Mr. Ripley? An official-sounding voice asks. Yes, I say in my most business-like voice, which I have to say sounds quite professional. Are you the director of the assisted living facility? He asks. I am. I say, wishing with all my heart that I wasn't. I know this is not going to be good. There are actually two fire trucks and four government cars, and I see several people running around with hazmat written on their uniforms. My hands clutch the wheel. I might not be able to find a replacement, 
But I need to fire Ms. Harding. Today. I haven't seen her yet, but I know this is all her fault. We have a situation at the Cherry Tree Senior Living Center, and we need you to come immediately. I'm here, actually. I'll be over in a minute as soon as I park my car. I don't think my jaw can clench any tighter without breaking teeth. I want to strangle a certain long, slender neck. I've had the urge to strangle her almost since we met, but I've never been able to figure out if it's just because I want to touch her so badly or because I do want to strangle her. In my prior life, pre-Ms. Harding, I never wanted to kill anyone. Even my ex, who did try my patience at times. All the time. But I was just as hard for her to deal with, from what she said. So, yes, we deserved each other. I hope the guy she's with now has more patience than I did. I hope he has less gas, too. And when he's done using the restroom, I hope it smells like woodsy musk. It irritates me, the thought that some other man gets to raise my kids. It hardly seems fair that I only get to see them over the summer. I shove the thoughts of my ex and my kids out of my head. This is by far the worst situation that I've had to deal with. Working with Miss Harding is like trying to stop a hurricane. At first, I thought she did everything on purpose, just to make my life miserable. I have to admit, after my experience with my ex, women aren't high on my list of people that I think are nice. After being around Ms. Harding some, I really don't think she means to do all the terrible things she does. I think some people just have that kind of personality where they have the tendency to get themselves involved in things they shouldn't. I suppose it's kind of hopeless to think she will improve. I thought the reprimands might help, but they haven't. I slam my car door shut, glad that I put on a pair of casual slacks and a collared shirt. At least I look the part of a director. Even if I don't feel it right now, I'm pretty angry. My temple is throbbing by the time I walk across the yard to where the fire trucks are parked. I see Ms. Harding's mother, Mrs. Harding, and she throws a hand up. She and I aren't exactly on the greatest terms. Since the last time she was here, she was called to put out a fire, and instead of putting it out, she actually added to it. I can't say anything more about that. It's kind of embarrassing, and I'll just say it's shocking what ladies will do with their undergarments. And that's all I better say. Maybe if I were in a better frame of mind, I would take a minute to admire the sunset. I grew up in California, and while that's a beautiful state, I never fail to be amazed and astounded by the natural beauty of Idaho. We have the best sunsets ever. It was just coincidence, or maybe God working, that caused me to move to Idaho to begin with. But I'd like to stay. Which means I'd like for Cherry Tree to stay in business. Mr. Ripley. An official-looking man in a jacket that says hazmat on it approaches me. I nod. That's me. He sticks his hand out. Richard Woodring, director of the rural branch of the Boise Hazmat Center. I shake his hand and try to ungrit my teeth. What in the world have the ladies, Ms. Harding, been doing that would have precipitated a call to the Hazmat Center? Apparently, you have some folks in your facility who are digging, and they didn't call 611. Digging, I want to say. They're 80-year-old ladies. But I don't. It's not like age precludes whether or not you can dig. But seriously, shouldn't they be inside knitting? Or playing bingo? Or reading or something? Aren't there TV programs on during the day for 80-year-old ladies? I know there are. I know they could. I know that's what they should want to do. All of my training points to that. All of my experience as well. Why have I landed 
in the one assisted care facility in the entire United States where Ms. Harding is also on the payroll? I blame everything that's happening on her. Of course, I don't tell Mr. Woodring that. Yes, digging, he says, checking his clipboard. Apparently, one of the ladies had digging a tunnel to China on her bucket list. He shakes his head a little, as though not quite sure what to do with that information. Neither am I. After all, I know that the ladies know that it isn't possible to dig a tunnel to China. I know they know that. So, apparently, they knew they couldn't dig to China. He says that rather dubiously, like he's not even sure why he's talking about digging holes to China at a senior care facility. I don't really care whether they dig or not, but they happen to strike the sewer line with one of their shovels, and we have a leak. A leak? This doesn't sound good. My job might be on the chopping block as well. My fingers clench. Unfortunately, they're not gripping Ms. Harding's neck. A man can dream. In fact, I have often dreamed of Ms. Harding. The coverings episode, and the prom dress one, have given me plenty of visuals to populate those dreams. When the call came out, we heard raw sewage was flooding the highway, but that turned out to be inaccurate. Apparently. There are a couple of transplants from New York City who have a few Jersey cows on their commune, and they got out. He lifts his shoulder like he sees this all the time. I personally don't think human waste and cow manure look anything alike, but sometimes people, especially city folk, can't seem to tell the difference. I see. I say, even though I really don't. Mr. Woodring continues. So, while they did hit a sewer line and there was a small leak, it's nothing that we need to deal with on a global basis. However, just to be on the safe side, we're securing the area and waiting for the replacement pipe to arrive. How big is it? That seems to be a pertinent question, although this is my first time dealing with anything like this and I'm not sure what to say. I'd say we lost a cup, a pint at most, of sewage. The ladies donated the bags they were using to cart the dirt from here over to the dirt pile behind the facility to put the contaminated dirt in. We shut it off at the main control, asked the residents to not flush for a few hours, and we have the leak contained. Like I said, we're just waiting on the pipe. Since the ladies have already dug it up for us, it shouldn't be any trouble to change it out. We have a plumber and we have a backhoe on call, just in case the ladies aren't enough. If I didn't know any better, I'd almost think Mr. Woodring's lips twitched. I suppose if this weren't my facility, and this wasn't my problem, I could see the humor in the elderly ladies being backed up by a backhoe. But considering this is my facility, and this is my problem, I'm not ready to laugh at it yet. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to see if I can find the ladies and chat with them. I say, trying to sound professional and not annoyed, and not exactly meaning ladies. I mean Ms. Harding. I'm looking forward to this, as I always do. It's so hard to be professional and not annoyed. Annoyance is definitely getting the upper hand. Sure. Mr. Woodring crosses his hands behind his back and rocks back on his heels. I'll let you know if we need anything. I've got your number, although I'll be around till this is taken care of. Do you have any floodlights? He asks, almost as an afterthought. We do. They're in the shed. If you'll let me go get them... No, just tell me where they are and I'll send one of my guys. I tell him, clamping down tight on my annoyance and getting away as soon as I can. I admit I'm marching as I walk away, determined to find Ms. Harding and let her know how I feel about the situation. I'm also going to let her know that she no longer has a job. Chapter 3 
Lee. Stupid cows. Agnes says, one hand on her hip, her shovel dangling from the other. One of the officials took our bags to put the contaminated dirt in. So we no longer have those, and we are out of the hole digging business. Harriet only had four bags. I bet next week this time she'll be stocked up again. That's just the way she is. If I didn't know she lived in good grief all her life, I would have thought she was a wilderness guide. Or a drug dealer. Always prepared, always with the right tools and equipment. Regardless, I know it's just a matter of time until my boss shows up and I'm fired. I'm trying not to let my disgust with the situation affect the ladies. Agnes is disappointed she didn't get this crossed off her bucket list, but everyone had fun. Even the other seven residents are out watching the action. One thing about Cherry Tree, you can't say it's boring. I think it would be more accurate to say stupid people, right? Harriet says, her orange hair shining with the fading glow of the sunset. Someone has brought floodlights over and is turning them on. They make her hair glow a metallic shade of orange. I agree. Anyone who can't tell human waste from cow waste belongs back in the city where they came from. Don't say that, I say quickly. City people can be residents here just as easily as Idaho natives. Their money is just as good, sometimes even better. While there is a lot of natural beauty in Idaho, there aren't a lot of high-paying jobs. That's true for any small town, typically, but people also don't generally live in small towns to make a lot of money. They live there because there are other things that are more important to them. Sorry, I didn't mean to be racist or homophobic or whatever. I was just saying, it's not that hard to tell the difference between a cow patty and human waste. A cow patty is bigger, for one. Gertrude says, backing off her prior statement, which she didn't mean anyway. She just said it because she is frustrated. We had the cave big enough to fit three. If they hadn't insisted on including me, we wouldn't have hit the pipe, and all of this craziness wouldn't be happening. It is just a matter of time before Doug shows up. I've barely had the thought when a figure that is wearing what looks like slacks and a collared shirt approaches. The clothes aren't what clue me in that it is Doug. It is the stomping. He is the only one I can think of who would have any reason to stomp, especially coming in my direction. I brace myself. I don't really want to lose this job, but I've been jobless before, and I was looking for a job when I got this one. I've heard people say that, and it kind of makes me feel braver anyway. Mr. Ripley, Agnes says, doing some kind of sidestep thing that puts her in front of me, and she all of a sudden looks like an old lady rather than a vagabond who's been digging a hole all day. Agnes's ability to go from looking like she is about 20 to looking her age never fails to mystify me. Regardless, she wobbles over to Doug, who stops long enough to talk to her. Even Doug can't resist Agnes and her old lady sweetness. Which makes me think he's not quite as big of a monster as what I think he is. I might be wrong about that. In fact, I think I am. Mr. Ripley, this is all a very big misunderstanding. One that has to do with cow patties and their size and the inability of people from New York City to really know what one is, and their tendency to get manure mixed up with anything and everything, including human waste. I laugh to myself. Maybe I'm about to get fired, but that doesn't mean Agnes still isn't old lady sweet and so very cute. I wish with all my heart that the other 40 spots in the nursing home would fill up because she deserves to have not only more friends, but also the chance for a winter romance. I think she'd enjoy that, and I think her bucket list is meant to cover the fact that she thinks she's beyond the age of romance. I happen to disagree with her on that. I'm not a huge romantic or anything, 
but I do think that most people are happier with someone. That's why God wants us to partner up. N not me. I'm the exception. I tried the partnering thing, and I am definitely much happier alone. I already heard. Doug says, not unkindly. I understand there was a little bit of a misunderstanding, but that doesn't explain the big hole in the front lawn of our facility. Doug doesn't sound quite as professionally stuck up as he usually does. Agnes has that effect on people. Still, he doesn't sound happy or nice. Well, I can explain that too. I think I've mentioned to you a time or two before about my bucket list. You might have. Doug looks impatient now. Every time we get into a scrape like this, Doug insists that it's all my fault. He thinks Agnes is covering for me with the bucket list, and he doesn't realize that it really is Agnes, and Gertrude and Harriet to a lesser extent. I go along with things, even help, just because I know the ladies need to have fun. What's the point in living if you're not enjoying it, especially at their age? I could be wrong, but I also think that Agnes, as sweet as she seems, is a little annoyed at Doug for not allowing her the whitewater rafting trip. That's on her bucket list, too. Technically, he didn't decline her. He declined me. I'd no sooner had the words whitewater rafting out of my mouth before he said no. I think it made Agnes mad. If she doesn't get to go whitewater rafting soon, she'll never get to go. Like she says, she's not getting any younger. Well, one of the items on my bucket list is to dig a hole to China. Obviously, I know that it can't be done, but I've wanted to do it ever since I was a little girl, and I thought that maybe if I could dig a cave instead, that would be almost the same thing. Could you have found a better spot to dig a cave other than the front yard of our facility? Doug asks, and he almost sounds reasonable. I know, however intelligent he sounds, he's no match for Agnes. We could have. The ground is actually softer right over there in the middle. But we wanted to be considerate and not upset you. So we thought digging over here, out of the way, would be the best thing to do. You were being considerate by digging it over here. Doug says, and he doesn't sound like he believes her. Not even a little. Of course, we do try to be considerate. It's our generation, you know. We were raised with manners. I bite back a snort. That was definitely an insult to the generation that Doug and I are from. Who, Agnes would probably say, were not raised with manners. That's real nice of you, Miss Agnes. But I know who the actual perpetrator is, and I'm here to give her her pink slip in a theoretical sense, since I don't actually have a pink slip, but she's fired. I hear the relief in his tone. It's on his face, too. That should take care of all the trouble that we've been having, and my life can get back to normal. Normal life isn't much fun, Mr. Ripley, Agnes says with pity. And you're wrong about Lee. She just comes along to make sure none of us overdo it or get hurt. Again, that's real nice of you to cover for her, but like I said, I know she's behind it all. That's right, I am. I say, just because I know that while Doug can fire me, he can also kick Agnes, Gertrude, and Harriet out of Cherry Tree. I don't want that under any circumstances. They've lived in good grief all of their lives. Where would they go? I knew it. The angles on his face are harsh under the glare of the floodlights. It still doesn't cover the fact that he's a handsome man, distinguished looking and most definitely responsible. He's not my type at all. My ex belonged to a motorcycle gang, and he was whatever the complete opposite of responsible is. At the time, I found that wildly attractive, along with his broad shoulders and slim hips and come-hither smile. 
Surface attractions only. Definitely not something a woman in her right mind wants to be shackled to for the rest of her life. Especially when he uses his come-hither smile on anything female. And those anything females were the exact same as I was, and were deeply attracted to those broad shoulders and slim hips. And since those broad shoulders and slim hips didn't seem to care which female they were with, it ended up making a difference to me, since I did. Still, for some reason, I was attracted to irresponsibility and to dudes who were definitely going to cheat. Never to men who would actually be nice to me, would be faithful, and could hold a job down for more than three months. Goodness, I wouldn't even care about the job as long as they were faithful. Doug definitely fits in that last category, and even though there's always butterflies in my stomach when I talk to him, I know it's not attraction. I'm just worried about my job. Which I've just basically thrown to the wolves with my last statement. Mr. Ripley, excuse me. Harriet says, coming around me and standing shoulder to shoulder with Agnes. I'm thinking I understood what you're saying about pink slips, and I have to say that if you fire Miss Harding, I'm moving out. I gasp, but managed to keep it inaudible. She can't move out. She has nowhere to go. I know it. She knows it. Agnes and Gertrude both know it, too. Same for me. Gertrude announces as she comes around. She's the only one of the ladies who's actually gotten seriously dirty. Besides me, of course. I can't do anything without getting filthy. I can't even birdwatch without getting pooped on. But Agnes and Harriet both look like they've come from an afternoon tea, while Gertrude and I look like we spent the day wrestling alligators. At least Gertrude's hair is short. I'm guessing that mine is frizzed out, with my natural curls springing around and flying everywhere. I probably have dirt on my face, too. Even if I hadn't been digging in the dirt, I would still manage to get smudges on my face. I'm not as bad as my sister Corey but I'm definitely nowhere near the genteel sophistication of my eldest sister, Tammy. Doug stops with his mouth open. I finally realize maybe the ladies are using a bargaining chip I hadn't thought about. The assisted care facility was built to house 50 people. There have been 10 people living in it for the last year. It is up to Doug and I to increase the residency, or it's going to have to close. That is the message from corporate anyway. Unfortunately, Doug feels that we will increase residency by making things as boring as possible. Bingo seven nights a week and afternoon movies, or, if he's really feeling dangerous, a nature walk around the parking lot after our afternoon naps. I've already mentioned how I feel about all that. Anyhow, if three of the ten residents move out, the facility is almost certain to close. I'm sure Doug can find a job somewhere. He came from California, and surely he can find something to do. I can too, although that would probably mean I would have to move away from good grief, which I don't want to do. I spent time away, and I hated it. I'm happy to be back, and I'm really happy to be working here. Assisted living wasn't my first choice, but I fell in love with the residents, and I don't want to leave them. The way they're standing there, reminding me of the three musketeers, shoulder to shoulder and arm in arm, makes me feel like they feel the same way about me. After all, everything that happened is because they wanted to make the cave big enough for four people. They wanted to include me, which makes me feel good, of course. You don't have anywhere else to go. You can't leave. Miss Harding has offered her home to all of us to live there. That's where we'll go if you fire her. I try not to blink, and I try hard not to look shocked, either. Surely there are state mandates about housing seniors in your home. Although, with only three, I could probably do it. It would be fun, for sure. 
I wouldn't have a boss who was constantly trying to get me to play bingo. Okay, between you and me, he has no idea that we actually play strip bingo. If he finds out, I'll know who told him. That's a secret. I'm kind of warming up to the idea of having the ladies in my home, but there's a spot inside of me, somewhere rather nebulous, but I don't really want to walk away from Doug. The thought kind of scares me. Maybe I like him more than I think I do. Actually, I would not say I like him at all. I would say he's annoying, a pain in the butt, a wet blanket and a man who has absolutely no imagination. But the idea of not having him standing over top of me, breathing down my neck, constantly putting me on reprimand because I did something that he considers stupid, while it should make me happy, it kind of makes me feel deflated. Like I actually look forward to seeing his reaction to our latest stunts? Surely not. I've never been one of those ladies who need a man to make me feel fulfilled, or one of those ladies who perk up when men are around, working to impress them. That's definitely not me. At least, I didn't think so. Thankfully, I don't have to examine that too far, because Doug knows he's outnumbered. After all, there are three ladies in front of him, and I'm standing behind them. I feel justified when he says, on second thought, I think I'll just extend her reprimand. He lifts his head up, looking over the shoulders of the ladies, and meets my eyes. His are blue, deep and dark and beautiful. But eyes are just the same as shoulders and hips and six-pack abs. They don't mean anything if the man behind them isn't honest and doesn't have character. Unfortunately, these eyes are gorgeous and I know the man behind them has everything a woman should want. They strike in my heart, giving me a weird sensation. Weird, but not unpleasant. Actually, I like it and am tempted to move forward. Miss Harding, I'm adding two weeks onto your current reprimand. In that amount of time, I do not want you to schedule or participate in any activities outside of the assisted care facility. What about our Walmart run? Harriet asks, and I'm sure she's thinking about how she's going to get her box of orange hair dye. I'll do it. Doug says, and he sounds almost ominous. I bite back a smile. Chapter 4 Doug Three days after Hazmat was on our front lawn, Ms. Harding is once again standing in front of my desk. My stomach twists and gnarls, but irritation isn't the only thing I feel. I don't know why. She's very nondescript. I don't mean that in a mean way. I just mean no one's going to look at her and mistake her for a supermodel. She's not beautiful in any classical sense. I've seen plenty of women in California who come out to try to make it big as an actress and end up staying, moving upstate where I was from, with the perfect suntan and bleached blonde hair and the slender hourglass figure. I dated some of those. Married one. Regret it. At this point in my life, I feel like I'm a little smarter. Anyway, I'm not a great judge on women and their characteristics, but I do know that Mrs. Harding is not going to be playing the lead role in any blockbuster movie. Which probably says something about my maturity level, because I don't care. I'm not feeling this weird push against my irritation that almost feels not really like attraction, but more like a grudging admiration because of the way she looks. It's because of her indomitable spirit. No matter how many times I have her in front of me, She's always grinning, smiling, or at least looking happy, and without fail, her comments are always in defense of the ladies here. Her actions, she claims, and what I've come to believe, are because she truly wants the best for them. So, yeah, it's not like I'm going to propose marriage. 
It's doubly not like I want to kiss her or anything. But there's definitely more than run-of-the-mill irritation backing up in my throat. I also know better than to let her know that. With my ex, any little advantage she had, she milked it for all it was worth. I learned not to give her any, or at least not to let her know about any. So I suppose you have some kind of excuse to explain why I walked into the lunch area and there was a food fight going on? I ask, and I know I sound weary. I just want to make this work. I thought, when I was given the job and told I needed to make the facility look appealing to folks and encourage them to retire here, it wouldn't be very difficult. I mean, who wants to retire in Idaho? But... Other than that, it's not difficult. And even the location, I've kind of gotten over. I suppose I had some prejudice against Idaho coming from California, but Idaho is every bit as beautiful as my home state. In a lot of ways, it's even more beautiful. It feels less restricted and much more free, like I can let my spirit soar, which sounds cheesy, I know, but it's true. No, I don't have any excuses, she says, and I respect that. She never gives me a bunch of BS. It's always the unvarnished truth. I divided everyone up into teams, and I'm the one who put the tables down on their sides so that each team had cover to hide behind. I've already mentioned the war in my chest, something that feels suspiciously like admiration or attraction and irritation. I think irritation is winning out, because Ms. Harding doesn't look the slightest bit sorry. I feel like having her here, standing in my office, has become so commonplace that she doesn't even care anymore. She knows I can't fire her, or I'll lose almost 30% of my residence. If we were at full capacity, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Or if we had a waiting list, which is my dream, it would be totally okay. Not that I want to see anyone leave. I'm actually quite fond of Miss Agnes and Miss Gertrude and Miss Harriet. They've gotten me into enough trouble, given me enough gray hair, but they're great ladies, and if I weren't the director here, I would really be enjoying them. So you actually suggested the food fight? I ask, hoping that I'm wrong. What am I going to do about this? I did. She lifts a shoulder, and I grind my teeth together. She could at least look sorry. I mean, what's the problem with it? If we clean up our mess, and we just throw the food that we were going to eat, we aren't wasting anything, and we're not causing any problems. And it's fun. Do you really think these elderly ladies want to have a food fight? Ms. Harding looks at me like I'm mentally slow. Sometimes when I'm around her, I feel like I am. She opens her mouth, closes it, kind of twists it a little, then opens it again. Yeah, I mean, they were actually having a food fight. Do you think I held them at gunpoint and forced them to do it? Miss Harding looks like the kind of woman who probably packs a gun in her purse. I don't even know what the gun laws are in Idaho. Far less restrictive than California, I would imagine. Maybe I should get myself one. Miss Harding shouldn't have anything up on me. Although our relationship hasn't degenerated to the Wild West gunfight at noon point, it requires more optimism than I possess to think that it won't. I'm sorry, Miss Harding, but with my experience with you, I wouldn't put it past you at all. She should look offended, but she kind of grins, and for the life of me, I can't figure it out but I'm tempted to grin back. This will not do. This will not do at all. I rub my forehead, just as frustrated with myself for having to bite back a grin as I am with her for having the food fight. Can we come to some kind of understanding? Something so that you will not be constantly testing my patience and the bounds of propriety by engaging in things that are off-limits or wrong? Maybe you could more closely define things that are off-limits and or wrong. While I don't think she's mocking me, 
I can't be entirely certain. Because I don't feel like we've done anything that is off limits or wrong. I'm sorry, Miss Harding, but when Hazmat is here, you've done something wrong. She rolls her eyes and crosses her arms over her chest. That was all a big misunderstanding. And while I welcome people from all over the United States to settle in Idaho, because I believe that it's the most beautiful state in the Union, I also think that we need to give leeway to those people because sometimes they come in here and they really don't know heads from tails. I can tell she wants to add something about cow patties and human waste and probably something that's rather irreverent, and I'm glad that she doesn't. I never thought of myself as the blushing kind, but my cheeks do heat at times around her. Most notably, when she was half-dressed in plastic wrap, although it wasn't the half-dressed part that bothered me, it was the half that wasn't dressed that made my cheeks feel very hot. The covering she wore to Walmart also had my cheeks getting hot. Covering being used in a very loose sense, because there wasn't much that was covered. The uncovered part is what figures prominently in my dreams. Still, that strengthens my resolve, because I actually did get in a little bit of trouble with the town council on that. They have modesty standards in Idaho, apparently. That makes them different from California as well. Then I realize maybe she's talking about me. After all, I'm not from New York City, but I'm from California, which is just as bad in an Idahoan's eyes. I mean that kind of tongue-in-cheek. Just as bad being that some of California probably doesn't know heads from tails in Idaho any better than someone from New York City. But that doesn't mean we can't learn. Which makes me feel for the first time that Maybe I'm being too strict? I was hoping we could compromise, I say, although I really have no idea what kind of compromise I'm looking for. Compromise? Her eyebrows go up, and she looks interested. I like that interested look. I kind of wish it were directed at me, although part of me is glad it's not. I don't need a complication like Miss Harding in my life. Plus, once I get Cherry Tree turned around and have that credit to my resume, I think I might go east. Chicago could be fun. Or I could give New York City a spin. Or maybe I'll go back to California. It's a big state, and I can avoid my ex while spending time with my kids. Yes, a compromise. This is some kind of trick? She asks, and she tightens her arms over her chest narrowing her eyes. It's not. I admit that maybe sometimes I am a little bit too tight on the reins, but at the same time, you have to admit that sometimes you get a little out of balance. I'm hoping we can come to a point where both of us are content with the way things are going. After all, I think we both want to keep our jobs, and the way to do that is to entice more people to want to come here. We can't do that with a bad reputation. I don't think we necessarily have a bad reputation. I think we have a fun reputation, and that will entice people. It might entice people who actually are going to live here, but it might not entice the people who are going to be paying for the people to live here, or the ones who are scouting out a facility for their parents or their grandparents. I raise my eyebrows, and she has to admit I'm right. The people who are looking for a place for their parents or grandparents to live are going to have higher standards than the actual parents or grandparents. They're not going to care about whether or not their parents or grandparents are having fun. They want them to be well taken care of at a facility that has a great reputation and a full schedule of activities that normal people enjoy, like bingo and movies and nature walks. I can't argue with that, she concedes. We stare at each other for a moment until she finally says, Did you have an idea for this compromise? I really didn't, but since I suggested it, I suppose it's only right that I come up with something. I steeple my hands together and try to sound conciliatory. 
Maybe you could promise to run things by me before you do them, and I will promise to not say an automatic no. That sounds great. Can we have a whitewater rafting trip? She says, barely giving me time to breathe. No. Her brows fly up. My lips press closed. Right. I think her foot is thumping on the floor, but I'm sitting at my desk and I can't see. I search my brain and remember a flyer I saw in the post office this morning. I dismissed the thought out of hand when I saw it, but now it feels like common ground. There is a book signing and romance author meet and greet at the fire hall tomorrow. How about we let you off your reprimand, and you could take the ladies to that? I feel like I'm being very generous. Not to be rude, but romance novelists aren't exactly known for their upstanding morals and values. We were already going, she says, although she looks a little contrite, like maybe she should have told me about it. Or maybe she was planning on ignoring her reprimand. It should be on the schedule anyway. Maybe it is, and I missed it. Something about food fights and hazmat that just blew the schedule out of my mind. I think the ladies will enjoy that, and I do believe that while it is probably not the most wholesome activity ever, they will have fun. Not wholesome? She asks, scrunching up her nose. We're talking about romance novelists, correct? I mean, they live lurid lives full of debauchery and sin. I really don't consider myself a prude, but I've seen some of the covers on those books. I definitely don't want my daughter hanging out with a romance novelist. I mean, I'm from California, and I'm not a bigot, but they just don't seem like moral people to hang around. Ms. Harding doesn't seem to have that problem, because her lip pulls back, but she doesn't say anything. How about I take them to the book signing at the fire hall, like you suggested, and you think long and hard about the whitewater rafting trip. She lifts her brows, and she actually sounds like she's pleading as she lowers her voice. It's on Miss Agnes's bucket list, and I know you don't really believe there is a list, and I myself have never actually seen it, but Miss Agnes is trying to cross everything off it before she gets too old. She really wants to do this. I picked out a stretch along the Snake River that will take us four days and three nights to go through. It's pretty calm, and most of the tour groups treat you like royalty. I mean, it's not going to be too hard for an 80-year-old. I promise. We've already established the fact that my automatic reaction is no. But Miss Agnes is so sweet and such a dear old lady, it would be hard to decline anything she wants. That's not really my problem, though. This is the first time that Ms. Harding has softened toward me, and I find myself struggling to get the words I know I need to say to come out of my mouth. I clamp my teeth together because rather than saying what I know needs to be said, I'm tempted to say yes, or at least to promise to think about it, when I know I should do no such thing. Who ever heard of residents in a senior living facility going on a whitewater rafting trip? It just isn't done. What if something happens to everyone? Nothing's going to happen. It's whitewater. She puts her fingers up and does air quotes. But it's really not. That's just what it says. It's four days of basically floating on totally calm water absolutely no chance of anything happening. It will thrill Miss Agnes, and she'll be able to cross that off her bucket list. And I promise we will give you no trouble, as much as I have control over that. The ladies always say it's not Miss Harding, and I've never believed them. But Miss Harding kind of slipped up there a little, and for the first time, I think that I might be wrong. I know I shouldn't say this, but I do it anyway. You go to the book signing, take them to see the romance novelists, and I'll think about it. Chapter 5 Lee Do you think she'll sign my book? Gertrude says, clutching Emma St. Clair's latest romantic comedy to her chest. 
That's why we're here, silly. They want to sign your books. No, they're here because they want you to buy their books. Harriet corrects Agnes. I add, they get you to the table where they have their pen, and then they snatch you up and make you buy more. So then you come back next time to get them to sign them again. You sound like you've done this a time or two. Do you happen to be a romance novelist? Agnes asks, irony in her voice. I'm just along for the ride. I've never had romance novelist aspirations, and I've never actually read romances. But if my ladies love them, that's what we'll do. Thankfully, Emma St. Clair has large print books, and apparently they're pretty funny, since Gertrude tends to cackle when she laughs, and when she's reading an Emma St. Clair book, no one can sleep. Probably if Mr. Ripley knew about it, he would forbid her from reading them after 8 p.m. After all, he would claim other residents need their beauty sleep. Maybe he needs it. Actually, he doesn't. He looks pretty fine just the way he is. Regardless, I'm shocked when we arrive at the fire hall and there is a line coming out the door and wrapping around the building, almost clear around and back to the door. I had no idea romance novels were so popular in good grief. We decide before we get in line, we'll walk in and see exactly what's going on. Maybe there's just one super popular romance novelist here, and Emma St. Clair's table will be empty. We walk in. Agnes allows me to go first. My eyes are slightly better, and I think that's why. I scan the room, lifting a hand and waving at my sister Claire, who has almost made it to the table with the long line. I notice right away there are only two tables. I guess I should have known that having a book signing in good grief probably didn't involve a lot of authors, even though it had been billed as a romance reader convention on the flyer in the post office. Apparently, in good grief, convention means two romance writers. There is one woman sitting at the table with the long line in front of her. I read the tag on the corner of her desk, Emma St. Clair. There is a second romance writer sitting at another table, and she must not be nearly as popular since there's no one standing in front of her. I have to squint a little to see the name on the tag, since it is homemade and not nearly as nice as the engraved gold on wood of Emma St. Clair. I can barely make it out. Have any of you ever heard of Jessie Gussman? I ask, looking at her and thinking that she doesn't look like a romance novelist. She actually looks kind of intimidated by the small number of people in the building, and she's kind of huddled in her chair. I feel a little bad for her, but not bad enough to actually buy any of her books. I don't really think about her too much anyway, because I have a rock in my shoe, and I feel like I need to lean down and get it out, but I would prefer to sit in a chair, because somehow I've managed to get it in so far there that I'll have to take my shoe off. Ugh, annoying. I have no idea where I even picked it up. No. Gertrude draws the word out. I've never heard of her, and I'm up on all the latest, all the greatest. If she were good, I would know about her. Then we should go back outside and get in line for Emma St. Clair? I ask, thinking that was the only other option. I'm going to for sure, Gertrude says with determination. I can't even believe that she's here in our little town. Don't think for one second that I'm going to miss my opportunity to get this signed. She waves her book around. I'm going with her. As much as she laughs while reading those books, I'm definitely going to pick up a couple for myself. I don't know anyone who can't use a good laugh, Harriet says as she leaves with Gertrude. If you're okay by yourself, little missy, Agnes says, I'm going with them. I don't have much time to read. I'm too busy with my bucket list. But maybe on a rainy day, I can pick up a book that'll make me laugh. I nod and watch the ladies shuffle out. They'll be fine outside. 
I'm going to find myself a chair somewhere and relax for a bit after I get this horrid rock out of my shoe. Hey, Jesse. Emma St. Clair calls from the table where she sits, somewhat like a queen with her adoring subjects, because obviously the ladies in front of her, and there are some men in the group too, surprisingly, adore her. The other romance novelist lifts her head. Yes? Be a sweetie and run out to my tour bus and grab another box of books. I'm running low. Oh, sure, Emma. Jessie says, jumping up and scurrying away toward the back of the building where, apparently, there is a tour bus parked. I almost go out and see it. We don't get tour buses around, good grief, much. Maybe if we were a little closer to the interstate. But there aren't any hotels in town, and there is no reason for tourists to come here beside the awesome scenery, but pretty much all of Idaho is filled with awesome scenery. I look around the building again. Other than Claire, none of my family is here. Tammy, being an English teacher, probably doesn't read romance novels either, although, again, because of the English teacher background, she still might be interested in an author. If Tammy were here, she was probably here early. Tammy's always early. Now, my sister Corey is exactly the kind of person who reads romance novels, but if she makes it, it won't be until the doors are closing. She'll squeak in at the last minute. I know a few other people in line, but I want to get the rock out of my shoe first. The only chair I see is the one that the unpopular romance author vacated. As my eyes land on it, the back door opens, and she stumbles in, carrying a big box that looks heavy. She lugs it over to Emma St. Clair, who gives her a benevolent and beautiful smile. Thank you, Emma says, her voice sounding exactly the way you think a romance novelist would sound. You're welcome. The second romance novelist, whatever her name was, says, sounding tired and out of breath. Would it be too much trouble for you to unpack them so I don't have to stop signing books? Emma St. Clair asks sweetly with kindness in her eyes. Oh, no. I can do that. The line is clear around the building. You'd probably better get signing if you're going to get through all those people. Emma nods, and with one more look at the second romance novelist who is already on her knees cracking open the box, she picks up her pen and greets the next person in line. I probably should offer to go and help the other romance novelist, just in case someone comes in and actually wants to see her. But I'm going to get the rock out of my shoe first. After a couple of seconds, I tiptoe over to her chair and sit down, glancing in her direction, but she doesn't even notice, since she has her face in the box. If I'm not mistaken, she might have taken a couple of books out, looked them over, and now it looks like she might have started to read one. Maybe that poor Jamie person, or whatever her name was, will figure out what Emma's books have that are so amazing and be able to improve her own writing some. For her sake, I hope so. I take my shoe off, and sure enough, there's a sharp little stone in the bottom of it that pops into my hand as I dump it out. As bad as the bottom of my foot is hurting, it might have made it bleed. This isn't the time to check for that, so I slip my shoe back on and am tying it when I hear, I should have known. My head jerks up. Doug is standing there, his arms crossed, and looking at me like I just committed a murder. I don't think I have, but I look around just in case there's a dead body. I don't see one, so I look back. What? You write lurid romance novels in your spare time, he says, like that explains everything. Now, I don't read romance, but that doesn't mean that I think there's something wrong with it. It's just not the type of book I enjoy. My eyes narrow. If he doesn't think romance novels are wholesome, maybe he has something against romance novelists, too. And even though I'm not a romance novelist, he thinks I am so I obviously have to be offended on account of romance novelists everywhere. 
I cross my arms over my chest and glare at him. While I want to correct his misassumption and inform him that I'm not actually a romance novelist, I feel like it's more important to correct his bias. Is there something wrong with that? His lips purse as though noticing my aggressive stance. I guess not. He doesn't sound completely convinced of that, but he also looks a little impressed. I might have been wrong with my first impression. Now, I really feel like I need to correct him, but there's a small part of me that wants to impress him, and a slightly larger part that just wants to mess around a little. Normally, I would never do this, but I slant my eyes over toward the person who truly belongs behind this desk. She's sitting cross-legged on the floor, her nose buried in one of Emma St. Clair's books, a little smile on her face, and is completely oblivious to all the noise that's going on around her. I decide it's okay. You know, I say, looking down my nose at Doug, who is towering over my table, writing books is not an easy job, especially when you have a full-time day job and a very demanding boss who is never satisfied with what you do, constantly breathing down your neck, and always yelling at you and giving you reprimands. I'm goofing. Really, I am, but I'm not sure Doug knows how to goof. Before he can say anything, the door bursts open, and three people who look like they might be reporters from the press, judging by the badges hanging around their necks and the fact that they're wearing Channel 6 News on their shirts, bustle in. Can we get a picture of the romance novelists? The lead one says breathlessly. Fast? Adds the older gentleman with gray hair and glasses. The mayor in the next town over is going to cut the ribbon on a new slide they've installed in the playground and we don't want to miss the commemorating ceremony. Can we just get a quick pick? Emma stands gracefully and strides over. Of course you may. We don't want to hold you up from your very important job, she says. And while I've never read one of her books, I decide I'm going to. Anyone who can be so sweet and gracious about a small town and the things that are important to them has to be someone whose books I want to read. Doug hits my shoulder. Aren't you going to stand up and get in the picture? His tone says I'm the rudest person ever to hold these people up from the slide commemorating ceremony. I open my mouth to tell him that I'm not actually Julie whatever her name was and that she's back behind us. But as I look over my shoulder to where what's her name is, I see that she's rolled over on her stomach with her knees bent and her feet in the air and her nose pressed into the pages of the book, laughing a little, her mouth slightly open, her lips moving, and completely engrossed in the story she's reading. She hasn't even noticed that the press walked in. It seems a little rude to interrupt her, but someone should. I've barely thought that and realized that no one knows who she is anyway when Doug grabs my elbow, the gray-haired man grabs my other elbow, and they pull me over until I'm standing beside Emma St. Clair, with the gray-haired man beside me. I protest. Truly, I do. But he shushes me and says, Just smile, please. We'll airbrush it and make your skin look less blotchy, I promise. Although we can't do anything about your hair. We need to get going, or we're going to miss the ribbon cutting. I'm not sure what the expression on my face is, I think I'm insulted about the airbrushing comment and definitely about the hair, but I'm pretty sure I'll see it on the news tonight if I watch it. There's a flash, and maybe they took some video. I don't know. I guess it doesn't matter. I suppose the ladies at Cherry Tree will laugh, but I'm going to have some explaining to do as to why I was impersonating a romance novelist. Someone with a notepad is leaning over, jotting down the name on the homemade, handwritten sign on her desk. The man who pulled me over murmurs a thank you, holds out a book, and asks Emma if she can sign it quickly. She smiles graciously and complies. I'm a little offended that he didn't want me to sign one of my books, but then I remember they're not my books. Right. It's kind of dumb for me to be upset. Still. Another 15 seconds and the hubbub is stopped. The reporters are gone. 
The door is easing shut behind them, and Emma is back over signing books. Jenny, what's her name, is still sitting on the floor, cackling loudly and completely oblivious to everything that's happening. When were you going to tell me that you're a romance novelist? Doug says, sounding honestly offended that he didn't know. I admit, even though I've just done something really terrible, I'm still tempted, just a little, to tease him. But I don't. I'm not a romance novelist. I was just messing with you. Now you're messing with me. You are sitting in the chair. He taps the desk. Apparently you have a pen name. His forehead wrinkles as his eyes sweep the crowd in front of Emma. Apparently you're not any good. I remind myself that this does not hurt my feelings because I'm not really a romance novelist. I was sitting in the chair because I had a rock in my shoe that I had to get out. You just stood for a picture. I didn't mean to. I was trying to tell you that it wasn't me. Fine. I suppose you're using a pen name because you don't want anyone to know. Still, I think this is probably something that your boss should know. What I do in my private life really isn't your business. I can't help but say, but then I shake my head. But I'm not a romance novelist. Then they just set this table up and put a name tag on it, and there's nobody sitting there. She's back there, I say, pointing to the lady who is still sprawled out on the floor, a third of the way through Emma's novel. It must be really good for her to be so engrossed. I want to buy that one. Doug looks around behind me, his eyes narrowed like he's suspicious and doesn't believe me. I pick up one of Jenna What's-Her-Name's books, scanning the back to see if there's a picture. There is, although it's not very good. I squint at the picture, then look at the lady on the floor. Actually, the picture is probably a little better than real life. I point to it, then to her, and then I say, Look at this. Does that look like me? Doug looks at the picture, looks at me, looks back at the picture, then looks at the lady belly laughing on the floor. You impersonated a romance novelist, he accuses, his voice holding incredulity. I can't even believe it. That has to be illegal, he huffs. I knew that you were the instigator in all of these episodes you and the ladies have been having. They try to defend you by saying it's their idea, but I knew better. He's angry, and goodness, is he ever handsome when he's angry. If only he weren't angry at me. I didn't do anything. I tried to tell him the truth. Do you not remember tugging on my arm and me telling you that it wasn't me? His lips press together. I'm sure he remembers. His eyes drop and he says, I thought you were just being falsely modest. I wasn't. I was being serious. But then I realized I wanted him to believe me then because I had been in the middle of telling him, You had just told me you were a romance novelist. What was I supposed to believe? He asks reasonably, but he's still angry. I'm sorry. I can't hardly get mad at him when I'm the one that's to blame. Of course, he didn't listen to me because I'd been lying, teasing, up to that point. I wasn't even going to check up on you today, but I knew I needed to, he says, sounding disappointed in me. I hate that he does, and it makes me feel bad. Before I can say any more, he shakes his head and walks out. Chapter 6 Lee The next morning, I dragged myself in to work. I made things right from the day before. I couldn't find a number for the TV station, but I was able to email them and let them know that a mistake had been made, and one of Emma's fans was able to take a picture of her along with Jackie What's-Her-Name and email it to the TV station. The anchor wasn't in it, 
but at least they had a pick. I feel terrible about it. Worse than I should, I suppose. Most of the fun things that the ladies and I do are just fun things. Yeah, we avoided major disaster by not breaking the sewer line, but otherwise we're just having fun, knocking things off Agnes's bucket list and doing things that make us feel good to be alive. I hadn't actually done anything that would have offended anyone or hurt anyone. Until yesterday. I feel like maybe Doug is right and things are getting out of hand. I am going to have to have a talk with the ladies. We are also going to have to give up thinking about a rafting trip. There is no way Doug is going to let me do it now. And I'm not going to fight for it. Not after yesterday. Obviously, I let my personal feelings for my boss get in the way of me doing a good job. I was goofy and irresponsible and didn't act professionally. That is one thing about Doug. He always acts professionally. Beyond the one comment about me not telling him about my secret life as a romance writer. Obviously, I can do whatever I want to, including having a secret life as a romance writer that I don't tell my boss about, but I don't. Just to be clear, I don't have a secret life as a romance writer. I can only imagine what my mom would have to say about that. Good, now that that's settled. I feel like if he slaps me with a reprimand for this, I deserve it. I'm not even sure why. Maybe it's just because I lied, even though I meant it as teasing, and I felt guilty about it. Feel guilty that people have been inconvenienced because I was goofing off when I shouldn't have been. I go to my office, which is just a small room, not much bigger than a bathroom, with a desk and a chair and a small window. I don't spend much time in here anyway. I feel like my job is to do things that improve the quality of life for the residents. Things like encouraging them to have a bucket list and then live it out. Maybe I have my duties messed up. Maybe we should all just be happy to be here, watch TV, play bingo, and go to Walmart. For the first time in a really long time, when I get to work, I go to my desk and sit down, rather than looking up Agnes or Harriet or Gertrude, or any of the other folks here. Because of the small number of residents, corporate has not replaced other positions when people have left, and Doug has taken on some of the enrollment duties. I have taken on what was left. When the personnel director quit, getting a job in Boise, they didn't hire anyone to replace her and just had us take over. The next thing you know, Doug and I will be cooking the meals. That's about the only thing that hasn't been downsized out of existence. Regardless, I check my messages to see if anyone has left a message expressing interest in moving here or having their parents or their grandparents move in. Nothing. At least there are not any messages that warn us that anyone is removing their relatives from our care. I watched the news, and they didn't say anything about me or the fact that I was impersonating a romance novelist. I think that had more to do with the fact that the romance novelist that I was impersonating wasn't well known, and nobody would care. At least, if I'm going to pick someone to impersonate, I picked the right person. I sit at my desk with an elbow on it and my chin sitting in my hand, staring out at the dirt pile behind the building, the big one and then the little one where the ladies and I dumped our dirt. I suppose Doug has lined someone up to move all the dirt back to where we got it. I'm lost in thought, and when someone says, Knock, knock, it startles me. My brain has registered that it's Doug before my eyes land on him, and my heart has responded by taking up belly dancing. Thankfully, I don't have a coffee or anything to knock off my desk as my hand comes down and I jerk my body around, embarrassed to be caught staring out the window, morose. Doors open, I say in an almost normal tone of voice. I don't usually see you behind your desk, Doug says, leaning a shoulder against the door jamb and crossing his arms over his chest. Of course, he wouldn't come in. 
That might be a little improper for the two of us to be closed in a room together. I feel like normal people wouldn't think twice about that, and I'm not quite sure what I think about Doug caring about it. I suppose it's a little insulting, although I suppose if I were his wife, I would appreciate it. I don't know. I'm not really in the mind frame to think about stuff like that, particularly about being Doug's wife. What in the world would make such a thought pop into my head? Maybe I should start looking for a different job. The thought of leaving the folks that I have come to love here hurts my heart. I don't want to leave. Not here, not good grief. Of course, if my phone doesn't start ringing, and if we don't start enrolling residents, I won't have a choice. Yeah, I guess I'm just feeling really bad about yesterday. I'm sorry about that. His brows lift. I've surprised him. It didn't hurt anything. After I thought about it, it was actually kind of funny. The idea of you being a romance novelist. My eyes open in surprise at him saying it didn't hurt anything. But by the time he's gotten done speaking, I am pretty sure I should be insulted. Why? I ask, thinking that there's something wrong with me. You're just not the kind of person to sit behind a desk and type all day long. You're too busy living life to write about it. His words are said casually, but they feel deeper than his tone seems to indicate. Maybe I'm reading too much into them, because now I think it's a compliment, and a big one at that. Still, I don't want to assume incorrectly, so I don't say anything, although I do fidget with the pen sitting on the desk in front of me grateful for something to do with my fingers. I feel like I should stand so we're on equal footing, but this doesn't feel like a confrontation, for maybe the first time in a really long time. I've been thinking some about that, he says, and he doesn't sound quite as confident as he normally does. About what? About living life. He meets my eyes, and then his go to the window looking out at the dirt pile. I cringe a little. That's just what he needs, a reminder of one of my recent schemes. I think sometimes I'm so busy making sure that I'm coloring in the lines that I don't stop to think that maybe the picture would be a little better if I allowed myself the freedom to go outside of them once in a while. This comes as a shock to me. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I know. I'm supposed to be ecstatic that he's finally seeing things my way, but I kind of like the way his personality balances mine. Maybe that was what got me into trouble yesterday. I felt free to be a little crazier than I normally might be, or to be a little more deceptive than I normally might be, because I knew that Doug wouldn't let me get too far out of line. I've taken advantage of that part of your personality. I say softly, and I'm not sure he understands what I'm talking about. His eyes move from the window and connect with mine, and I don't see comprehension there. I guess I owe him an explanation. I just know that if I do something, you're there to keep me from going too far. Out of line, so to speak. I say with a little smile, not really meaning to take up his example and go with it, but doing it anyway. A little slip of a smile flashes across his face, too. I guess it's always fun to share humor with someone. Maybe it bonds you together, because I definitely feel a connection that I like at our shared smiles. I guess I have to admit it's good to hear that, he says. But I suppose the opposite is true for me. I feel like I can squash your ideas and shut you out, and you'll just pop back up with more and better ones. Maybe we're both making assumptions about the other that we shouldn't. Particularly me. I'm not about to let him take all the blame. Not just you. Both of us. He nods slowly. We stare at nothing in silence. I'm pretty sure he's not looking at me, and I can't look at him. We might be talking about things we've never talked about before but that doesn't mean I don't still have things I'm hiding and don't want to tell him. 
like the way I listen for him to come down the hall, and the little attraction that sizzles in my chest, and the way I admire him and respect the way he takes his job so seriously. The things I wonder about him that have nothing to do with his job. I looked down at my desk, not wanting even a glimmer of that thought to show on my face. Maybe I was a little concerned when he walked in that he would be firing me. I claim not to care, and while I do want this job, it's not like I have a house and kids to support. The very worst that could happen is I would have to move away from my hometown. With him in my office, I realize it goes deeper than that. Deeper than loving the people I work with. Deeper than wanting to stay in my hometown. And deeper than wanting to stick around my family. Somewhere inside of me, I think that even though Doug is annoyed with the things I've done, he could still like, or at least respect, me. Yesterday, when I was joking but got caught in the lie, that thought disappeared. I wanted to talk to you about your idea of taking a whitewater rafting trip. My head jerks up. I know that it is completely off the table. I am not going to even bring it up again. I know, I say. It was crazy to think that we can take people from Cherry Tree on a trip like that. I mean, they'd be staying overnight outside, sleeping on the ground. Of course they don't want to do that. Or I guess I should say Miss Agnes wants to, but it probably wouldn't be good for her. I sigh. <sighs> Sometimes the things we want to do just aren't things we should do. While I can't argue with that sentiment, I was actually going to say that I spent the evening looking up tours and came up with three that I emailed to your work account. Maybe when you get some time, you can take a look at them and see if one of them will suit what she has on her bucket list. My eyes open and close and open and close as I stare blindly at my desk, and I get that movement under control before I look up. I can't believe that not only is he going to let us go, he was actually looking for trips. Part of me believes there's a catch. I measure my words. I'll definitely look at them. Miss Agnes in particular really wants to go. And I know that there are trips that would be gentle enough for her to participate in, and it wouldn't tax her or have her overdo anything. He nods, and while he doesn't look skeptical, I feel like I need to make my argument while I have a chance. Just because people here are old doesn't mean that they're not still people. I know that sounds terrible, but I didn't have time to plan what I was going to say. They just want to feel like they're still a part of life still a part of the things going on around them. And they want to feel worthwhile, too. Needed, like there's a place for them. They still want to keep creating and keep contributing. And by moving and doing things and doing life, it keeps their outlook positive and upbeat. I pull my fingers away from the pen and fold them on the desk in front of me. I'm sorry. I haven't gone about that in the best way. I've been annoying and unprofessional and immature. But honestly, I truly, truly have the best interests of our residents at heart. I do too, he says almost offensively. I also have the interest of keeping this place open at heart too. If it closes, every one of them, and maybe there aren't that many, but they're all going to have to move somewhere other than where they've lived all their lives. Rather than having outsiders come in and be enticed into our community, we'll lose the eldest and wisest. Okay, I admit. He impresses me with that statement. Because I love that he's giving the residents here the respect their age demands. I guess we've been looking at this from different perspectives. I'm looking at the residents and keeping them alive and happy and engaged, and I'm looking to keep the place open and even attracting new patrons. I was thinking that too. Attracting new patrons. But I don't say that. Instead, I say, I think that we basically want the same goals. The things that we do should accomplish the same goals. That's the conclusion I came to last night. That maybe we're working against each other, and maybe each of us has to give a little. 
Now, I've been an employee long enough to know that this is not something that we have to do. He's the boss. I'm the employee. He doesn't have to give a little. I should be the one doing all the giving, so this is a serious compromise on his part. I'm not sure what to say to express my appreciation that he's willing to do this. Thank you. That always seems like a good place to start. I know there doesn't have to be a compromise. Well, there does if we want to work together. There also does if we want to save Cherry Tree. I've been given a month. If we're not at at least half capacity, and I was told most likely at 75%, they're shutting us down. This news shouldn't surprise me, but my jaw drops anyway. On some level, I know that he doesn't have to tell me this. On another level, it makes me admire and respect him that he's willing to do whatever it takes, even working with me, who hasn't been the most pleasant person in his life, to save it. Thank you for telling me. I meet his eyes. I think we can do it. I say, even though I'm not sure that that is true. At least, I think we can attract new residents. There have to be ways. He nods. I agree. I have some ideas, but I thought we ought to do the rafting. Not necessarily because I believe it will attract more residents, but just to help Miss Agnes cross that off her bucket list. Now he has really surprised me. I guess it's not the first time in our conversation, but this is pretty amazing. He's doing the rafting, not to save his job, but to help an 80-year-old woman do something she's always wanted to do. Up until that point, the attraction I feel for him is just kind of something that burns in the back of my mind, that I deal with but try not to think too much about. But this, this thoughtfulness for an elderly lady, softens my heart like nothing else he could have done. He's impressed me, and he's made me admire him, which isn't an easy accomplishment. I can't tell you what that means to me, I say, meaning more, so much more, but not wanting him to know exactly what and how I'm feeling. I know we've had our differences, and we still have our differences, he says with a little smile that is not helping the situation in my chest right now. But I knew that when I got the news, I could come to you and you would do everything in your power to help me keep Cherry Tree open for the residents of Good Grief. He puts a hand up, rubbing the back of his neck. It is the first sign I've seen that he is a little bit agitated. I guess I'm saying I knew I could count on you. His hand drops, then his eyes meet mine, serious. And that means more to me than I can say. His words echo mine, and I wonder if there's as much emotion behind his as there was behind mine. I have no way of knowing, of course. But the thought is there. It's a good thought. Chapter 7 Doug It wasn't something I enjoyed while we were doing it, but the kids and I talked about it after we were done. I know we've made good memories. Chubb Eckenrode sits in one of the three rocking chairs in the small sunroom. He seems to be ignoring the cackling that is coming down the hall. I try to ignore it, too, although it is hard. My family went camping some, too. I'm with you. I never liked it much, although I did enjoy going fishing. My wife could make some mean eggs over an open fire. She never cooked a lick at home. Patrick Flagg sits in one of the other two chairs. I sit in the last chair, and while I'm listening to the men and actually find what they are saying interesting, I am a little distracted by the ladies, wondering what in the world they are up to. While I've only been sitting with the men for 40 minutes, I'm ready to get up and do something else. I suppose this proves Lee's point. These folks need something to do. We told you all of our camping stories. Don't you have any? Chubb asks, looking at me expectantly. 
I sigh. I enjoy their stories, but I haven't said anything because I don't have anything to add. My ex, Stephanie, wouldn't have been caught dead spending one hour in the woods, let alone a whole night. I've never gone camping. I say after they won't stop looking at me. The men stare like I expect them to. But it hasn't taken you guys long to convince me that I need to take my kids when I get them this summer. I'm not sure when that will be, although I know it won't be in June since Stephanie has signed the boys up for camp. I might get them all of July and August. I'm not sure. Kids are only young once. You have to make memories that last a lifetime, Patrick says, and I can't disagree. My own childhood was spent mostly inside, once I was old enough to not go to the babysitters anymore. My mom worked as a secretary year-round, and when we vacationed, we'd done things like go to Disneyland. I suppose those memories are fun, although I mostly remember being tired and standing in line. It isn't my typical routine to sit with the men and chat, but Lee had such a good rapport with the women, and I'm not sure what else to do to save the facility in my job. Chatting with the men can't hurt. There are only two of them. More cackling comes down the hall. It sounds like every woman in the facility is laughing. Do you think they're okay? I ask the men. They're women. That's normal noise for them. I nod slowly, trying not to look stupid, but it doesn't sound normal to me. Of course, my ex seldom laughed. I think it's laughing, but it also could indicate pain, I think. I look a little closer at the men's faces. They don't seem the slightest bit concerned, and if anything, they seem a little... smug. Do you guys know what's going on over there? The ladies' voices are coming from the kitchen now, which is odd since it's three o'clock in the afternoon. It's been six hours since I talked to Lee, and I haven't seen her again. I had a couple of conference calls to deal with as the higher-ups laid out exactly what needed to happen in order for the facility to stay open. It had been hard to concentrate on them. I shouldn't have been surprised at Lee's reaction to my suggestions. I thought she might be arrogant and maybe taunt me if I gave in. I didn't expect her to take it so well and to be so sweet. Sweet wasn't exactly a word that I associate with Lee. At least, it hadn't been. Not until today. I take it from the looks on your faces that you do. I finally say, thinking that maybe I ought to get up and go check on it, and then reminding myself about the conversation I'd had, and how I said I trusted her, or maybe I hadn't said that in so many words, but that was really what I meant. I'm not sure why it's so hard for me to say those words. Maybe because I trusted my ex and she'd taken that trust and thrown it back in my face. She isn't a terrible person, and I don't want to think bad thoughts about her. We get along okay for the kid's sake, and I don't want to ruin that. She is allowed to do things I disagree with. I think this has to do with Miss Agnes's bucket list, Chubb says in what I can only describe as an ornery grin. I've heard a lot about Miss Agnes's bucket list. I think I'd like to see it. I say, not really thinking that I'd ever get to until the words are out of my mouth. And then I thought, why not? Next time I see Lee, I'm going to ask her for it. I think she'll give it to me, too, if she has access to it. Maybe once I see it, I won't keep being surprised by all the things on it. Actually, I know what's going on, Patrick says. I saw Harriet and Gertrude outside this morning, getting the things that they needed in order to do what they're doing now. More noises come from down the hall, but it isn't exactly laughing. It might have been groaning, or it almost sounds like someone is sick. The things they needed? My brows seem to reach across my nose and touch each other. What in the world? One of the items on her list is to 
eat bugs. Chubb lifts his hand out, like he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. He and me both. Don't shoot the messenger. Not shooting anybody, at least not today, I say, standing up. Bugs could make the ladies sick. They have parasites and germs, and what if one of the ladies chokes on them? I wouldn't do that if I were you, Chubb says, keeping his butt firmly planted in his rocking chair. Why not? I ask, stopping and throwing a look over my shoulder. If you go in there, they might end up thinking that you need to eat one, too. That's right, Patrick says. And that's not the worst thing on their list anyway. You might want to save your energy to stop something a little more important. Like what? Skydiving? Chubb suggests. I suppose he's going for an innocent look, but he fails spectacularly. He looks positively gleeful. Skydiving? He has to be kidding. Why would an 80-year-old have skydiving on her bucket list? She couldn't possibly. I believe she has cage diving with white sharks as well. Patrick says, and he doesn't even try to hide a smirk. Why was I throwing a fit about a little bit of whitewater rafting? I ask, rhetorically, of course. We were wondering the same thing, to be honest. Chubb says. Somehow, the idea of Miss Agnes skydiving and diving with white sharks is almost noble, in a way. Not that I want to see anything happen to her, because I don't. But the idea of Lee doing it with her? I shiver. And Lee would do it with her. Or for her. I felt the same way, Patrick says, his smirk easing slightly into a look of commiseration. What way? I ask, not really paying attention. I'm trying to figure out how in the world I'm going to talk the ladies out of these things. Whitewater rafting is one thing. Eating bugs is something else. But sharks? Skydiving? That is getting out of hand. Way out of hand. Like you want to throttle someone but can't. Patrick says, and his grin is such that his dentures slip and crack together. That's exactly how I feel. Thank you for putting the feeling into words. Now all I have to do is keep from actually acting on it. Truth be told, I feel less like strangling someone and more like tying her up somewhere she can't harm herself. Sharks. Seriously. And why do I care? It shouldn't bother me what she does. It shouldn't. But somehow, it does. So you see what we mean about saving your energy for things that matter. I see, but I don't understand how we're going to talk anyone out of any of those things. Offer to give them something else that's just as good, Chubb says, sounding very reasonable. I look out the window. The bushes and flowers that Lee and the ladies had planted looked beautiful. It is one of the activities I actually approved of that Lee and the ladies have done. Not all of our ladies could help, of course, but many of them enjoyed it. Idaho summers are short and hot, and it is good for everyone to get outside and get their hands in the dirt a little. I believe that, even if I don't do it myself. It is not, however, good for everyone to get in a cage and dive with white sharks. What would be as good as diving with white sharks? I ask, rather slowly and with an almost certain feeling in my stomach that there is nothing that I can offer to do that will take the place of diving with white sharks. I don't think she's actually going to do it. I'm not even sure she actually wants to. She just wants to do fun stuff. And maybe things that are a little dangerous. It just gives her a good feeling here. Patrick lifts up his hand and slaps his chest. I see. So what you need to do is figure out something that will give her a good feeling here. Chubb slaps his own chest and grins. 
She will want to do that and will stop wanting to do other crazy things. Forever? Probably not. But she can probably be talked out of it. So, basically, I'm going to have to keep coming up with crazy things to do. Things that aren't dangerous and won't get me fired and will entice other people to want to be residents here and that are on par with skydiving and shark diving. Suddenly, I don't feel up to this job at all. At all. Any suggestions? Rather than diving with sharks, you could offer to let them pet a tiger. That's very similar and slightly less dangerous, I think, Chubb says, and I start to seriously doubt his sanity. Or maybe my own sanity. Or both. I'm not sure. Maybe I could offer them tickets on the Challenger? I ask, only being a little sarcastic. That would probably do it. I think maybe you'd better offer life rafts and a parachute along with the ticket, Chubb adds. Oh no, I'm pretty sure these ladies would rather dive and swim. Isn't that on their bucket list? Falling from the sky and swimming across the Atlantic? Seems like their bucket list is full of impossible things. They just want to have fun. They don't want to be relegated to the sidelines of life. I don't think they actually want to do half the stuff they have on their list. They just want to be relevant. Relevant. I think about that. Maybe if I had some kind of problem that the ladies could help me with, that would make them feel needed and necessary and relevant. I eye the men, still not entirely convinced they are completely on my side although I'm sure they don't want anything to happen to the ladies at Cherry Tree. I don't have any choice but to trust them. So I decide I might as well bring them into my confidence, even though I'm not entirely sure myself exactly what I'm going to do. I just have some fuzzy ideas in my head. Would you guys be interested in going on a whitewater rafting trip? I ask. If it was a calm part of the Snake River and there were no actual whitewater rapids? Sure, Chubb says right away. Would it involve more than one day? Yeah, it would probably be at least three nights out and four days down the river. Think you're up to that? Of course we are, Patrick says, his brown eyes twinkling under his bushy eyebrows and bald head. I'd like to do that, and I think the ladies will agree. I think so, too. And I think I need to have a problem that maybe the ladies can help me with, and maybe that will take their mind off the bucket list. Both of the men are nodding their heads, the rocking chairs going along in time with their chins going up and down. You got it now, son. Nothing a woman likes better than to stick a long nose into somebody else's business. Makes her happy as a hornet in a field of daisies. A hornet in a field of daisies? Who ever heard of that? Chubb looks over at Patrick like he is nuts. I just made it up. Patrick grins. Pretty good, wasn't it? He looks over at me. That's going in the book I'm writing. Hang on a second. He grabs a notebook and stub of a pencil out of the front pocket of his shirt and writes something down on it. I didn't know that you're writing a book. I say, surprised. I just started today, Patrick admits. And he'll be doing something else tomorrow. Something aside from cage diving with sharks, Patrick says, and I wish everyone at Cherry Tree would be content writing a book. So what's your problem? Chubb asks, getting back to the point, which I appreciate, except... I don't have a problem. Can we think of one for me? Maybe you could ask them for ways for you and your ex to get back together. Patrick grins. Ladies love romance. That's better than sharks, I'm sure. It might even be better than skydiving, although that one could be close. Oh no, romance beats everything in the ladies' lives, and getting you matched up with someone would definitely go to the top of Miss Agnes's bucket list. 
there is no getting my ex and me back together since my ex is married to someone else, and I don't do that kind of thing. I say, happy that she is married, because I certainly don't want to be on the receiving end of a bunch of matchmakers trying to get me back together with the person I consider the biggest mistake of my life. You're a little young to get matched up with Miss Agnes or Miss Harriet or Miss Gertrude. Chubb sighs. I don't think any of the other ladies are any younger. They're definitely less spry. I doubt they'll even go on the rafting trip with us. He taps his gnarled fingers on the arms of his chair. Where can we find someone to match you up with? He tilts his head and looks at me. You have a girlfriend? No. Someone you could pay to be your girlfriend? No. I try not to be scandalized by the very idea, but I'm not very successful by the wicked grins the men give me. I clear my throat, modulate my tone, and say, No. Well then, our Walmart trip is tomorrow morning. I guess we'll have to find your girlfriend there. I'm not- Do you want the ladies diving for sharks? Patrick asks in that reasonable tone of voice I have a hard time arguing with. Of course not. I say, trying not to sound irritated. The men are just trying to help. How about we match one of you guys up with one of the ladies here at the facility? I take a step back toward them and then stop. Or we could match one of you guys up with a lady that we find at Walmart tomorrow. I'll help pick her out. I almost rub my hands together in anticipation. Not necessarily because of picking out a woman for them, but for the fact that I wouldn't have to have one picked out for me. I don't have anything against Walmart women in general, but I really don't want to find one there. What's your list of criteria? I can write it down, we can go through everyone there, or we can just sit at the door and watch them come in and out. I'm not afraid to go to the one that we choose and let her know what's going on. I know I sound ridiculous. I would be extremely embarrassed if anyone I know hears me talking like this. But if it keeps the ladies from diving for sharks and from skydiving and from petting tigers, it might be worth it. I am sure we won't attract new residents to our facility if we make the national news because someone gets eaten by a white shark. No. no. Both of the men are shaking their heads. I can feel disappointment welling up inside of me, but I can't let go of the idea. Not until Patrick speaks. We're too old. We might not even be here next year this time. Don't talk like that. You're fine. You can be here for years and years. That's why we're... I almost let it slip. The last thing I told Lee before I left her office was that I didn't want the residents to find out that the facility might be closing. Not until we are sure we won't be able to save it. We have two weeks to get started on a plan. If nothing looks like it is going to pan out, then we could say something. I don't want to leave the residents high and dry like the higher-ups are going to do. No, it needs to be you. You're young and a little exciting, and we shouldn't have trouble finding someone at Walmart who's willing to go home with you, especially if we offer ourselves as chaperones so she knows you're not a serial killer or anything. Chubb grins. One of the benefits of getting old is that women tend to trust you more. I nod. Thanks, that's encouraging. How badly do I want to do this? How badly do I want to keep from having to talk about sharks and skydiving and goodness knows what else? What could it hurt? Seriously. At the very least, I might get a little bit embarrassed, and worst case scenario, I might end up going out with someone who doesn't like me or that I don't care for. If we don't like each other, we'll break it off. It's not a big deal. Okay, I'll do it. How do you guys suggest we work it out? Both sets of eyebrows go sky high, and the men look at each other with satisfied grins. I almost feel like matchmaking isn't just for women after men reach a certain age. 
Maybe I could be wrong, but the men seem pretty eager to start scoping out women for me. I think that what we need to do is get Lee involved as well. We'll scope out Walmart for a guy for her and a woman for you, and that should keep the ladies occupied. Somehow, the idea of them finding a man for Lee turns my stomach inside out and twists it into a horseshoe that survived a train wreck. Protest is on the tip of my lips, and the words almost spill, but then I remember sharks and skydiving. Do you guys want to ask her if she's willing, or do you want me to? You'd better. Maybe you can make a deal with her. That she can go to Miss Agnes and see if Miss Agnes would be willing to scratch a couple of things off her bucket list if she gets to play Cupid. Surely that shouldn't be on her list, Patrick says. You think? Chubb says seriously. Talk about the last thing in the world I want to do. Approach Lee and see if she'd be willing to let the residents find her a boyfriend tomorrow at the Walmart shopping trip. She'll think I'm off my rocker. I grunt. I really am off my rocker. It is over there, and I'd gotten off it a while ago. Goodness, my humor leaves a lot to be desired. I'm probably just laughing at anything, because my life has taken such an unexpected hard left. I can't even call it a U-turn, because it is not like I am going back over familiar territory. Shopping for a potential partner isn't something I've ever done before. At least the guys aren't suggesting I do it online. That would be even worse. We could document this on YouTube or Facebook or that snap thing, whatever it is. Seems pretty popular with the youngsters. You could get a lot of traction out of this. Maybe you could even raise some money for the facility or raise money to take your significant others on our rafting trip. Oh boy. Now I'm going to be picking up a chick at Walmart and picking up a dude for Lee, and taking strangers on a rafting trip out in the middle of nowhere. I need to make sure they somehow go through metal detectors before we leave. I feel like we should think about this. Sleep on it a bit, maybe. The Walmart trip is tomorrow. If you're going to get Lee on board with this, you better say something to her. And then if you guys are good, we'll have to get the ladies involved. And the less they think you know, the better off we'll be. Ladies like to be sneaky. Chubb says in a somewhat humorous tone, although I'm sure he's dead serious. I don't know how you guys went about finding... What were they even finding for me? Not a wife. Goodness, no. No way. Heck no. Girlfriend? Please, no. Not even that. A date. I can call her a date. I don't know how you guys went about finding yourselves dates back in the day, but you didn't do it at Walmart, and you didn't ask her to go on an overnight trip when you barely knew her. That seems like a pretty solid argument, and I think I just won. Sharks, Chubb says. Skydiving, Patrick says. On second thought, you're right. I don't think I need to sleep on it. I'll go say something to Lee right now. The old men smirk, look at each other, and then look out the window with those faraway expressions that old men wear quite often that makes them look like they're deep in serious contemplation. But now I know better. They aren't contemplating anything except how to get the assisted living facility director to look like an idiot. I feel like I've fallen right into a trap. However, they are right. If I manage to keep the ladies, Lee included, out of the ocean and out of the sky, it will be worth it. You talk to the ladies, and you make it seem like Lee and I don't know anything. I say, not entirely comfortable with trying to keep such a big secret, but it won't be secret for long, I am sure. I'll talk to Lee. I know she will be on board, with bells on. Of course, what do I know about women? Maybe she will hate the idea. Chapter 8 Lee I'm ready to go home. Normally, a typical trip to Walmart takes an hour, maybe an hour and a half. 
too, if you count the ride there and back since there is no Walmart in good grief, and we have to go on the interstate for ten miles or so to get there. We live closer to a big store than a lot of Idahoans do. It's a blessing and a curse, I suppose. When you have seniors to take shopping, it's mostly a blessing. Regardless, I've been here for four hours, and it's been torture for three hours and 55 minutes. I think Agnes and Harriet and Gertrude have been having fun, though, which makes it a little more bearable. I also imagine that Doug is just as miserable as I am, which makes it even more bearable. Actually, it almost makes me want to smile. I thought he was crazy when he came to me with this idea, but his logic was spot on. Ladies love romance, and they love to meddle in other people's business. If he and I give them something to meddle in, we will have leverage. And we did. The shark cage is out. Which, I gotta admit, relieves me. Could we hire you to be this woman's boyfriend? Agnes says, for what feels like the hundredth time, but I think it's only fifteen. Harriet is keeping track. I'm guessing this is something I'll get teased about, that I couldn't even pick up a man at Walmart. I try to smile in a way that doesn't look like my last husband is buried under the front porch, and I'm hardly even that embarrassed anymore when the guy shakes his head and keeps walking. That one had a ring on his finger, Gertrude says, and Agnes gives her a look. Really? I didn't see it. It was there. You can't ask married men. Even though this is a fake situation, we've got standards and we're not hiring a married man to pretend to be her boyfriend. We're just not. We have to draw the line somewhere. Harriet is pretty easygoing, but when she puts her foot down, she really puts it down. I have to agree with this. I am not interested in fake dating anyone, but I am definitely not interested in fake dating a married man. My life is complicated enough. I don't need an angry wife shooting at me. She needs something to make her look cute, Gertrude says, easing herself down beside me on the bench where I've been allowed to sit for the last three men. Before that, I had to strike a pose in front of the doors. Well, I was originally allowed to stand beside the doors, but when they couldn't get the guys to stop, they had me scoot over so I was in front of the door, so I at least slowed them down before they disappeared into the store. Just then, my sister Claire comes in the door, and I jump up. She's carrying her little dog, Jello, and has both of her daughters with her along with her fiancé, Trey, and I figure either they're all taking a skip day and having some family shopping time, or there's a holiday I didn't realize was going on. Knowing Claire, she probably let her kids skip so she could hang out with them for the day. She's a good mom. Trey is beside her, and they're laughing and so deeply involved in each other that she doesn't even see me until I'm almost beside her. Lee, she says, and she gives me a hug, although we just saw each other in church on Sunday. Shopping day? She asks, looking around my shoulder and waving at Gertrude and Agnes, and when her gaze goes to Harriet, her brow puckers and she sweeps again. I suppose she's probably looking for our shopping bags. Typically, we don't just hang out at the entryway of the store. She knows we get in and get out. Not exactly, I say, wishing I hadn't rushed over to see her. Now I'm going to have to explain what's going on. I greet my nieces and think about starting up a conversation about rocks or basketball, their main interests, to possibly head off the conversation that I'm afraid I'm going to have to have now with my sister. A gasp beside me makes me turn my head quickly. We could use her dog, Agnes says, her finger pointing straight ahead as she moves toward my sister with confidence. My sister doesn't exactly back up, 
but her eyes do widen. Jello looks adorably cute in the bag over her shoulder. She's a rather new addition to the family. Our dad's a vet, and Jello was a stray that was brought into his practice. He had Claire keep her while he searched for the owner. No one ever claimed her, and Claire ended up adopting her. Claire doesn't exactly seem like the kind of person who walks around with a designer dog in her pocketbook, but she's become that. It suits her. What for? Claire asks suspiciously, and I don't blame her. I remember what the conversation had been about before she walked in. Making me look cute. Can I hold your dog while you shop? I ask, trying to inject some enthusiasm in my voice. What for? She asks again, and I realize that the conversation I didn't want to have is going to have to be had if that makes sense. My ladies aren't shy, and they aren't embarrassed. Harriet doesn't have the same hesitation that I do, and she answers, her orange hair glowing under the fluorescent lights. We are trying to hire a man to be Lee's boyfriend and are not having any luck. She puts an arm around me, and it feels so maternal I lean into her. It's been a hard day. Rejection is never easy, and rejection in front of an audience is even worse. But it's for our assisted living center, so I'm taking it for the team. Doug owes me. Unless he's going through this too, and maybe he has since he hasn't come parading by with his hired girlfriend. Although it wouldn't surprise me if Doug got a girl on his first try. He's that kind of guy. My heart stirs a little at that, in an angry kind of way, or maybe it's a jealous kind of way. Whatever kind of way it is, it's uncomfortable and I don't like it. I turn my eyes back to my sister. It's a long story, and we're going to need chocolate in order to tell it, so I'll do it at our girls' night on Sunday night, okay? She nods, still not looking certain, but pulling her purse off her shoulder while patting Jello's head. She doesn't need a purse. She'll just hold it. Agnes says with authority while Claire jerks her head and sticks her hand in, scooping Jello out. She hands the fluffy little dog to me, and I have to admit, I'm charmed as I always am. I also have to admit, it's probably a good idea. Men might be able to resist me, but who can resist Jello? I'm not feeling very generous, though, so I don't tell Agnes that this is a brilliant idea. I do thank my sister, though, nod at her fiancé, and snuggle Jello to my chest. She pushes in and sticks her nose right at the base of my throat. It's cold, but her tongue is warm, and she makes me feel like maybe not everybody in the universe hates me. I guess that's what dogs do for us, right? Maybe I should get one of my own. After my sister Tammy decided not to get a dog, she ended up with a four-wheeler. Maybe I'd better stick to cats. Somehow, they just don't give love like dogs do, though. Jello snuggles deeper, acting like she loves me to the moon and back. And after all the rejection I faced today, I'm going to need to hold her for at least a year to get over it. My sister and her family walk off after grabbing a cart, and the ladies position me where I started out, in the middle of the double doors, cuddling the puppy. That's perfect. You are irresistible now, Gertrude says, patting my shoulder, which I guess makes me feel a little better. I promise myself that I'm going to make eggplant parmesan tonight for supper. I'm not a big believer in comfort food and emotional eating, but sometimes it's necessary. For goodness sakes, don't smile. Men don't want to see a woman with a goofy grin on her face for no reason, Harriet says, patting Jello's head, then stepping back and looking at the picture we make. There is a reason for my smile. It's the eggplant parmesan. The thought's enough to make anyone smile. But... I try to wipe it off my face and get serious about this. 
with my limited experience with men, two years of marriage to someone I pretty much wished I hadn't married the day after we said, I do, I really have no clue how to attract a man. I've never really wanted to. My conscience pokes me in the ribs and says one word, Doug. I elbow it back and tell it to shut up. If the dog doesn't work, we're going to have to run into the store and grab a shirt that shows some cleavage. That's our last hope. Agnes says, sounding very businesslike, while I try to think of something that could come up so that I don't have to do it. Could I have forgotten a dentist appointment in Hawaii? We could just take her shirt off and she could stand there in her undergarments. That would probably be just as effective, Harriet says. I promised myself I would be a good sport, but I can't help it. I tilt my head and look at her. Really? You probably have a boring white bra on, don't you? Gertrude says, like that's a sin or something. I don't know. I didn't pay attention to what color it was this morning. I mumble but it's not really true. I honestly didn't pay attention this morning, but I only own white bras. I didn't realize there were laws against that. Well, no wonder we have to find a boyfriend for her. Gertrude mumbles. I'm feeling defensive, so that excuses my next words. Ladies, are you trying to tell me that you guys are wearing any color other than white? Mine are kind of a dirty gray, Harriet says. Agnes gives her a look. Mine are bright red, and I can prove it. She starts to lift up her shirt. Okay, I like to think I'm a modern woman, but I admit I'm scandalized over this, and I shove Jello to one arm while putting my hand over top of Agnes's hands. I believe you. Sorry I asked. I really am, too. What does the color of a woman's underwear have to do with anything, anyway? Places, ladies, we've got ourselves a prospect. Agnes says, looking out the door. Oh, yeah, this one looks like a good one. Her white hair seems to float as she turns and looks at me. Don't smile. Trust me, I wasn't even close to beginning to smile. But I don't tell her that. I just look as grumpy as I feel and snuggle with Jello. Good day, sir. Would you be interested in earning some money as this lovely young lady's hired boyfriend? I want to fall through the floor. I am also positive that this is going to be a no. If Walmart had metal detectors, he'd be setting them off. I count at least three knives one in each pocket and one strapped to the outside of his lower pant leg. I bet he's got a gun strapped somewhere under his shirt. Maybe two guns. He's got a full beard, which makes his age hard to judge, and hair that looks like it hasn't been cut since Christmas three years ago. He's big and brawny, and while Doug is not my type, this dude is not my type either. But. That's okay, because I'm sure I'm not his type. I put my nose down on Jello and breathe deeply, looking up at the dude. And maybe I'm even a little coy, since I know that this is going nowhere. And fast. The guy glances at me, and his step doesn't even slow. But then his eyes fall to Jello, and his booted hoof, I mean foot, stops short. His eyes go to Agnes. Nice day outside, ma'am, he says. His voice is slow and deep and not unpleasant at all. Actually, I kind of like it. It seems a little at odds with the way the dude looks, but sometimes voices do. It sure is, and it would be much better if you had a girl on your arm, Agnes says, and I feel like I kind of know why she never got married. Well, ma'am, I might have to disagree with that. In my experience, women are a pack of trouble on a good day. 
He has blue eyes and they twinkle, and I feel like he might be safe, actually. I'm still not worried about him saying yes to this crazy proposition, though. I've kind of come to the conclusion that the ladies are going to have a good time and a fun day trying to find me a boyfriend, and we're going to go home without one. Which isn't surprising, but honestly, I'm not disappointed. None of the guys that I've seen can hold a candle to Doug, and he's not my type. Really, he's not my type. I kind of chuckle to myself, because it's such a lie. A clean-cut guy who is serious about his job, who has compassion and maybe even a sense of humor, who's responsible and has character. Of course he's my type. He's every girl's type. The fact that he isn't bad to look at certainly helps. I kind of like Doug with his few imperfections since they make me feel better about mine. How much does the gig pay? And how long does it last? The guy says, and a small slice of panic moves through me. This is more interest than anyone else has shown. Just to be sure, my eyes track to his hand. No ring. Gertrude tells him what we agreed on. We are going on a whitewater rafting trip, and she needs a boyfriend for it. We pay for your trip, and you get a little spending money. She names the price we agreed on, figuring that was pretty much double the average weekly wage. Well, ma'am, you might not believe this, but I actually own a whitewater rafting rental company. And if you book your trip through me, I'll agree to your deal. I'll be that lady's fake boyfriend, as long as she ditches the dog. You don't like the dog? I ask, forgetting my vow to keep my mouth shut. It's cute, I'll give you that. But not on a whitewater rafting trip. It'll just get in the way. Well, it's not mine anyway. I say, not really paying attention, because my insides have just turned to stone. I think the dude's going to do it. I'm looking at my new fake boyfriend. While he's not completely terrible, I know the ladies are going to be trying to set us up, and suddenly I remember that I need to make an appointment for a root canal. Maybe the dentist can see me tomorrow. Chapter 9 Doug Patrick and Chubb and I walk across the front aisle of Walmart with Melissa, the woman who has agreed to be my fake girlfriend, following us. She is the first one we asked. It took a long time to ask someone because Chubb and Patrick couldn't agree on a girl who was good enough for me, I guess, or maybe good enough for Cherry Tree. I'm not sure. She had to be dressed and not still in her jammies, and while I'm not being discriminatory, I'm just telling you what Chubb and Patrick said. She couldn't be wearing a ring, of course, and that was my requirement. Chubb wasn't so strict on that, which gave me a whole new perspective on him, but everyone has their faults, I guess. Patrick agreed with me, though. Thankfully, although I'm pretty sure I had veto power on that one. I would have demanded it anyway. The men said she couldn't look weird, whatever that was. That was another one of Chubb's demands. Patrick said she had to look classy. They were very particular about who they set me up with. Anyway, Melissa and I haven't exactly hit it off, at least not on my end. I'm not so sure why she agreed as she didn't look exactly thrilled about the whitewater rafting trip. She doesn't really look like the kind of girl who would enjoy whitewater rafting. After they said that, she took another look at me before she said yes. I kind of feel like since she introduced herself as Melissa and not Missy or Lissa or some other nickname version of Melissa, that she is just as prim and proper as she looks. She said she's a legal assistant and works in a law firm in a town down the road. 
that puts us about 45 minutes apart. She was willing to take a vacation and come on our trip, after we offered to pay her, of course. I'm not sure I like the way she's looking at me, and I hope she understands that fake really means fake, that I'm not actually looking for a girlfriend. Although I suppose she and I would bore ourselves in a way that would make us marriageable material, except I'm not really looking to get married again. As I think of that, Lee's face comes to mind, her goofiness and her willingness to jump in with both feet, and the way she totally throws herself into her job or whatever she's doing. She just lives with her eyes wide open, and her heart, too, which is a really dumb way to live. It makes me uncomfortable. Melissa seems like the opposite. She's very closed. She holds her purse just so and her feet just so, and I'm guessing that accepting two old men and a middle-aged man's proposition of being a fake girlfriend is not something that she would ever have thought she would find herself doing. She does still seem kind of surprised, and I can't help but feel like she must need the money. Regardless, we walk over to the other set of doors. We were working on people who were leaving the store while Lee and her ladies were working on the people who were coming in. We felt that working at the same door wasn't a good idea. It looks like they've... caught someone. Everything inside my ribs feels like a bottomless pit as I look at the man that they've hired to be Lee's fake boyfriend. He looks dangerous. I assume that's the guy they've hired. Unless they thought we needed a bodyguard, too. Unbidden, the thought comes to me. Is this the kind of guy that Lee is attracted to? He's brawny and could pretty much make two of me. Not that he's fat. Actually, he's less chubby than I am. I've got some middle-aged spread going on and he doesn't. He's just one of those heavy-set dudes who puts weight on through his chest and shoulders while his hips are narrow. And I don't find that the slightest bit attractive, of course, but I guess women might. Maybe Lee does. I'm never going to look like that, though. When I put weight on, it goes directly to my midsection. With another 20 pounds and a beard, I could convincingly play Santa Claus. Even my hair is more salt than pepper. Lee is standing there talking to the man, and it looks like she's holding her sister's dog, Jello. Her sister even takes the dog to church. At least, she has once or twice. I think when it was younger, she didn't want to leave it alone. Regardless, it's kind of weird to see Lee holding the adorable little dog. If my heart wasn't already having somersaulting problems, that would cause it to do another slow curl. She looks good with the puppy. Her hands are holding it gently, and she's stroking it while the puppy is all snuggled up next to her. I wonder if Lee is a cuddly type. I've got to stop thinking about these things. I push the thought away, although it wants to linger, since my ex was not a cuddly type. Melissa, whom I'd almost forgotten about, does not seem like the cuddly type either. Maybe I don't seem like the cuddly type but there's just something about curling up with your wife that makes a marriage a picture of heaven. For me, anyway. We reach them. Lee has seen us coming. Before any of the older folks can say anything, she gives us a generic smile and doesn't meet my eyes. This is Bane, and not only has he agreed to our stipulations, he also owns a whitewater rafting company that gives tours down the Snake River and he will give us a deep discount on a four-day rafting trip. She sounds a little robotic, in my opinion, as she says that. I admit it bothers me some. It also makes me happy, in a small way. I get the idea that she isn't thrilled with her fake boyfriend. Which, since I'm not exactly thrilled with my fake girlfriend, seems like a good thing. I step forward. Good to meet you, Bane. I'm Doug. He grabs my hand, and I like his firm handshake. 
Bane puts me in mind of what I think a mountain man would be like, which seems like that wouldn't be the kind of guy I would be good friends with. But I get the idea that, if circumstances were different, I would like Bane. There's a shifting inside me, and a feeling of irritation seems to hit me, and I realize that I'm supposed to have a partner now. Is a girlfriend a partner? I kind of feel that way about a wife. I guess I've been out of the dating pool long enough that I'm not even sure that girlfriend is the right word. Does a man who's looking hard at 50 have a girlfriend? It seems like a high school term. A woman friend. They make all kinds of crazy names for everything else. You think they'd come up with something new for someone who's middle-aged who has a friend who's more than a friend but not a fiancé or wife. Maybe they have. Maybe I've just missed it since this hasn't really been my thing. Regardless, I stifle my sigh and turn to my side. This is Melissa, and she's agreed to our terms. I look her in the eyes as I say this, and while Melissa isn't who I would have chosen, she probably does suit me really well. I just hope this is giving the ladies something to keep them occupied, because while I'm sure Melissa is a very nice person, I find myself wishing it were Lee the ladies were trying to set me up with. For some reason, I feel like that would be fun, while I have a vague desire to move away from Melissa. We make some arrangements, and Bain says that he'll send us the tours and prices he has available as soon as he gets back to the office. I suppose finding one fake boyfriend and a guide for our whitewater rafting trip, along with one fake girlfriend, isn't bad for four hours of work. And it got us out of the shark-infested waters, so I'm happy with it. We do our shopping, which doesn't take very long, I think the ladies are tired, and we head home. As Lee is getting off the bus, I stop her. Before you go home today, can I talk to you in my office? She gives me a look I can't decipher, and I add, Please? I am the boss, and I haven't forgotten it. But I feel like things have been changing between Lee and me, and I'm not sure exactly where we stand together. I've already figured out that it doesn't really matter to her whether or not she has this job although the ladies matter to her. I think I care more about her staying and keeping her job than she does. And it's not because I can't find another activities director, although I will never be able to find one as good as she is. But it's because despite Melissa and Bain and the matchmaking efforts of the elderly folk around us, I realize I've come to look forward to seeing her every day, and I would miss her probably more than I realize, if she weren't around. That is definitely not something I'm going to say to her. It's not what I want to talk to her about at all. I will, she says, and then she keeps moving, off the bus and with her arm around Miss Harriet and her other arm linked with Miss Gertrude, she disappears into the facility. Like any sane man, I wonder what I've gotten myself into. Bane is as good as his word, and there's a message waiting for me from him when I walk into my office. He said he had a cancellation and he can book us for next week. I wonder if he really had a cancellation or if he's not busy. And if he's not busy, I wonder why. Because I care about the people in my facility, I call him back, intent on getting some questions answered before I just go with the opportunity that's placed itself in front of me. Maybe I'm crazy, and maybe I'm too suspicious, but I'm not going to let the people in my care go anywhere with someone I don't trust. And maybe part of it is Lee. This is supposed to be her fake boyfriend for the trip. I might resent that a little, and perhaps I'm looking for problems that aren't there. Something, anything, that will keep me from having to watch them together. Lee is not exactly mine. She's not my responsibility, not my girl. But yes, there's just something inside of a man that wants to protect the people I care about. I care about Lee. There, I've admitted it.
and she really brings out my protective instinct. All right, it probably has to do with the feelings of attraction that I have for her and the way I feel when I'm around her, and it was hard enough to admit that I'll probably miss her when she leaves. I don't want to have to examine the feelings of wanting to protect her now while she's here, so I'm not going to. Hello? The familiar voice of the man I just met a few hours ago answers the telephone. Bane, it's Doug. Right, the Walmart dude. The guy who's with my fake girlfriend. Bane gives a huff of breath that could be a chuckle. Is it okay that I'm kind of weirded out by all of that? I mean, obviously I agreed to it, and I'm kind of intrigued. But this is not normal, right? I don't think so. Thanks. I mean, things change so fast that I can't keep up, and I've actually quit trying, but that's another story. I just wasn't expected to be hit with a proposition as I walked in to do my grocery shopping. Yeah, I could see how that could be a little disconcerting. I wonder if I'm using words that are too big for him. Not in a mean kind of way. I just hate it when people are talking to me and I can't understand what they're saying. You've got it there, dude. Flipped my brisket for a minute, but hey, if it's going to bring me some business, I'm down for it. About that, you said you had a cancellation. Yeah, that might be a bit of an exaggeration. I had some people who said they were interested in booking next week, and yesterday was the day they were supposed to get back to me by. I got a message from them when I got here that said they're not going through with it. I see. I tap my fingers on my desk. Have you been doing this long? Funny you should ask. This is my first year. Have you ever gone down the river? His words are not exactly easing my mind. Sure have. I grew up on the river. In the woods. My parents were kind of hippies. And while we owned an acre in the woods and lived in a cabin with no electricity and no heat other than a wood stove, we roamed all over the National Park land. Uncle Sam probably doesn't know he was feeding my parents and my brothers and me for the first twenty years of my life. I suppose it's illegal, but my parents did it anyway. You lived out of the woods? Sure did. Mushrooms, moss, small animals. We did some trapping, too. It was probably illegal, although I was out of the house before I realized that you needed permits and stuff to do that. All right, so the dude is unconventional, and someone that definitely would not fit back in California. But the more he talks, the safer I feel going down the river with him and trusting the ladies and gentlemen in my care to him. Not Lee. I wouldn't completely entrust her to him. I don't want to look into that too deeply. Maybe it's arrogant. It probably is. But I feel like I'm a better man for her than he is. Not a better man if one were lining us up side by side. Just better for Lee. Sounds like you're pretty well versed in living outside. I sure am. But... I can function in society, if that's what you're worried about. I've actually held a couple of different jobs with regular hours. No, I wasn't really worried about that. I can put your mind at ease or anyone else who might be concerned. I speak English, and I'm potty trained. I had to grin over that one. I can appreciate a man with a sense of humor. I am more comfortable outside than I am in. Bane says. I had to leave the mountain in order to make enough money to outfit my business. Guiding tours is as close as I'm going to get to living the way I want. I get that. Honestly, I really do. The more time I spend in Idaho, the more I am sure I am not going anywhere else, ever. The country has grown on me, kind of just slipped in between my cells with its tentacles and become a part of me and made me so I want to stay. Completely satisfied with everything that Bane has said, I give him my card number, reserve the dates, and tell him I'd be back in touch with the number of people that are going. 
I don't think any of the other residents want to go, but I'm not entirely sure. I hang up the phone, satisfied but still a little uneasy. Bane is a nice dude, and I'm not entirely sure that Lee, even if she doesn't particularly care for him now, won't be enraptured with him after spending four days watching Bane in his element. I tell myself that if anything is meant to be between Lee and me, it will work out. Then I wonder why I bother. Am I really interested? None of that seems very concrete, and I don't like dealing with things I can't nail down. But it's all I have, so I have to be content. For now. Chapter 10 Lee I end up staying a little longer at Cherry Tree than I'm technically supposed to, which is typical for me, and I'm ready to leave at my normal time, which is about six o'clock. Dog is still in his office, and it seems like he's just sitting there, maybe waiting on me, maybe trying to come up with how he's going to save our facility. Whatever he's thinking, I feel compassion as I walk in, leaning against the door jam as he did with mine when he was in my office. You wanted to see me? I ask softly so as not to startle him. I do anyway, and he drops his hands away from his chin and gives me a little smile. That's new. As is being called into his office without being in trouble. At least, I don't think I'm in trouble. Of course, after I tell him what I have to tell him, I might be in trouble. Or maybe the ladies will be, depending on whether he believes me or not. You can come in and sit down. He says softly, and it feels intimate. Things usually calm down by the time I leave for the day. None of the folks here are real active in the evening. After supper is over, the whole facility is quiet, almost feeling deserted. I look at the chair and think about him standing in my office, not walking in. I guess that's him and not me. Although I don't shut the door, I do walk in and sit in front of him. I guess things went okay today? I nod. He saw the dude I ended up with. They asked 17 people before they got him. How many ladies did you guys go through? I ask figuring he has similar war stories. Melissa was the first one. He doesn't say it in a bragging kind of tone, just like he is relaying fact to me, which he is. It isn't what I want to hear, though. Certainly does not make me feel any better. It took a while, I say, just because I don't know what else to say. Chubb and Patrick were kind of particular. They wouldn't ask just anyone. They insisted she could not be wearing jammy pants, which pretty much excluded at least half of the ladies who left. I nod. I've gone shopping myself a time or two in jammy pants. I guess it's man repellent. For some reason, I feel like I should keep this in mind. I'm not sure why. Melissa seems like a nice woman. I feel like our conversation isn't going anywhere, and I'm pretty sure he didn't invite me in so we could chit-chat. Although, part of me wouldn't mind talking with him. Real talking. Which is weird, considering I don't even really like him. Bane seems like a nice fellow. He pauses for a minute, and I nod. Because Bane does seem like a nice man, just not the man for me. He had left a message by the time I got back. I've scheduled a whitewater rafting trip for next week, and I got a head count on who's going during supper this evening, so I'll call him back first thing and set that up. I nod. Are you okay with the way everything's going? He asks. It seems like a repeat of his earlier question, and it's almost like he wants me to give a different answer. I can't say that this is the most thrilling thing I've ever done, but I feel like Bane is probably as good a guy as any to have a fake relationship with. I guess that's what he's asking. 
I return the question. Are you okay? He nods. Melissa's actually just the kind of woman that would be perfect for me. I notice that he says would be, and I wonder about that. Then I decide, since we seem to be partners in this operation, why can't I just ask him about it? So I do. What do you mean, would be? I kind of hold my breath, wondering if he's going to answer. His head tilts a little like he's lifting a shoulder. I guess when someone looks at me and then looks at her, we just look like we belong together, don't you think? Again, it's like he's asking me a question that goes a little deeper than the surface words. Can I answer him honestly? I think she's exactly wrong for you. There, that was honest. I think I see a flash of humor in his eyes, or a spark of something. Maybe his lips turn up a little. I think he likes my answer. Bane isn't right for you either. He says, like he's commenting on the weather and not on something that personal. It's weird for Doug to step out of the professional zone like this, but I like it. I agree. I was trying to think of a good type for you. I wish the ladies would have come a little closer. I'm not entirely sure what he means by that, that he hoped they would come closer, but he continues. So what is your type? Now that question is definitely out of bounds. But it's after hours and both of us are about to be out of a job, since neither one of us has really come up with anything that's going to save the facility. I don't want to be the one to say who my perfect type is first, without finding out from him about his, although he basically said Melissa was. I guess I've never really thought about it. I purse my lips and squeeze my hands together. My first husband belonged to a motorcycle gang, with the tattoos and the leather and the chains and everything, and he definitely was not right for me. I've shocked him. I can tell because of the way he jerks back, just a little, but I see it. His eyes blink and he looks me over again. I wouldn't have guessed that. We all go through a little crazy time in our youth, don't we? It was a mistake, and I knew it almost from the time we said, I do. Two years later, he left me for a chick who had her own bike. So, yeah, we've really gotten off the rails, and I haven't even told him what I need to. Doug seems pretty calm considering what I've just admitted. He says, Your ex sounds like the opposite of mine. She was perfectly proper in everything she did. Never a hair out of place or a foot out of line. That sounds hard to live with. I don't mean to say that because I don't want to insult his ex, but those are the words that came out. It was. But I guess I had faults too, because she told me she couldn't take it anymore and then left with her personal trainer. Personal trainers are a really bad idea, I say, meaning it as a joke. His eyes kind of narrow at me before he smiles. I agree. I'm not sure why we both find that funny, but we grin over it, and then I say, I, I probably am not supposed to be saying this, but I don't know if you heard the entirety of Agnes's bucket list, but she wants to spend a night in jail. As soon as I say that, Doug's eyes get huge and he leans forward. No, she didn't show it or read it to me. She just told me she would cross off the shark cage if we agreed to hire the fake boyfriend and girlfriend. Well. They've decided that tonight is the night that they want to spend in jail. I lift my eyes, pull my lips back, and shrug a little. What more can I say? Are you to be involved in this? Doug asks, lowering his head and looking at me with a serious and almost betrayed look. I have to be. You know that. Spending a night in jail is not on my bucket list. Maybe once I get older, it won't be so bad, but I have a reputation in town. 
Okay, my mom is in town, and she's sure to hear about it if I go to jail. I know I'm an adult, but surely I'm not the only person in the world who doesn't want their mother to hear about them being arrested. Doug leans back and crosses his arms over his chest. I think he's disappointed in me. What's the plan? His eyes lower just a little. Or am I not allowed to know? I'll just be driving around town tonight somewhere and see the ladies from my facility, along with my activities director being carted off to jail. Agnes suggested we drive erratically and then fail a field sobriety test. Doug kind of nods. You think that'll get everybody put in jail? Or just you? I think Agnes thinks she can live vicariously through me. I'm pretty sure if I go to jail and she's in the car with me when it happens, she'll cross it off her bucket list. I see. I think he does. And maybe he's considering, as I have been, that Agnes's bucket list is meant to get me out more than her. I think about women and their tendency to meddle, and their love of romance, and I wonder if Agnes isn't playing a more complicated game than what I thought she was. Should this bother me? I'm surprised that it doesn't. I think, though, if Doug is figuring out the same thing I am, he will be bothered. I guess that's his problem. The way I see it, there's probably not a whole lot I can do to stop it, so I might as well go along. Maybe that's fatalistic or even negative thinking, but it's the way I feel. No point getting upset about things I can't control. I guess I'll keep that in mind. Do you want me to bail you out? He asks, and I'm surprised he's taken it so calmly. I don't think you can. Not until tomorrow morning, anyway, for it to count. He nods again, and then he says, The reason I asked you to stop in was so that I could make sure that next week suits you for the whitewater rafting. I've already booked it, but I said I would give final counts and a firm commitment this evening. It works for you? It does, I say. I wanted to know if you had any other ideas on what we talked about earlier this week on saving the facility. Boy, I wish I had a different answer. Sorry, I really don't. I mean, advertising and word of mouth are usually the best, and location, of course. And those things just take time. That's what I've come up with, too. I'm sure he doesn't feel the same way I do where if the facility closes, I'll miss the ladies and I will really miss my job. But the worst thing about the closure will be that I'll no longer be working with Doug. I think our conversation is over, so I stand. I guess I will see you tomorrow. Or tonight. My stomach turns over and I nod. Or tonight. I walk out going home and doing all the things I need to do in the evening, and I finally make it back to the facility around midnight. That's the hour that the ladies and I had agreed upon. The ladies are sitting on benches on the covered porch. They get up when they see my car coming up the drive. I have to laugh, because they must have borrowed overcoats from the men. They look like a bunch of outlaws. The effect is ruined, though, because Harriet still has her big bunny slippers on. They look warm and fun and definitely not like something that a person spending the night in jail would wear. I know if anyone ends up in jail, it will probably be me. We talk and drive, and drive and talk. It's harder than you would think to get pulled over. It's almost 2 a.m., and I'm getting ready to suggest we go back and try this again some other time before we spot a patrol car coming down Main Street in good grief. Oh, boy, Gertrude says from behind me. I'm not sure I want to go through with this. Red and blue lights are flashing in the interior of our car, and I say, I think it's too late. 
It's definitely too late. I eased my car along the side of the road. At the last second, I decide to park it at a weird angle, maybe the way a drunk person might. I'm not sure how drunk people park, and I'm not sure whether I can convince the officer that I've done anything that I should be taken to jail for. My parents raised me that honesty is the best policy, and this feels a little weird, especially considering I'm being devious, not to get out of trouble, but to get in it. Still, if it helps Agnes with her bucket list, I'm going to give it a try. I sit in my car while the officer walks up alongside me, his flashlight out, and shines it in the vehicle, standing back away from the window. I probably know this kid. I know all of the police officers in good grief, although I haven't seen his face yet. I'm going to have some explaining to do to my parents, which, honestly, I have already thought of. I know my dad will be okay, and my mom will come around especially when I tell them that I did it for the ladies. I think Mom especially feels an affinity toward them, since they burned their undergarments together. License and registration? Sorry, officer, I don't have them. I do my best to slur my words. I'm not sure I'm effective. Get out of the car, ma'am, and put your hands on the roof. Should we get out too, officer? Agnes sounds a little too eager in my opinion, and maybe the officer agrees. No, ladies, you just stay there. He says as he leans over and shines the light in the back of the car. I hear Agnes's disappointed sigh. Maybe the officer does too, although the stern expression on his face does not ease. Underneath his hat, his face is cloaked in shadow, but I am pretty sure this is Phil Jones, who was a member of the volunteer fire company before he was hired by the police. I think he still has an EMS certification and responds to calls when he is off duty. Phil? I say. Corey? Phil says, shining the light in my eyes and naming my sister, who is closer in age to him than I am. No, Corey's sister, Lee. Just then, bright lights flash in his eyes and tires squeal, which is a pretty great feat, considering we are on the outskirts of good grief and even I wouldn't go fast enough to get my tires to squeal. A couple of seconds later, a car lurches to a stop, six inches from where Phil and I stand. I'm kind of kicking myself, because I'm pretty sure that is how drunk people drive. I wasn't the slightest bit convincing, I'm sure. Phil leans down to his jacket and speaks into the mic hooked up there. It's Phil calling for backup. If you're in the area, Chuck, I'm on the south side of town. I've got a crazy guy here and a couple of drunks. The radio crackles, and it sounds like Chuck is on his way. Don't you guys go out with partners? I ask. Not on weeknights. Usually on weekends. Phil isn't shining the light in my eyes anymore but he does seem to be peering at me pretty closely. I thought you were drunk. You were driving erratically. Cool. I guess I did fool him. My chest puffs out a little. I'm a better drunk than I thought I was. A car door slams and Phil's attention is no longer on me. I am surprised, but maybe I shouldn't be, when Doug lurches around the end of his car. Okay, let me explain. I am surprised to see Doug, especially knowing he was the one driving so erratically and squealing his tires. But I am also surprised to see him lurching. I've never seen him do anything but stride with purpose. This is weird. Mr. Ripley? Phil says with disbelief in his voice. Apparently, I'm not the only one who is shocked. Looks like I'm a little late to the party, Doug says, and his words are definitely slurred, which makes my eyes narrow even more. I wouldn't have been surprised at him faking it, but his slurring seems real. 
You guys didn't invite me. I guess that means I'm crashing it. He laughs and sounds as drunk as any person I've ever been around, which, I'll admit right now, hasn't been many. Stand right there, Lee. Looks like Mr. Ripley's had a few too many tonight. He should not have been driving. Take your time, Phil. I've got all night. I say, although I'm wondering to myself if it counts towards spending a night in jail if I don't make it to the jail cell until morning. Doug has made his way to us, and Phil doesn't actually have to leave me to get to him. Mr. Ripley, have you been drinking? Doug gives a lopsided smile, and I feel like I could answer that question for him, except his eyes hook on mine, and there's definitely nothing cloudy or loopy about his eyes. They peer into me, and while there's no judgment there, I feel like they say that if I'm going to be here, he's going to be here too, if only to make sure that I don't get myself into trouble. Don't ask me how eyes can say all that, but that's what I feel when he looks at me. I now know two things. Doug isn't drunk. And contrary to everything that I've ever thought, Doug likes me. Chapter 11 Doug This is not exactly how I meant to spend my evening. Or my night. I've heard that love makes people do foolish things, but I wouldn't have said that I'm in love. However, seeing Lee makes me feel like maybe I won't have to pretend to be dizzy. My world seems to be swimming on its own. I haven't drunk a drop. I did, however, purposely spill beer on my undershirt before I put my button down on. Phil sniffs and his nose wrinkles. Man, Mr. Ripley, you reek. This is not going to be good advertising for Cherry Tree. I've already said that love makes people do crazy things. But it can't be that. What else? Because something is driving me to pretty much destroy my life and reputation and all the things I've carefully built. She's looking at me with confusion on her face. Maybe you just have a cold, Phil. Maybe you need a tissue. I dig in my pocket for the handkerchief that I douse with alcohol as well, pulling it out and dangling it in front of Phil. No, thank you, Phil says, jerking back. I know, this isn't exactly the typical big city stop. I don't even know if good grief is typical for small towns. But we know Phil, and he knows us. And while we aren't famous upstanding citizens, we aren't generally known as troublemakers. Lee's mom is the fire chief, for goodness sake, and I could hardly have a more boring job than director of the local senior assisted living center. I don't think Phil knows what to do with us. A siren flips on and off, and more lights start to whirl as another car pulls in. The entire Good Grief police force is here. Surely someone can manage to get arrested out of this. By this point, the ladies have gotten out of their car, and they've formed a semicircle behind Lee. Maybe the arrival of the second car is scared Lee, because she says to Phil, Mr. Ripley is not drunk. Okay, I admit I think it's cute the way she says Mr. Ripley but I don't like it. I want her to call me Doug. This doesn't seem like the time to insist on that, so I don't. N never mind. This all has to do with Agnes and her bucket list. Lee glances over her shoulder at the ladies, and I can see the apology on her face. I have to say, I love that she is not willing to see me get arrested without trying to stop it. Phil shines his flashlight at my chest, looking at me sniffing the air again, and definitely not looking like he believes Lee. He turns his head and studies her and the lady standing beside her. Isn't it past you ladies' bedtime? He finally says, sweeping his light over the three ladies and causing Miss Harriet's hair to glow a pumpkin-colored orange. Not tonight it's not, Sonny. 
Miss Agnes says in a tone that makes me laugh, or at least want to. I'm sorry about this situation, Phil. Lee begins before the next officer strides over. We all know Chuck, just as well as we know Phil, and Lee stops with what she's saying and greets him. Hey, Chuck. Nice night for a drive. Lee? I thought there were drug people and something weird going on. He turns confused eyes to Phil. Well, when Mr. Ripley drove his car so close, it concerned me for a bit. Until I saw him. I still haven't figured out what's going on yet. Let me tell you. Lee says before any other confusion can happen. Agnes has a bucket list, and one of the items on that is to spend the night in jail. We are trying to get arrested, but I'm apparently not as good at pretending to be drunk as Mr. Ripley is. Okay, I know I shouldn't be proud of this, but she said I was good at something. So what if it's pretending to be drunk? Whatever. Still makes me feel proud that she thought I was doing a good job. So, which one of you is Miss Agnes? Phil asks uncertainly. That's me. Miss Agnes says, raising her hand and stepping forward. But if you arrest these two and they spend the rest of the night in jail, that'll count and I'll cross it off my list. My eyebrows go up, Phil's brows go down, and Lee just looks like she'd known that all along. Maybe she didn't know about me, but I recall her mentioning earlier that Miss Agnes seems to be living her life vicariously through her. It looks like she was right about that. So, let me get this straight. You're not really drunk? Phil points a flashlight at me. I'll take a test if you want me to, but no. I bought a mug of beer at the tavern before it closed, dumped it over my t-shirt, and threw a shirt on over top of it. I say this in my natural voice. I'm no longer slurring my words. Maybe that's what convinces him. I don't know. Or maybe it's the older ladies, who are obviously just having fun and probably wouldn't lie. I'm so sorry, Phil. In hindsight, I should have just gone to the police station and asked if we could stay in a jail cell overnight. I didn't mean to make all of this trouble for you and Chuck. Lee really does look grieved. And I do believe it's because she's realized that she's made Chuck and Phil's night more difficult and that she probably shouldn't be going around trying to get arrested. Don't worry about it, Lee. Nothing ever happens on a weeknight anyway. Good to know. I'd hate to think I was keeping you from actually doing something important. We'd just be sitting around trying not to fall asleep if we weren't doing this, Phil says, and he seems to have relaxed some. So, Miss Agnes, you'll be happy if I arrest Mr. Ripley and Lee, is that right? He adds, seeming to be more concerned about making the old lady happy than about whether or not Lee and I want to be arrested. That's right, Sonny. Lock them up, Miss Agnes says. But you'll have to drive us home because none of us have our licenses anymore, Gertrude says. She's been suspiciously quiet all evening. I think maybe she's very uncomfortable with the idea of the police. I am, too. I've never even gotten a speeding ticket. Should we handcuff them? Phil asks, looking at the ladies, and I have to admit I think that they're taking this a little bit too far. Actually, as I look closer, Phil seems like he's enjoying this. I suppose... If this is the most action he sees on a weeknight, I can't blame him for it. I'm not really looking forward to going to jail, though. This is not on my bucket list. I think again of the love thing and how it makes people do crazy things, and I wish I knew what the other things are that make men act like idiots, because I'm afflicted. I don't want to be afflicted by love, though. In my mind, love means pain. I'm kind of happy with my life the way it is. Pain-free. Chuck, you mind throwing your handcuffs on him and I'll go ahead and cuff Lee. I suppose we can stick them both in the back of the car 
Then you can drive these ladies back home so they can get themselves a little beauty sleep. Phil winks at them, and the ladies titter. But my heart kind of freezes when Chuck speaks. You know, I took my handcuffs off to check the latch on one of them, and I never hooked them back on my uniform. You don't have an extra set, do you? No, I took mine off to show you how yours are supposed to work. Okay, this is making me a little nervous, or it would if we actually had criminals in good grief. The idea that they're fixing their own handcuffs is a little disconcerting. We just have the one pair? Phil says, looking at Chuck. Chuck raises his hand. I don't have any. Well, sorry, you two, but I'm going to hook you together. I wish I could give you the full effects, but this is going to have to do. I'm ready to tell him that he doesn't have to use handcuffs at all, because I don't need the full effects. But I don't want Miss Agnes to have any reason to not cross this off her bucket list. And I can just see that wily old woman right now saying since we didn't get handcuffed, it doesn't count. If I'm going to jail, this is going to count. Phil pulls his cuffs out, and Lee sticks out the arm that is closest to me. I stick mine out beside hers and admire our differences. I also kind of wish that I hadn't worn my button down, because with cuffs, our arms would be touching, and skin on skin would be much better than skin on shirt. She's in a t-shirt and jeans, which she doesn't typically wear to work, and she looks good to me. I like her boots, too. I'm not really a boot kind of guy, but it seems like everyone here in good grief wears them. I think maybe I need to get myself a pair. They weren't common footwear back in California. The officers agree that Phil's going to drive us to the station, and he puts his hand on our heads as we get in the car. I slide the whole way over so Lee can get in behind me, and our cuffed hands sit on the seat between us. I look over at her as Phil shuts the door. This is going to work for Miss Agnes's list? She nods. I'm sure it will. If you have the privilege of seeing her list, would you do me a favor and rip it up? She laughs and rolls her eyes. If Miss Agnes ever handed it to me, I guarantee you it would have been ripped long before now. Maybe we could convince her to add normal things. Maybe she could do something easy like graffiti or cutting a tree down. I think Good Grief is much better off if Miss Agnes doesn't have a chainsaw. We'll have to note that it has to be done with a handsaw. I agreed that cutting a tree down is much better than skydiving, and that is still on her list. We'll have to figure out how to get that one off, too. Maybe she could lose the list. She guards that thing like it's her child, Lee says, and her hand moves to emphasize her point. The back of her hand brushes against mine, and it tempts me to turn my hand around and see if I can hold hands with someone that I'm handcuffed to. The things I never thought I would want to know. I'm afraid that being around Lee is changing me. Maybe I shouldn't be afraid, because I think I like the person I'm becoming. Chapter 12 Lee Gertrude has been telling me all along that I need to be kind to Doc. She says that I can catch more flies with honey than vinegar, and of course, I retort that I'm not interested in catching flies. But I've known all along that I am attracted to him. I suppose I am fighting it. Because, come on, it's not okay to be attracted to your boss. That makes things awkward. As does being handcuffed to him. Awkward in a lot of different ways, since I'm tempted to turn my hand around and link my fingers with his. I kind of think he'd be okay with it. But that doesn't solve the bigger problem, which is, he is still my boss. We don't say too much on the car ride there, 
and both of us are okay when the guys want to skip the booking paperwork and just put us in a cell. They do have to unlock the handcuffs so they can put us in separate cells. I've never actually been in a jail cell, and to be honest, I've never even been in the jail. There's a narrow bed, a sink, and a toilet in each one of the four cells. I'm wondering why Good Grief even has four jail cells, and I'm tempted to ask if there's ever been a time when all four were full. But it's almost four o'clock in the morning, and I'm pretty tired. I think Doug is too, because he's been quiet as well. Hopefully he's tired and not angry. They put us in the side-by-side -side cells, and both of us go over and sit down on our beds. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be sleeping, but tomorrow is Saturday, so I guess I can take a nice afternoon nap. Will you be able to catch up on your sleep tomorrow? Doug leans his head back against the wall and looks over at me. Then his brows pull together. I guess I mean today. A ghost of a smile crosses his face, and goodness, I have to admit the man looks good with a five o'clock shadow. Even if his eyes are tired, and even if I do feel a little guilty because of the weariness on his face, it's my fault. I can. The fire hall is serving chicken dinners at noon tomorrow, I guess today, and I'm supposed to help with that, but afterward, probably around two or so, I can sleep the rest of the day. I guess I had seen signs for the chicken dinners. I'll have to come get one. They're really good. My mom will be cooking tomorrow, so they'll definitely be good. Your mom is quite a woman. I roll my head on the cement wall and look over at him. I guess he didn't grow up in good grief. My mom was just a housewife for a lot of years, but once us girls were out of the house, she really found her niche in the fire company. She still helps dad at the vet's office, though. I've heard that. Like I said, she's quite a woman. I'm not sure exactly what that means. I mean, I like that Doug admires my mother, but I kind of feel like he's saying something else, although I'm not sure what. She has a pretty interesting daughter as well. I almost don't hear him because he murmurs the words so low. I'm not sure pretty interesting is a compliment, I say, blinking my eyes to try to get the cloudiness out of them. I never stay up this late. It was. Doug says, rolling his head so that he's looking forward. His hands are crossed over his stomach, and he's slouched back against the wall. I've never seen him look like anything but a proper businessman, so the position is a little bit odd. I want to tease him about it, but I don't know if we're on those kinds of terms. I snort. What? He asks, without turning his head to me. I wanted to tease you about slouching and not looking like my boss right now, but I wasn't sure if we had a casual relationship like that. But then I thought, we're in jail together. I'm pretty sure I can tease you about just about anything now. His eyes are closed, but his lips turn up. You can. That's something I never expected my boss to say. He's always seemed like such an uptight, play-by-the-rules kind of guy. I think I'm seeing another side of you. I think I'm seeing the same side of you. At least, the side I knew was there all along. Really? Sure. About five minutes after we started working together, I figured I'd see you in jail someday. The thing I didn't know was that I would be here with you. I suppose I could take that the wrong way. Like I'm dragging him down or something. But I know he didn't mean it like that. I think Mr. Ripley has a sense of humor. I also think there was a little bit of flirt in my voice. I think that's what happens when I'm out too late. I start flirting with guys that I have absolutely no chance with. Some people turn into pumpkins after midnight. 
I get funny, I guess. I don't point out to him that he's been funny all evening, but I do say, I don't know if it's a time thing or maybe it's our location. You didn't really start making me laugh until they locked you up. Maybe being in jail suits you. I'm not sure that's going to make my parents proud. Are your parents in California? His head rolls over the wall until he's looking at me. You know I'm from California? I smile and lift a shoulder. Small town. That should explain it, but it really doesn't. I looked him up, and I asked around about him. It wasn't like it was local gossip that I heard somewhere, although I could have, I suppose. He lifts his brows as though to say, oh yeah, and straightens his head. I'm glad I don't have to admit that I was interested enough to look him up. Small town's reputations for being great gossip centers saved my bacon. This time. How long do we have to stay here? He asks. He's been quiet for a couple minutes, and I almost thought he was falling asleep, so his words surprised me. I don't know. I just want to make sure it counts on Miss Agnes's list. It had better count, I say. Do you have something that you need to do? I guess I never really thought about it, but I suppose he could have a woman that he goes somewhere to see on the weekends or something he does with his family somewhere. Obviously, he wouldn't be going to see the ones in California, but maybe he does Zoom calls or they meet somewhere. I don't think twice about the idea that he sees his family, but the idea of a girlfriend kind of bothers me. I guess he wouldn't have agreed to have a fake one if he had a real one somewhere. Do you have a girlfriend? I definitely have been out way too late. That was not an appropriate question for me to ask my boss. I'm sorry. I am crossing lines here. Crossing lines? His head is turned toward me at my question, and I think he looks amused. But my cheeks are hot, and I look away. You're my boss. That's not something we should talk about. We're not exactly on the job. The boss rules only apply when we're at work, right? I suppose being in jail presents a whole new set of rules. I'm not up on jail etiquette. On the day I met you, I should have brushed up on it, instead of starting the bail Lee out of jail fund at my bank. You have bail money? I ask, glancing up. He shoots that grin at me again, the one where his lip just turns up slightly, and he has that glint in his eye. I really like that look. He doesn't say anything, though, and our eyes hold for a couple of moments. Finally, I look down at my hands and pick at my fingernails. I'm sorry I've complicated your life. I don't think we've probably succeeded in attracting any new residents, although we haven't lost any of the ones we have. He sighs. You know, you don't need to apologize. You've opened my eyes about a few things and made me realize that I could expand my outlook on life a little. Not take things so seriously. It's important to do a good job and be serious about your work, but I think it's also important to enjoy the journey. I nod. I've heard that saying before, and although that hasn't been my mantra throughout my life, I definitely agree with it. It's probably the way I've lived, even if it hasn't been deliberately. You only go through once. It might as well be fun. Right. As long as you take care of your responsibilities and do the things that are expected of you. And help people along the way. It's not fun if you're only doing it for yourself. That's something else I've been learning. I saw my job as a job. I didn't really see my job as people. But I think that's what it is. Sometimes it becomes about money. That's what was passed down to me from corporate. The money angle. And of course we need it.
need money to keep the facility going, to pay ourselves. But there has to be a balance between the money and taking care of the people who have been entrusted to us. We sit there in silence for a little bit, in agreement, with maybe both of us giving some acknowledgement to the things that have changed in our lives because of being with each other. Maybe I've caused him to loosen up a little, but he's definitely helped me to see the business aspect and to be more concerned about attracting new residents to our facility. Not something I thought about six months ago. So, do you spend a lot of time at the fire hall because of your mom? He asks, and it surprises me that he's making small talk on such a personal level. Surprises, but also makes me feel strangely warm. I like that he's interested. At least, I hope it's interest and not small talk. We could be talking about the weather, after all. Yeah, although even before Mom was the chief, she was a member of the ladies' auxiliary, and we've always helped. Just like we do with the library and the church and the school. I mean, come on, it's our small town. Everybody has to pull their weight, do their part, or it's not really a community. It's just a bunch of people living together in the same area. I guess that's the way it was in California. We lived in the burbs, and I waved at my neighbors, but we never really talked or did anything together. I don't even know who was in the fire company. I guess they are paid to be there. It's a lot different when you're out here, and everyone's responsible for everyone else, to keep things going, because there's not enough money to pay people to do it. I think it might be better that way. I can't disagree. So, why aren't you married? Okay, so this is really personal. Maybe he has the same issues I do after midnight. I was. I know. He says before I say anything more. You told me. To a motorcycle dude, but that was a long time ago. I want to know why you haven't gotten married again. My eyes open wide and I look away toward the other jail cells that are empty, of course. I should have known he'd wait. I thought if I don't say anything for a long enough time, maybe we'd move on to a different subject, or maybe we'd sleep, or maybe I'd be excused from answering. But that seems like the coward's way out, and the silence is still stretching slowly between us, laden with anticipation. So, I say, I guess I just didn't have any interest. That leaves out a lot, particularly the fact that I actually do have some interest in him. But now that I've answered his question, I guess I can ask him the same thing. And you? Same. I wonder if it's the same that I said or the same that I didn't say. Might he not be saying something too? I have no way of knowing, and I'm not brave enough to ask. I never thought I would say something like this, but I guess I'm looking forward to the whitewater rafting trip. I didn't think I was that kind of guy, but I found in my time here that Idaho is beautiful, and it grows on you. When he first started speaking, I thought he was going to say he was looking forward to the trip because I was going to be there too and he was looking forward to spending time with me. I have to admit, I'm disappointed. But, I agree. Idaho is beautiful. And while I've been rafting a couple of times, I'm looking forward to this trip because I've never been overnight. I lift up a hand, kind of waving it around. And I'm excited for the ladies, too. I think they're really going to enjoy it. And whatever happens, with the facility and everything else, I know this is a trip that they're going to be happy they took. I agree. He pushes away from the wall and sits up. Have we spent enough time here? He looks at his watch. It's five. Surely that counts as morning? I hope so. If we go now, I might be able to catch a couple of hours of sleep before I have to go into the fire hall and help my mom cook the chicken. 
My sisters will be there getting it ready, and I think I might be able to show up late. I've thought of her several times since I entered the jail, but this time, the door opens, and like a whirlwind, she blows in. It's a small town. Gossip travels like wildfire, even in the middle of the night. Phil, I heard from Mrs. Thompson, who heard from Mrs. Park, who heard from Mrs. Richardson, who said her grandson was looking out his window and saw my daughter Lee and her boss, Mr. Ripley, being handcuffed and taken to jail. Is that correct? My mom doesn't stop for a breath, but is looking around the jail, and her eyes land on me. Lee Elizabeth Harding, what in the world have you done? It's really bad when I get my middle name. I feel like I'm about five and in big trouble. My mom is sniffing the air. I've kind of gotten used to the smell, but I'd forgotten about Doug and the alcohol he has on him. I've stood up and so has he. Only I've walked to the door of my jail cell, my hands on the bars, while he's kind of stopped in the middle. I don't think he's exactly afraid of my mom, but she can be pretty intimidating. I wouldn't put it past her to grab him through the bars. Not that she would have any reason to. She might grab me, but I know my mouth can work fast enough to get me out of trouble. You won't believe this, Mom, but Miss Agnes, I begin, and then I tell her about what's going on. By the time I'm done, she's nodding and smiling, and honestly, I think she's about ready to ask Phil to put her in a cell with us, if it'll make Agnes happy. But actually, Doug, I mean, Mr. Ripley and I, Doug is fine. Doug interrupts me just to say that. He doesn't seem like the kind of person who is okay with first names, but I glance at him, and I feel like we look at each other and say more without saying anything at all, even though my mom is standing right there. Maybe she picks up on it, because my mom is pretty astute that way, but she doesn't say anything. Even so, it wouldn't matter because if my mom thinks that Doug is going to make me happy, she will be all for it. She's a fire chief, and she takes that seriously, of course. But first and foremost, I've never doubted that she's my mom and that she'll go to bat for me no matter how old I am and no matter what I do. It makes me happy, and it definitely makes me feel secure and loved. I turn back to my mother, tearing my eyes away from Doug. Maybe it's because I haven't slept at all, but I find that harder to do than I expected. Doug and I were just saying that we thought it was time for us to get out. That's all I have to say. My mom takes care of everything else, and ten minutes later, Doug is driving away in his car, and I'm riding away in mine with strict instructions from my mom to not come to the fire hall until ten. She has assured me that she will get everything set up, and she won't need me until it's time to start cooking. Tonight didn't quite turn out the way I was expecting. But in a lot of ways, I think it was better. And really, how many people can say they spent the night in jail with their boss? Chapter 13 Lee Saturday goes just fine. I see Doug when he comes to get his chicken dinner, but I don't talk to him. My sisters have decided to have a girls' night Sunday night since I'm leaving on the whitewater rafting trip Tuesday. So, Sunday night, we all meet up at Claire's house. Claire is engaged to her neighbor, Trey Haywood, and those two are perfect for each other. But Trey is not here tonight. I think he has Claire's girls, Melody and Evie. Evie loves basketball. Melody is really into science, but I think Trey has been teaching them both to play ball. And from what I understand, they're at the school with my sister Tammy's husband, Justin, and his son, Roy. The whole family knows that Roy kind of has a thing for Evie. But so far, they're just friends. I get to Claire's first, 
knock, and then let myself in. Claire's hollering, come on in, as I'm closing the door behind me. Her great Dane, Midget, is in my face. It might be intimidating for some people, because Midget is so huge, but she's a sweetheart, and pretty soon we'll be fighting over who gets to sit on the couch and who has to sit on the floor. Usually, Midget wins and gets the couch. She's not exactly a lapdog. After I spend five minutes petting the big baby, I walk into the kitchen. Mrs. Thompson dropped those off. Would you mind setting them on the table? Claire greets me with a request for help, and I guess that's how you know your family, right? I don't say anything but pick up the cookies with what looks like a glob of jello in the middle. And I'm careful not to let the cookies and the jello touch, because that would just be gross. Mrs. Thompson has always been known around good grief for her cookies, but I think lately she's been on a jello kick. I don't really live that close to her anymore, a quarter of a mile away, so I don't get her cookies much, and I want to make sure that these don't get soggy. Do you want me to take the plastic wrap off? I ask as I set them down on the table. Claire walks in beside me with a plate of brownies in her hand. Would you mind? <laughs> of course not. We work in silence for a bit, with Claire handing me a couple of spoons and me putting them in the dips that she has on the table, and chatting about the weather as Corey comes in, boundless energy as always, with my mom. A lot of times, mom doesn't make these because she's called out on something, so I'm glad to see her tonight. I hope it's okay, Lee but I met Miss Agnes in the grocery store with her granddaughter, and when I found out that her granddaughter was just visiting for a week or two and was going on the whitewater rafting trip with you this week, I invited both her and Miss Agnes to come tonight. My mom smiles and doesn't look the slightest bit concerned. She knows that it's perfectly okay. We've always felt free to invite anyone to our girls' nights. It's nice to just have family but it's also nice to extend family to others and include them. So is this just a question for Lee, or do I get a say in this as well? Claire's being a little goofy, since Mom had directed her question to me. I just asked Lee because Miss Agnes is at the assisted living center where she works. My mom sets a hearty-looking dip down on the table. It looks like it has meat and beans and lettuce and sour cream and pretty much anything that anybody might have in their refrigerator in it. I want to take a spoon and just start eating it, but I don't. She sets a bag of chips down alongside it. I know, I was just kidding. Claire says, coming over and giving Mom a hug. I think sometimes the townspeople are intimidated by my mom because she's so capable. She's great in an emergency and she's great when you need a shoulder, and she's great with dad's paperwork, and she's the best wife and mom I know, and I'm not just saying that because she's mine. Seriously, my dad's a lucky man, and he knows it, which is good. Some men are lucky, and they don't know it. I suppose that's true about women, too. I wonder which one is true about my marriage. I feel like I've become a better person since it blew up a decade and a half ago, but I'm not sure I'm ready to try again. It's funny how I've been thinking about it more lately, with all the interaction that I've been having with Doug. I would never pair the two of us together. We're too different. But I have to admit, when I think about getting married again, he's the only one I have in mind. We're still chatting when the door blows open again, and my oldest sister, Tammy, blows in. Anyone who knows Tammy, a very proper high school English teacher, who is tall, slender, and very meticulous, would smile at the idea that she could blow anywhere. But that's the only way I can describe it. Her eyes are glowing, her cheeks are rosy, her hair windblown, and she just looks alive and gorgeous and happy, which makes me happy for her. 
She's had a really rough time for a few years after her divorce. But she's met an incredible man, Justin, who honestly is her opposite in every way. He's interested in things I never thought Tammy would be interested in. And they fit together so beautifully, it's like listening to perfect harmony when you see them together. My goodness, girl, you look like you've had a great day. Claire says as she walks over and takes the vegetable tray out of Tammy's hand. She's changed, but she hasn't changed that much. I had an amazing afternoon, Tammy says with an emphasis on amazing, which makes it sound like it was truly spectacular. Wasn't today the charity run? My mom asks. She is up on those kind of things because of being in the fire company. A lot of times, they have an EMS and an ambulance sitting on site. It is. They moved it from tomorrow because of the rain coming, and it was just a gorgeous day. So, did you race, or did you and Justin find a beautiful spot and hang out? Honestly, Tammy's cheeks were already red, but her whole face kind of pinkens at the suggestion. We raced. I came in fifth. I can't even believe it. I think I could have done better, too, but I'm a little cautious yet around some of the turns, and especially some of the downhills. Rightfully so. People get hurt on those. Who would have ever thought my mother would be cautioning Tammy to be careful? Life changes in really weird ways sometimes. We chat some about the race, and Tammy tells us that we should all buy four-wheelers and go on charity runs. And while part of me wouldn't turn it down if I had the opportunity, another part of me already has enough things to do, and I'm not looking for a new hobby. I love spending time with the ladies at the nursing home, and I'm a little disappointed that Agnes and her granddaughter haven't shown up. I guess I'll get to meet her granddaughter on a rafting trip. We pray for the food, and everyone has gotten a plate when there's a knock at the door. I look over to see Agnes standing in the window with a tall blonde beside her. It must be her granddaughter. She is pretty, and she looks like she's about my age. I'll get that, I say to Claire, who's starting to put her plate down. I open the door and greet Agnes with a hug. And this must be your granddaughter. It sure is. Kimber, you and I have talked about her. And you've seen pictures. I think you showed me baby pictures, and maybe school pictures. So when you say granddaughter, I'm picturing a little girl. I hold my hand out. I'm Lee, the activities director. I'm Kimber, and I haven't seen any of your baby pictures or childhood pictures. So if you'd like to get some out so we're even, I'm all for that. I like her right away. There's humor laced all through her voice, so even though she's dressed in slacks and a blouse and looks like she's going to a business meeting rather than a girl's night out, I'm at ease right away. I barely even think about my t-shirt and jeans and flip-flops. Come on in. We've just started to eat. I help them get food, and the conversation flows around us until we sit down and my mom looks at Kimber and says, so, I understand from Miss Agnes that you have a vlog? Is that like a video and blog combined? My mom probably knows what a vlog is better than I do, but I'm glad she asked. I had no idea. That's right. I take videos and I post them online. I've heard of that. People can have quite a following and make a good bit of money. Corey says. She's had numerous jobs and I wouldn't say she's always hopping from the last greatest idea to the next one, but she does seem to get bored easily. She just has so much energy it gets hard for her to contain herself, or to stay engaged. She's great at multitasking. That's true. Some of the bigger people do. I make enough to survive on, and I have a decently sized following at a little over a million people. My jaw drops. A million people. That seems like an awful lot. She smiles and crosses her legs, classy and graceful, 
and I see Agnes in her, if not in her physical attributes, in her spirit. Agnes is a little wild and kind of crazy, but that's partly because she was so decorous for so many years. I think sometimes we get older and we regret not using our younger years to do more things that are a little crazy and outside the lines. That's what happened with Agnes anyway, I think. Grandma has already spoken with the facility director, Doug. Kimber says with her brows raised at me. I nod. My mouth is full of my mom's dip. It's delicious. And he has a spot for me on the whitewater rafting trip. We were thinking that me posting it online, the different videos that I'll take while we're on it, will encourage people to maybe check out the facility and possibly make it their permanent home. I wish I could take credit for that idea. It's brilliant. I say so, and my family chimes in, loving the idea that Idaho might be on the map for a million people who've never seen some of our amazing natural landscapes. I think I might have mentioned a time or two how gorgeous Idaho is, and it's often overlooked. I mean, we don't exactly have a Grand Canyon or Niagara Falls, and there aren't any redwoods or oceans in our state. But it's an absolutely beautiful place to be, and it looks like Kimber has the reach to help us out. As I'm thinking that, I'm looking at her closely, and I'm thinking how good she and Doug would look together. I'd completely forgotten about our hired boyfriend and girlfriend, but now I'm thinking that if Melissa backs out, Kimber would be perfect for Doug. Maybe that's what Agnes is thinking. It kind of makes me get quiet, and the conversation flows on around me as my mom, never shy, finds out for sure that she is currently unattached. I guess I just found out everything I need to know, and while I want to not like Kimber, it's impossible. She's nice, knowledgeable, and not arrogant or proud at all. Just a great person to be around. And although I'm not sure she's exactly an outdoorsy person, neither am I. And I think it'll be a lot of fun to go on a trip with her. I guess if it weren't for a nagging thought in the back of my head about Doug, I would be happy. Chapter 14 Doug Early Tuesday morning, there's a crowd of people standing underneath the porch roof outside Cherry Tree. I only have eyes for one, although I have to do my job, so I'm counting heads and checking things off. Everyone has the things that Bane told us we would need. A change of clothes, a raincoat, and a few other things. As requested, everyone has all their things stuffed into one bag. Everything that we need is going to go down the river with us, so we can't take a whole lot of extra, but we all have to have the necessities. I'm actually looking forward to it. I'm not really the whitewater rafting kind of guy, but the idea of floating down a river that is calm enough for an 80-year-old has gotten me kind of excited. Right, I'll be honest. I'm looking forward to taking the trip with Lee. Did I mention how good she looks this early in the morning? She has her hair in a ponytail, and while maybe her eyes still look a little sleepy, she's smiling and talking and even laughing occasionally with Miss Agnes and her granddaughter, whatever her name was. I can't remember. I could look down at my clipboard and find it, but I just want to take a few moments and enjoy looking at Lee. Staring is rude. And I'm going to look away, but I think about our hours in the jail together and the way she was willing to put whatever bad feelings or contention we had behind us and work together to try to save our facility. I remember she told me about Miss Agnes's granddaughter and the vlog she has. I spoke to her briefly, a few days ago, about finding a spot for her and taking videos during the trip, and apparently Lee has heard more about it since then. Lee seems pretty impressed with one million subscribers, but I guess I'm just not convinced that there's really anything that can be done to save Cherry Tree at this point, no matter how many subs she has. 
We only have three weeks, and now, for one of those, we're going to be gone. If this vlog is going to work, it needs to work fast. Old me would already have had applications sent out looking for a new job. New me is wondering if there's some work I can get online so I stay in good grief. Or thinking about talking to Lee about what her plans are. I bring my mind back to the task at hand. Chubb and Patrick are both ready to go, along with Miss Harriet, Miss Gertrude, Miss Agnes, and her granddaughter. Of course, Bane is our guide and also Lee's hired boyfriend, although I'm doing my best to try not to remember that. My hired girlfriend hasn't shown up. She's the last one. I take a few steps away and dial the number she gave me. It's early, and I cringe a little when she doesn't pick up after the first four rings. Either she's on her way here and she's not going to answer while she's driving, or she's sleeping. Finally, the second is confirmed when a groggy voice says, Hello? This is Doug Ripley. How do I introduce myself? Her fake boyfriend? You were going on a whitewater rafting trip with me today. Did I miss your cancellation? I add that last little bit, not trying to be rude, but just trying to get to the point. I changed my mind. It's supposed to rain all week, and I don't want to get wet. I had seen the forecast, that it called for rain, although the percentages were low. I assume that's what the raincoats are for, and being that it is June, while it's not hot, it is warm. I do have some concern about the older ladies and gentlemen. Maybe this is a bad idea. I don't typically second-guess myself this much, but I don't want anything to happen to anyone. And not just because it's going to keep more residents from wanting to move in, but because I don't want anything to happen to the five people who are going with us. I'm sorry to wake you up. That's all I needed to know. She hangs up without saying anything. I guess I can't blame her. We'll probably never talk again. Still, it's kind of nice to be polite to people whether you're going to see them again or not. I hang up, feeling now like I've dodged a bullet, because I hadn't been the slightest bit interested in Melissa, and I'm definitely feeling relieved that I won't have to spend the week being paired up with her. I put my phone away then turn back to the group, sweeping my eyes over them again and lingering a little on Lee. Would it make any difference to the ladies that Melissa wouldn't be there? Will they still be trying to play matchmaker between Lee and Bane? If I were truly desperate, it would be a simple matter of walking over to Miss Agnes right now, dropping a whisper in her ear, letting her know that maybe I'm interested in Lee, and seeing if she might be interested in setting us up or doing whatever it is that ladies do whenever they do the matchmaking thing between people. Of course, all of the ladies and the gentlemen left their hearing aids at the facility, so it probably wouldn't be a simple matter of whispering in her ear. I'd probably have to say it loud enough that everyone can hear, and I don't want to have to do that. Because while I'm interested in Lee, I'm not interested to the point where I don't care if she knows it. That's my cautious personality coming out, and I'm not sure that is what I want to be. Tucking that idea away to think about later, I call everyone to attention. I just got off the phone with Melissa, and she's not coming. Maybe the ladies look a little disappointed, but to my surprise, as my eyes sweep over the small group, Lee is the one who looks the most disappointed. Disappointment isn't exactly the emotion I'm going for. She should be happy that my fake girlfriend isn't coming. I don't have time to sit and wonder about it, though. I continue. Everyone else is here, and all of your things are already loaded on the back of the bus, so if everyone will climb on, we'll meet Bane in about six hours. Lee's parents have agreed to drive the bus down to where we will be getting off the Snake River, but it doesn't suit them to do it this morning, so they're going to do it sometime during the week. 
I love the sense of community here. I can't believe I lived without it all my life. I thought living in California was pretty great, but that was before I moved to Idaho. I can't imagine my mom being willing to spend an entire day driving a vehicle around so that it would be available for me to take a crowd of seniors home. Her mom didn't turn a hair, nor her dad, although I don't know him as well. I don't have any pets. Since he's a vet, I guess I just don't have any opportunity to see him. Miss Agnes smiles sweetly at me as she climbs on the bus, followed by her granddaughter. I'm standing beside the door with my clipboard, although I've already checked everyone off and I don't really need it. Her granddaughter touches me on the shoulder, which surprises me. I'd been already looking past her, at Lee, who is talking to Chubb. It's so nice of you to do this for these people. I know that whitewater rafting isn't something that you normally think of with a senior care facility, but my grandmother is so excited about going on this trip, and it wouldn't be possible without you. I guess I'm flattered, although I really can't take credit for it. The idea wasn't mine. The activities director, Lee, who is behind you, is the one who really put it all together. Well, I'm sure that you, as the director of the facility, had to approve it. I just think it is so amazing that you had the foresight to look past the prejudice of old age and know that even people who are considered maybe over the hill to some of society still love to do fun things. And I can tell that you're going to make sure that they are safe and nothing happens to them. Her voice is cultured and smooth and a little bit sultry, I guess, whatever sultry is. But it really doesn't do anything for me, although I admit I appreciate her compliments. I just wish that it was Lee saying them instead of her. I put on my business smile. Well, hopefully we'll have a safe trip and everyone will come back happy and healthy with great memories. Sounds professional and like I know what I'm talking about and like I'm a halfway intelligent person. And not like I'm more aware of the woman standing behind her talking to Chubb than I am of her. She squeezes my shoulder, which makes me want to shiver and not in a good way. But I contain that in my relieved sigh when she drops her hand and steps on the bus. I don't really like touchy-feely types. Okay. That's not true. I don't like touchy-feely types, except I wish Lee was a touchy-feely type. I remember the way her hand brushed against mine when we were handcuffed together, and I wish now I would have taken the opportunity to turn my hand and thread my fingers with hers. Would she have allowed it? I kind of hope so, but of course that opportunity is gone, never to return. And I will never know. That's kind of the way opportunities are, isn't it? They come, we don't take them, and they're gone forever. Good morning, Mr. Ripley. Lee says as Chubb nods at me, then climbs on the bus. I thought we decided you were calling me Doug. I thought that was just when we were in jail together. I know that shouldn't be funny, but my eyes crinkle and my lips turn up. It's for when we're in jail together and every other time. Okay, Doug, are you planning on being in jail with me again? She asks, because it kind of sounds like it. I guess it wasn't such a bad experience, I say, and that's the honest truth. Maybe that's because we knew that we could get out whenever we wanted to. I guess I wouldn't mind if we were stuck there together. Her eyes get kind of big, and I kick myself. That was a stupid thing to say. I want to say all the sweet words to her, which is weird because I don't even know any sweet words. I'm pretty sure sweet words don't contain the word jail. Hop on the bus, Lee. And it's the first time I've used her name. I think she likes it. I definitely do. Although I wish I could have thought of something to say other than that, because she obeys and our conversation is over as she gets on the bus.
I have four days to try to think of all the sweet words, ones that don't contain the word jail. Surely I can come up with something. Chapter 15 Lee Bang guides our raft to the sandbar where his helper is cooking food over an open fire. It smells delicious. The first day of rafting was not as hard as I had anticipated, and I think everyone had a lot of fun. We did a lot of laughing, saw a lot of gorgeous scenery, and the river was pretty much calm the entire way. Thankfully, the forecast rain never materialized, and the temperatures were perfect. I could not have planned a better day, and I am so happy for the seniors who came with us. They all seem to be having such a great time. I do think being outside all day in the fresh air has worked up big appetites in all of us. We stopped for lunch, but it was basically a sandwich and water. My stomach growls embarrassingly loud as the raft hits the sandbar, and Bane jumps out with a rope. I thought maybe Agnes would do more matchmaking between Bane and I than what she has, but I actually end up being seated across from Doug. We didn't have a private conversation, but we cheered and smiled and listened to stories and exchanged a lot of glances on the way down. I hadn't even been sure I was even going to like this, but if every day is like today, four days will go by way too fast. Bane is busy securing the raft, so Doug stands beside it and helps the ladies off. Kimber has taken a lot of videos, and while she didn't fit in at first, by the time we disembark, she is definitely part of our group. I really like her, and I suppose if she ends up with Doug, he would be getting a good woman. She sat in the far back, though, while Doug and I sat right behind Bane. So, as far as I can tell, they haven't really talked all day. I allow the ladies to get out first, and Kimber goes ahead, but Patrick and Chubb wouldn't think of allowing me to get off after them, so I stand and follow Kimber off the raft. It is higher than I expect and more than a slight step to the ground. Doug doesn't seem to pay any extra special attention to Kimber although she says something too low and soft to him for me to hear. He just nods, helps her down, and turns his head to me, holding his hand out. As my hand slips into his, I remember our night in jail together, and the handcuffs, and the personal questions he asked. Maybe that was his way of making conversation, and he hadn't really been curious. I guess I don't know. Maybe I'm out of practice at figuring these things out. Or maybe I shouldn't care. It was a really nice day for a ride down the river, wasn't it? Doug says to me as I prepare to step off. I'm not very good at multitasking at the best of times, but I need to try to pay attention to what he said and form a coherent response while trying not to fall out of the raft and also trying not to pay attention to the odd feeling shooting up my arm. Maybe not odd. Maybe just right. It feels right to have my hand in his. If he feels the same way, I can't tell from his face. It was. Thank you so much for being willing to let us do this. I say, happy my voice sounds normal. I'm kind of surprised I don't fall out of the raft, but I'm sure Doug wouldn't have allowed me to anyway. I guess I should be thanking you for taking Miss Agnes's list seriously and making this a viable suggestion. I think he actually means it, and I admit I kind of pause, just looking at him. It's still daylight. We have all evening to hang out on the sandbar, eating and sitting and watching the river while the stars come out. They even have chairs set up around a campfire. Bane told me he was setting up cots in two of the tents for our seniors. I told him the rest of us would be fine sleeping on the ground. I hope that's okay. Doug says, and I shrug. 
Thank you for suggesting cots. And I'm fine on the ground. The sand feels soft anyway. Apparently, not every place we stop is going to be sandy. I thought the cots would be easier on the old folk. Hey, watch who you're calling old. Patrick says from behind me. Doug and I share a smile before my hand slips from his. Reluctantly, I admit. And I move away. Everyone's bags are in their tents. And sure enough, Agnes, Harriet, and Gertrude are in one of the tents with three cots set up. I poke my head in. Is everything okay, ladies? All three of them are glowing and look years younger than they had even yesterday. We had the best day. But you go ahead and get set up in your tent and don't worry about us. We'll be out in a few minutes and we can sit around the campfire and let someone feed us. Holler if you need anything. Looks like Bane has us babied, though. He's so dreamy, Harriet says while Gertrude and Agnes smile and nod. I want to say something about Doug being so much more dreamy than Bane, although it's really not true, I guess, if you're just looking at them and comparing them to typical accepted handsomeness standards. Hollywood handsomeness standards. Bane has all of his hair, and I think he probably works out. But maybe he just has developed those muscles from steering rafts down the river. He has a nice square jaw and a handsome smile. I suppose he's nice. But I'll be honest. While I think he would probably be a nice person to talk to, I have no desire to sit beside him and have a conversation. Meanwhile, in the back of my head, I'm trying to figure out how I can finagle my chair to end up beside Doug's. The heart is a funny thing. Regardless, I'm curious to no end about Doug. I want to talk to him, touch him, and just hang out with him. Which probably means I should figure out where he is sitting and put my chair at the other end of the sandbar. Because he's not having any kind of internal war trying to figure out how to sit beside me. Lee? Gertrude says softly. Have you really fallen for him? They've taken my silence, and probably the dreamy look on my face, as my feelings about Bane. There's one thing I definitely don't need to have happen, and that is for the ladies to find out that it's not Bane I'm thinking about. I'll see you ladies in a bit, I say, wiggling my finger and giving them a smile which makes them all narrow their eyes at me. Agnes even has her hands on her hips. I drop the flap and walk toward the other tent. Opening it up and ducking in, I see Kimber has already taken the right sleeping bag. She's opened her pack, which was placed in the corner, and is rummaging through it for something. Wow, it's nice in here. Plenty of room to stand up. It's the biggest tent I've ever been in. Just as big as the ladies' tent. Only there are two sleeping bags laid out on the floor rather than three cots. I'm guessing Doug must be sleeping with Chubb and Patrick. It's not the Hilton, but it is certainly more luxury than I was expecting. As long as it doesn't rain, I think we're gonna be good, Kimber says, pulling her phone out and zipping up her pack. There was rain in the forecast, but I guess it missed us. I grab my bag and put it on my sleeping bag, pulling my phone out. I leave the pack where it is and walk back out after checking to make sure Kimber doesn't want me to help her with anything. The ladies and I form a semicircle around the fire, facing our chairs to the river, which glows with colors ranging from deep burnt orange to pink to light blue to a deep dark velvet navy before the sun finally sinks below the horizon and the stars start popping out. The ladies are talking about things they've done when they were younger, and some things they wish they'd done but hadn't. I'm listening with half an ear while also listening to the rustle and clanging of pots and pans. I hear Doug's voice, and it sounds like he's talking to Bane. I think Chubb and Patrick are with them, and the other voice must be Bob, 
I don't look behind me to find out. Full darkness has fallen, and we've turned our chairs around to the fire before a form moves beside me, and I look over. You mind if I sit down? It's Bane, and I'm disappointed, but I still shake my head no. Doug follows Chubb and Patrick over, and the glow of the fire doesn't reveal how he feels about the seating arrangements, as he chooses a seat directly across from me. I wish he would have chosen something different, so I'm not sitting there fighting myself to not stare at him. Bob, Doug's helper, has a guitar, and after we eat, he strums and sings, and we all sing along with the songs we know. Maybe it's corny to sit around a campfire and sing songs, but our seniors just love it, especially since he's chosen songs that they seem familiar with. I have to admit, I'm impressed with Bane and his outfit. I had thought he was kind of a two-bit fly-by-night dude, but he's actually done a really good job. First, the cots for the seniors, and of course knowing the river well enough to take us down without rapids. The big tents, the food, and then the songs that I'm going to assume were especially chosen to appeal to their age group. As Kimber asks Agnes what her favorite part of the day was and films her with her phone while Agnes answers, I lean over to Bane and say, I'm impressed with how well you've handled these ladies and gentlemen and making sure that their needs are met, making sure that things are easy enough for them but not juvenile, the songs, the food, the cots. I wave my hand, trying to encompass it all. I don't want to tell him that my first impression was that this was going to be a disaster and that he was an amateur. Although that would be true, and I'm ashamed of that. I've learned a few things, even though I haven't been in business long. Pretty much every trip down the river, we run into something that's a little crazy. But I've learned that guests come first, and they like to be comfortable. He looks out at the river and then the sky and the mountains towering on the other side. I just love Idaho so much, and it's a privilege to be able to share her with other people. It's a little thing to make sure these people are comfortable and enjoy themselves. I'm impressed. Seriously. And for a moment, I wish that my attraction went in Bane's direction. But his doesn't go in mine. In fact, I kind of wonder if he'll ever get married. He seems to love the land to the point where it doesn't leave much room for a wife or a girl. He definitely needs someone woodsy and outdoorsy. I'm not even tempted to talk to him about it, though, although I suppose it's the female in me that wants him to seem happy with someone. Doug seems like a really nice guy. Bane says in a conversational tone, but his words make me jerk my head to him, wondering what in the world would make him say something like that. It doesn't sound like typical male speak. He's good at his job, I say, a non-committal answer. He seems kind of protective of you. Bane says, his words still conversational, but he has his brows lifted, almost like he's asking me a question. I think he's protective of everybody. We're his responsibility. I grimace. I'm sort of known for getting myself in trouble. Or for getting him in trouble. Maybe he's just trying to avoid that. Especially with the camera. My voice is low, pitched that way so Kimber's phone doesn't accidentally pick me up. Bane's been speaking the same way, and he glances over at Kimber something in his gaze that I can't read, before he looks back at me. I guess that could be it, he says, and then he shrugs. Kimber has finished interviewing each one of the ladies about their day, and she's recording Chubb as he talks about what he enjoyed on the first day. Tomorrow, the water's going to be a little bit rougher in some places, but it still should be a nice, easy ride. I also checked the weather, and there is no rain in sight for the rest of the week. You guys couldn't have picked a better week to come. 
Bane grins at me, but his eyes track over to Kimber, and I feel bad for him. Not only has Kimber not expressed any interest in him at all, but she's a city girl through and through. Even out here, in the middle of what feels like nowhere, she looks sophisticated and classy, while Bane looks exactly like what he is, an outdoorsy guide, who's quite capable in the woods but would stick out like a sore thumb in a boardroom. Same in the city. I see his fascination with Kimber, though. She just exudes confidence and capableness. My eyes move across the fire. I've been pretty successful at not staring at Doug, but as I'm thinking about Kimber, I look at him, expecting to see the same look of adoration on his face that's on Bane's, while he eyes her up. But as I look across, he's looking at me. Our eyes meet, and maybe I'm crazy, but it makes the night just that much sweeter to have that connection with him. Except, he doesn't look happy. Chapter 16 Doug I admit, I had to be talked into this. I didn't think it would go well. In fact, if anything, I thought it would be another big mess. But I actually had fun today. I enjoyed looking around and seeing the residents laughing and enjoying themselves. Supper was good, and there was plenty of it. And now, sitting around the fire looking at the stars, and even though it seems corny, even the singing just makes me feel like it was a really fantastic day. But there is a disquiet in my chest that I've been fighting for an hour, and I'm ready to get up and leave. The singing is stopped, and Bob puts his guitar back in its case. He is sitting beside me, and he's chatted a little about his brother and the bees that they raised together and how the honey that we had for supper tonight was from their own beehives, which explains why it was in a mason jar, and he's told me how they sell it to make money on the side, and I feel like he's hinting around about me wanting to buy some, and honestly on a regular day, I probably would have because the honey over the sausage that we had tonight was really good. Not something I would have picked out myself, but I really liked it once I tried them together. But I'm not really in the mood to talk. Not to Bob. Lee is gorgeous. Firelight becomes her. And I know she's funny and sweet and not afraid to do things that will make other people happy, and after a night in jail together, I know I enjoy spending time with her and feel like we work, and play, well together. But she's been whispering with Bane, and even though Miss Agnes hasn't really tried to do any kind of matchmaking, maybe because of her granddaughter being here, it bothers me that they seem to be in their own world with their heads bent toward each other. And she's laughing and he is grinning and seems unable to take his eyes off her. Normally, I'm not the jealous type. In fact, if looking at them hadn't made me so angry, I wouldn't have termed this disquiet jealousy. That has to be what it is, because there's no reason to be angry, and if I didn't care about her talking to Bane, I shouldn't care. Finally, I decide that a short walk would be a good idea, and I stand abruptly. Chubb is in the middle of a story and no one really notices when I walk off. Just so no one wonders, I head toward the job Johnny that was set up downriver on the sandbar. I don't intend to go far. I'm not a walk-in-the-dark kind of guy, especially in the middle of the wilderness. But I do need to get away. I walk out of the firelight and around the circle, Chubb's voice fading as he wraps up his story and the group laughs. Part of me loves the group atmosphere and being outdoors, and I'm surprised at that, since this isn't the kind of guy I am. I just wish it weren't tempered by this irritation and the desire to be away from Lee and Bane. I have three more days of this. 
Three more days I think I would enjoy if I didn't have to watch them together. I wasn't going to go far, and I end up walking farther down the sandbar. It's not extremely wide, but it's long, and I'm probably 50 yards away from the fire before I stop, putting my hands in my pockets and looking up at the night sky. I am not interested in romance. I am happy alone. These feelings are unwelcome as well as unexpected. The moon is pretty on the water as the river flows lazily by. I think part of the reason it's going to take us so long to go down is not because we're going so far, but because the water goes so slowly. It's perfect for our group. The little bit I talked to Bane, he'd said that this is where he takes families with young children in groups like that. I don't think he gets a lot of seniors, because I don't think there are a lot of seniors who hear whitewater rafting and feel like that's something they want to do. Miss Agnes is truly one of a kind, and the fact that she can take others along with her just shows what a magnetic personality she has. Lee probably has something to do with that, too. If I ever ended up in the assisted living facility, I would want to have someone like Lee as activities director. She definitely makes life fun. It's been a good day. Her voice comes from beside me, and I manage to keep from jerking, but just barely. I hadn't been expecting her to follow me. She and Bane were pretty into each other. But there is a part of me that's happy that she did. It eases some of the burning in my chest. I turn toward her. It was. She's pretty in the moonlight. She's pretty anywhere, and there I go. One more reason why I shouldn't be talking to her. I'm her boss. Although, this isn't exactly a work thing. This is supposed to be fun. For the seniors and for us. We stand there for a little bit. I'm looking back at the water. I don't know what she's looking at. I tell myself... I don't care. I don't want to care as much as I do. It hurts to see her laughing with someone else, and that tells me I'm definitely caring way too much. More than I should. More than I have a right to. Is something wrong? She asks, and she sounds hesitant. I don't know what that means. I feel like I'm too old to play games. Or maybe I just don't want to anymore. Maybe once upon a time, I would have been sly about my answer and played my cards close to the vest. Or maybe because I feel Lee is worth it. I turn to her, managing to keep my hands in my pockets, even though I want to cross my arms over my chest. Like a defense. So maybe Miss Agnes doesn't have to play matchmaker between you and Bane? I ask and my words do not sound casual. I wish they did. Her mouth drops open, and she stares at me. I get the feeling that maybe I've overreacted. I just said one sentence, so I'm not thinking I overreacted with her. But maybe this burning in my chest is over a casual conversation, and it wasn't a whispered affair like I'm thinking. She does not have to play matchmaker between Bane and me. I mean, she can try all she wants to, but she will be unsuccessful. I notice she doesn't use contractions, and she kind of emphasizes her words. My skin breaks out in a sweat, and my stomach turns over. She's standing close enough that I catch her scent. Something light that makes me want to smile but I don't. Why? I ask, and it feels like a dumb question, but maybe I need to know. Because I'm not interested in Bane, she says matter-of-factly. I see. But I saw you and Kimber chatting by the bus. Since Melissa canceled, maybe Miss Agnes can set you two up. I borrow her words. She can try, but she will not be successful. Lee's eyes flash in the moonlight, 
and maybe your lips tug up just a little. Why? She asks, and now my lips tug up, amused that our conversation is mirroring each other's words. Because I'm not interested in Kimber, I say, and now we're facing each other, our grins goofy, our breath mingling. I'm not the kind of person to have a goofy grin, but I can't wipe it off my face. I guess I should have known that Lee wouldn't let it go at that. And who are you interested in? She asks, her voice barely a whisper with just a little tilt of insecurity in it. I didn't think I'd ever be interested in anyone again, I say, and it's not the answer that I should say. I know it is the words come out of my mouth, so I don't stop. I suppose you can imagine my surprise as, over the last few weeks, something's been happening that makes me feel like maybe that's not true anymore. You didn't answer my question, she says, smiling. I'm interested in you, Lee. It feels dangerous to put that out there. Dangerous because she could laugh at me. Dangerous because she might not feel the same. Dangerous because she just might be looking for a compliment. She might not be serious. Serious like I am. It also feels dangerous because I'm her boss. And this is something that could become a major problem for both of our jobs. It could hurt the facility, the one we're trying to save. Neither one of us wants that. Maybe the words would have been better left unsaid. But... They're out there now. I hear her swallow. Her eyes leave mine for a second, which scares me. Because it feels like maybe she's gathering the nerve to tell me that she doesn't feel the same. But then, why is she standing so close? Why is she grinning at me? And why did she follow me? I guess that makes it okay for me to say I'm interested in you too, Doug. She says her eyes floating back to mine. But the knowledge of everything that could go wrong is right there in her gaze and probably mirrored in mine. I'm happy to hear it, and it's darn inconvenient, too, I say, attempting levity. I succeed, because she laughs. I think you just called me an inconvenience. Not you. You might blow in like a hurricane, but I'll never think it's an inconvenience. Not even when I rearrange the front lawn or use all the aluminum foil and plastic wrap in the kitchen? I would not have wanted you to use one piece more. That gown was quite revealing, and I have to say, if there had been more of it, I would have been disappointed. I'll show you my big toe any time you want me to she says with a glint in her eye. I'm sorry to break it to you, but I saw more than your big toe. I grin, and I'm only partially teasing here. There was a lot of leg showing, and some bare shoulders, and I'm pretty sure she wasn't wearing any undergarments, but I didn't exactly see what I'm insinuating I did. A gentleman would have looked away, she says, and her voice sounds a little sultry. I'm tempted to say I'm no gentleman, but I think that line has already been used. I do have an older sister. Plus, I think I am a gentleman. That sounds boring, I say instead. Maybe a gentleman would have joined you. I don't think a tux would turn out as well in aluminum foil and plastic wrap as what a dress does. I can't disagree with that and I'm definitely not interested in wearing a dress. We might as well get that straight right now, since I think that maybe this might be going a little further than just friends. At least, that's what I'm feeling. Of course, maybe I shouldn't get the card ahead of the horse. I do believe she said she is attracted to me, but that's all we've established. A relationship takes a lot more than just attraction. She might not be interested in going there any more than what I was. Funny, but I think my mind has changed. 
So is that why you came over here? Because you thought that I was talking to Bane because I liked him? I should have known she would cut to the point eventually, and I would have to answer the hard question. I could dodge it, or I could ask her a question in return, but I figure honesty is the best policy. Yeah, that's why. It didn't sit very well with me, because... because I wanted to be the one talking to you. That's a little scary, Doug. Am I not allowed to talk to anyone else? Maybe I said that badly. I don't want you to whisper sweet nothings in the moonlight with anyone else. I would not say that I'm a sweet nothings in the moonlight kind of girl. I've managed to live a lot of years without ever doing moonlight romance, but... She looks up at the sky, at the stars that are shining thick and bright. And then she looks back at me. But I think I've been missing out. Her lips turn up. And not just because the stars are beautiful. I think... I think in order for the sweet nothings in the moonlight to work, I need the right man. I know what she's saying. It's pretty obvious, and it's funny, but I echo her sentiments. A part of me is tempted to joke and diffuse the tension in the air, because it makes me uncomfortable. I don't like to do emotion and romance or bear my heart to people. I suppose it's weird that I want to joke, because I'm not exactly a joking kind of guy either. Right now, laughing seems a little easier than being serious. But I think Lee deserves a little romance, and for some reason she seems to think I can give it to her. Isn't it funny what a man will do when he doesn't want to disappoint a woman? I step closer and put my hand on her cheek, sliding my fingers around her neck. Her skin is soft, and I want to take another step until we're touching. But that might be moving a little too fast for romance. Maybe for you, I finally say. For me, I need the stars and the moon reflecting on the water. I glance at the river, which is almost as pretty as the sky it reflects. And the right woman. I'm not great at saying all the pretty words but those seem to make her happy, and they came from my heart, which is the best I can do. She smiles, and she's looking up at me, literal stars in her eyes, and I run my thumb over her cheek and wish that I were better at saying what's in my heart. Maybe that's something I should practice, because if things work out the way I'm hoping they do, if Lee wants romance, I'm going to be the one that needs to give it to her. I want to give her everything she wants. A nagging voice reminds me that I'm the boss and she works under me, and this could end up being a huge mess, but I don't want to hear it. We can stand under the stars and look into each other's eyes and admit that we're attracted to each other, and we can enjoy the next three days without having to think about what's going to happen when we get back. Right? I ask. And while a small cloud seems to pinch her face, it clears, and she nods. Good idea, she says, and her smile only seems a little forced. Let's enjoy the next three days. I notice she doesn't say anything about romance or stars or even spending the next three days with me. But I let it go, because she's standing in front of me, and my hand is touching her skin, and she's allowing it. And that shows me, rather than tells me, that she's okay with us. That has to be enough for now. Chapter 17 Lee The next day down the river is just as good as the first. We all have the same seats we had the day before. I guess there's just some kind of human nature where we all want to sit where we were. Which means I sit across from Doug, and we exchange smiles all day. I had hoped he was going to kiss me last night, which I suppose if I really wanted a kiss, I should have just told him so. 
or asked if I could kiss him. I guess that's the modern thing to do, isn't it? Maybe there's just a part of me that wants to be chased a little, or just wants to be sure that he really wants me and make him work a little to have me. Maybe that's human nature too, or female nature. Whatever, the anticipation is nice as well, because even though Doug surprised me by saying anything to me about attraction, which I'm sure made him uncomfortable considering he's my boss, I still think he's going to kiss me anyway. Here's hoping. Breakfast was cooked over an open fire, eggs and bacon and more of the honey that Bob has told everyone he and his brother got from their own hives and that they sell. I doubt any of the residents are going to purchase any, but I think I will. It's good on sausage, but I think it might even be better on cheese, and we could have it for girls' night. Claire and my mom love cheese as much as I do, and I'm sure they'd be down for trying it with honey. So not only will I have some great memories to take home with me, but some possible new food combinations that I'm really looking forward to. Regardless, it's a breakfast that sticks to your ribs, and the sandwich at lunch feels sufficient. However, by the time three in the afternoon rolls around, I'm getting hungry, and I'm also getting worried, because Bane is on his phone. I think I heard him say something about needing firewood. He's facing the front, so I can't really hear exactly what all he's saying. The water, as it has been all day, is calm, and when he gets off his phone, he shoves it in his pocket and turns around and faces us. I glance at Doug and see the concern I'm feeling mirrored on his face. Everyone stops talking as Bane says. All right. There's an unspoken rule on the river that says if you get to a sandbar and there's wood there, you can use it, and you're welcome to it but you know that you replace it. Bane's lips twist. Same goes for anything else that's sitting there. Use it, but replace it. He blows a breath out, looking frustrated but not unduly agitated. I'm saying all that to say we had firewood cut, stacked, and ready to start supper, and we also had a cooler with food in it for tonight sitting there. Bob had to go home and do some chores, so he dropped the stuff off early this morning after he purchased it and ran home. Bane actually smiles a bit. I think someone had their lunch on us, and then they didn't replace everything. I can't believe he's not more upset. Which isn't a terrible catastrophe, but it does mean that Bob is not going to have things ready when we get there. He's going to have to go back to town and grab some supplies for our meal. When we get there, I'll be able to chop firewood. And maybe you... Bane looks at Doug. ...can help people off the raft and then tie it up. He wrinkles his nose for a minute, and I get why he's not more agitated. He's the kind of guy who learned to depend on himself. I like that about him, and realize that even though he and Doug look quite different... They have that in common. Bane glances at me, and I pull my attention away from Doug. Maybe you can give him a hand, Lee. This stop is a little tricky, and I use dual ropes. I'll show you where the stakes are to secure it before I grab the hatchet and chop some wood. I nod. I'm fine with helping. I never learned how to tie a knot or anything, and can't do anything fancy but I think I can keep our raft from floating away. At least, I hope so. I glance over at Doug, who looks serious and responsible. I would trust him with the raft, and I would definitely trust him with helping the folks off. No one in the back seems upset, and voices are murmuring again as Bane looks at Doug and me and says in a softer voice, This is frustrating because I try so hard to have everything set up. Don't worry about it. It's out of your control. Doug says, and I know he means it. He's not the slightest bit upset about the change in plans. I can't imagine anyone on the raft is either. 
I say. I don't think anyone here is going to be upset if dinner is a few hours late or whatever it's going to be. You've got to feed us sometime, but we're all having a great time. Don't let this get you down. Patrick speaks up from the very back of the raft. I glance around and everyone's nodding. I think Bane feels better, although I understand his frustration. Everyone wants to do a good job, and I admire someone who cares about their work and about the service they're providing. After all, we did pay to have a meal on time. Of course, he's losing the money because he has to buy it twice. Still, despite my growling stomach, it's a lazy sunny afternoon with perfect temps, and I'm a little disappointed when Bane starts guiding the raft over to the edge of the river. I see the sandbar ahead, except this is a little different than yesterday, and it looks like it's pretty rocky. We hit the bottom, and Bane points to two stakes at the top of a small rise a good ways away from the tents and fire. Once everyone is out, you can pull it up off the sandbar, onto the river rock, and secure the ropes over there. He looks at Doug and me. Do you think you guys can handle that? Doug says, Of course, we'll be fine. Bane nods. He points to a rickety stand at the bottom of the rise that has a jar and a box on it. Bob left a jar of honey and some crackers. I'm sorry that's not fancy hors d'oeuvres, but they'll have to do for now. He looks back over the boat, and apparently he likes what he sees, because he grins and shrugs. He hands the ropes that are attached to the front of the raft to Doug and me. I'll be back with some firewood. Twenty minutes, tops. He says as he jumps out of the raft and strides up the gravel bar. It feels a little weird to be in the middle of nowhere, having no idea where I am or how to get out of here other than to continue to float down the river as our guide strides away. This is not something I'm going to get worried about, though. Doug doesn't seem upset either, although he does watch Bane leave a little longer than maybe he might have under different circumstances, and I bet he's feeling the same thing. We look at each other, and I don't know about him, but just seeing him beside me bolsters my confidence. I'll get out, and I'll help everyone out of the raft, if you work from inside, he says, and I nod. It's not a big deal to get everyone out although it takes time, since they're older and slower. But both Doug and I are used to working with seniors, and neither one of us are impatient or rush them. Finally, everyone's out of the boat but me, and Doug holds out his hand. Even though I'm quite capable of getting out of the boat by myself, I take it and step over the edge, the rope coiled in my other hand. Somehow, I've gotten it twisted around my foot, and I laugh a little as I step down and then untwist myself. I'm warning you, ropes are not my thing. Me either, he says, and I think he's just agreeing with me to make me feel better. I feel compelled to tell him. No, I mean sometimes I have trouble getting all wrapped up in them. I get them tangled and somehow end up in a knot that I didn't mean to create. You don't think you're surprising me, do you? He says, and I hear the humor in his voice, which is fun and a little surprising. I laugh. We pull the raft out of the water, and a little shock goes through me as we head toward the stakes together, his hand slipping into mine. I can't help it. My head turns, and he's looking down at me. His lips are still tilted, but his brows are raised like he's asking if it's okay. Of course. I squeeze his hand because he didn't use words. Neither do I. He squeezes back, and I kind of like that we have this nonverbal communication thing going. Not that I always want to speak without words, because words are good. But it's just fun sometimes to understand someone and know what they're thinking without them saying it. We get to the top, having unwound the ropes while we were walking up, and again, somehow I get us twisted in them. 
I laugh, and he does too, taking his rope and pulling it behind my back, using his other hand to get a hold of it. I freeze, not because he's touching me, which I like, but because it almost feels like he's going to hug me. That's what I think is going on before I realize he's untangling my rope from his. Maybe he looks at me because I'm stiff, or maybe he realizes that we are very close to an embrace, and he stops, both arms around me, his rope behind me. You weren't kidding about the ropes, were you? He murmurs, and it sounds like an endearment. Maybe I did that on purpose. I murmur right back, although I did no such thing. I should have thought of that myself, he says. I'm glad you're not upset that I'm giving you a little push, I say. His brows go up. Upset? I shrug. I thought yesterday you were going to kiss me. I kind of had my heart set on it today. And then, despite all my wonderful thoughts about getting chased and caught, I'm the one who steps closer and puts my hand on his waist. Hey, you two, smile for the camera. Kimber calls up to us. I admit I'm too old to get lost in anyone's eyes, but I don't know what other excuse I can use for the fact that I totally forgot there's anyone else walking on the planet besides Doug and me. My head turns toward the sound of her voice. She has her phone up, either taking a video or a picture, and maybe I would have smiled, but the unexpected movement knocks me off balance since we're not exactly standing on even ground. Normally, that would have been okay, but somehow, I'd gotten the rope wrapped around my foot, and when I swing my arm to steady myself, the rope tightens. I fall in to Doug, and we both end up falling and rolling down the hill. I think we could have stopped ourselves if we wanted to, but we were both laughing too hard. Also, he has his arms around me. I think he's protecting me from getting hurt, and I don't think either one of us really wants to let go of each other. We should have, though, because the rickety stand at the bottom of the hill that held the honey and crackers was right in our direct path. I don't see it until we hit it. Our stop is rather abrupt and knocks the leg right out from underneath the stand. Only one leg, though, so the stand tilts but doesn't crash down on us, which is nice. However, it does knock the honey down, which falls in a steady stream right on my forehead until Doug moves and puts his own head under the stream to protect me. At least, that's what I assume he's doing, and it works for about two seconds until the honey slides around his neck and starts dripping on mine. I hear commotion in the background, but I'm not listening, because Doug whispers, I thought I heard you say you wanted me to kiss you. I nod. I did say that, and I did want him to kiss me. I do. I don't have to say anything more, because he lowers his head. Chapter 18 Doug I didn't have to end up at the bottom of the hill, wrapped in rope, dripping in honey, lying on top of Lee, but sometimes I can't resist what life throws at me. Is it too terrible if I admit that I just didn't want to? I think, somewhere in the conversation that I had with Bob last night, he mentioned honey was good for the skin. I hadn't really cared at the time, and I still don't, but it might be something Lee is interested in. I'll talk to her about it later, because she really threw me for a loop when she told me that she wanted me to kiss her. Maybe it had something to do with me not kissing her, because don't we always want what we don't have? I thought I was being noble when I had been more interested in giving her romance than in doing what I wanted with her. Kissing was pretty close to the top of that list. I guess I hadn't pictured this happening, but I'm going with it.
especially since even though the rope has caught one of my hands and pinned it against my side, the other managed to escape being bound, and I'm able to hold most of my weight on my elbow, so I'm not squishing her. I lower my head, and she's looking at me with her eyes half-closed, a little smile perched on her lips, and her fingers rubbing over my ribs as far as they can reach with the rope tying them down. I touch her lips to mine, and I vaguely realize that the honey has stopped dripping, and people are cheering. It doesn't seem to make a difference to Lee, as a little puff of air escapes her lips, and she presses closer, kissing me back, and all the background noise fades away. And I wish my hands were free, because I want to run my fingers through her hair and touch her, although it might prove sticky. I don't care. She moves under me, and the last thing, the very last thing I want to do is stop. But I do because I vaguely realize that someone is talking right above us. I lift my head. Her eyes are closed, and the smile that was perched on her lips is settled there, and she opens her eyes and looks dreamily at me. It's the kind of look a man doesn't forget. I'm hoping I'm looking at her in some way that stirs her too the way that look on her face moves me. I want to wake up to that look, and go to bed with that look, and spend days with that look and with the woman wearing it. I realize, even as I'm thinking those things, that this must be what love feels like. Even though I have heard, and I agree, that love is more doing than feeling, this must be the feeling that prompts the doing. Are you two going to lie there all night, or are you going to get up so we can fix the stand? Chubb says from above me. I figured it must be either him or Patrick speaking, because I don't think any of the ladies would have interrupted us. They wouldn't want to kill a budding romance before it has time to bloom, but the guys are probably hungry. Sorry about the honey. I say, low enough that only Lee can hear me but I'm not sorry about anything else. As apologies go, that's not the best one I've ever given, but it makes the woman in my arms smile, and that's really all I care about. I'm not even sorry about the honey, she whispers. It makes me want to kiss her again. I told Bob last night I would buy some from him. I think I'd better get a gallon if the lady likes it. Her eyes look a little wicked as they glint at me, and I think she might be thinking along the same lines of the things that I'm thinking. But our relationship definitely isn't ready to go there yet. It might not ever be ready. That snaps away the rest of the haze in my brain, and I take my free arm and start working on the ropes. It takes us a little while to get unstrung, and I have to admit the honey was fun while I was kissing Lee, but now... Trying to work and be all sticky is definitely not my thing. I free her, and I walk back up the incline with both ropes while she goes to the river to wash up. Not long after that, Bane comes out of the woods with firewood. It's another two hours before we finally eat. Unlike this morning, where everybody climbed in the boat and sat in the same seats they had yesterday, I'm paying attention tonight and when Lee sits down, I grab the chair beside her. There isn't going to be any of this sitting beside someone else while I watch her over the fire and my imagination goes wild over what she's saying to the dude beside her. I don't care if she talks to Bane or anyone. Not at all. She can talk to anyone she wants to, of course. But if she wants to whisper sweet nothings, I want her to know I'm available. Chapter 19 Lee We arrive safely back at Cherry Tree, right on time, with big smiles and hearts full of whatever it is that hearts are full of when everyone has had a great time. Agnes has crossed yet another thing off her bucket list. I think she actually has forgotten about her bucket list. Ever since she saw Doug kiss me, tied up, with the honey and everything, I haven't heard another word about bucket lists 
or about fake boyfriends either. It makes me feel like maybe her whole point of the bucket list was to get Doug and me together. I'm not really sure if we are together. I mean, I guess we are, but we haven't talked about what that means. Maybe he doesn't know, since neither of us are even sure we'll have a job in a few weeks. We got home late last night from the rafting trip, and while he did kiss me before I left, we didn't talk. Today has been kind of... busy. While we were gone, the new floor cleaner I'd ordered had arrived, and while Cherry Tree has a cleaning service, I wanted to try this out myself. What I miss when I skim through the directions... I admit, I don't really read the directions. It's floor cleaner. How hard can it be? Is that it is super concentrated. I don't have time to try it until after supper. I have the entire hallway scrubbed before Agnes starts walking toward me and falls. I run to help her. Thankfully, she's not hurt, but only make it two steps before I fall, too. The floor is so slippery, it is impossible to stand on. Miss Agnes does an army crawl better than I do, and she has herself off the scrubbed part of the floor and is standing well before I get there. You'd better go back the other direction and keep people off this. I'll manage this side. Agnes has figured out the situation and is reacting with determination and control as usual. I am panicking. She could have been hurt. And, first and foremost, I don't want to see anyone hurt, but I also don't want to bring any bad attention to our facility. It might close, but I don't want it to be my fault if it does. I don't want to do that to Doug. All the things I've done have been with the residents in mind. There hasn't been anything like this where the danger was inside the facility. At least, I see a big difference, and it makes my heart pound painfully. Agnes is right. I need to control my panic, get back down to the other end, and stop anyone from walking on the floor. I'll figure out how to fix it after I'm sure no one is going to get hurt. I nod to Agnes and lift my hand before spinning on the floor. It's slicker than ice and I could have a lot of fun on it before I start my army crawl back. What are you doing? Doug asks, coming around the corner, his footsteps hesitating for a fraction of a second before he speeds up. No! I shout, unable to form the words that I need as he half jogs out onto the floor and falls immediately. I quit trying to army crawl and do an army slide instead which is much faster, as he's gingerly trying to sit up. Don't, I say, thinking that if he has a neck injury, he might make it worse. He ignores my words, giving me a raised brow look before he rolls toward me, stopping when we meet. I'm so sorry, I say, my hands going to his neck and head. Not that I think I'm going to fix anything, but I have this need to make sure he's okay even though I know he's going to be angry with me. I feel like I deserve it. Are you okay? I ask, unable to keep the fear and concern out of my voice. Agnes got up much faster than he did, but she was going a lot slower and didn't take the hit to the head he did. He's rolled over and is facing me, lying beside me on the floor. His hand comes up to my face and he strokes over it gently. Are you okay? He asks, emphasizing the you like he wants me to know that I'm important to him. The pain in my heart doesn't go away, but it feels sweet now. I nod against his hand. My words are backed up in my throat. He leans closer. I've thought about this all day. That I'm your boss and I can't touch you while we're working and I have to stay professional and keep my distance. But I think I'm going to resign because the only way I could figure I could keep from touching you all day was to avoid you. 
His eyes have caught on mine, and I can't look away. Not that I want to. I don't want to spend my days avoiding you. It's after five, I finally managed to say. It's not the most important thing in my mind, but it's funny how when a person has trouble getting words out, so many times the unimportant ones are the ones that finally make it into the air. Or maybe those were the most important ones, since his head lowers and he smiles. I guess we're off the clock. He whispers. Neither one of us are hourly employees, but I know exactly what he means and I nod, leaning towards him and putting my hand on his waist. I would never say Cherry Tree is a romantic facility, but I definitely feel romance as Doug kisses me, sweetly and gently, like he is truly concerned that I might be hurt. I already suspect that I am in love with the man, but his care and concern for me stirs up all the strong feelings I haven't wanted to feel, but suddenly now feel safe. If he cares about my physical safety and welfare, he will care about my emotional welfare too, right? It feels like logic that makes sense, not that I think it in so many words as his lips move over mine. I'm not really thinking about anything, including the floor or our position on it or that anyone might, and probably will, come by. The thinking part of my brain totally shuts down when Doug kisses me. This is new. It's fun, too, although I'm definitely too old to allow a man to have this effect on me. He finally lifts his head, not by much, and says, I have never lain on the floor in my workplace and kissed anyone. That's not exactly what makes me feel like I love you, but it makes me feel like I should say so. His eyes soften as they search over my face. I love you. His words shimmer in the air, falling on my ears like soft summer night sounds, making me want to cuddle closer and kiss him again. My hand tightens on his waist, and I'm only a little scared when I say, I love you, too. He smiles, satisfied and confident, and he lowers his head again. You two seem to have a real problem with lying around kissing each other. You know, when I was a young man, we married the girl before we did that. Chubb's voice breaks us apart before our lips touch again. We still share smiles, which relieves me, since I wasn't sure if having someone see us, here, at Cherry Tree, would upset Doug. I'm going to email my resignation tonight before I go home. No, I say, and these are the words that were more important than the words that I had said earlier. If anyone resigns, it's going to be me. He doesn't get to answer me, because I just realized that Chubb might walk out on the floor. The thought sends sheer panic through me. I don't want anyone to get hurt because of my stupidity. I push myself up. Don't come any closer, I say, and it sounds like I'm yelling. Maybe I am. Chubb, flanked by all of the other residents, puts a hand up. Agnes already told us about the floor. She has us all on group text. He smirks, and the thought hits me that he must have been quite a heartbreaker when he was younger. She also told us about you two, and we all figured we'd just come out and see that one for ourselves. I might have taken a picture and put it on Facebook. Agnes says slyly. Doug and I exchanged horrified glances. That could get us both fired. I finally notice I hear the almost constant chiming of notifications. People love it! Agnes exclaims, pulling her phone up and clicking on it. Listen to this, she says. That is so romantic and sweet. My facility is boring and nothing fun ever happens other than the occasional game of bingo and afternoon movie with sugar-free jello to munch on rather than popcorn. 
Agnes pauses. I'm telling her we have room here. Her fingers fly over her phone as Chubb says, Send me her pic and her bio. If Doug here can catch himself a woman, I ought to be able to, too. Doug and I both know that we might not be here to see it, since we're still likely to get fired if the higher-ups find out about this. But our looks have lost some of the horror, which has been replaced by eager hope. I don't want to make you a spectacle, he whispers. But I do want to provide plenty of romance and photo opportunities for our residents. His lips touch mine, so I don't say that I agree. I just show him. Chapter 20 Doug I love the town of good grief, but as a man who wants to take a woman on a date, it really doesn't provide much. So, Sunday, we go to church together and I sit with my arm around her. We cook lunch together. I've never enjoyed cooking, just something I had to do. But it's unbelievably fun when you're doing it with someone else. Or maybe it's just Lee. After lunch, we go to the fire hall and hang out at the craft fair. I'm not the slightest bit interested in crafting. Lee admits she isn't either. But it's enough for me to be with her. I think she feels the same way about me. I like it. We've spent a lot of time together just talking about not much of anything and lots of some things. She told me about her first marriage, and I talked about mine. I guess she must have known that I have kids, because when I tell her about them, she isn't surprised or upset. I'll have them later this summer, I say, wondering where I'll be, if Cherry Tree will close, and if Lee will find a job somewhere else. Maybe we could take them whitewater rafting, Lee says, and I want to hug her right there. My kids really aren't the whitewater rafting type of kids. But what kid doesn't like a little adventure? I grunt. Lee notices immediately and turns from the lamps made out of moose antlers, looking at me with questions in her eyes. What's the matter? She asks. You don't want me to hang out with you and your kids? I drop her hand and put my arm around her, pulling her close even though I see her mother looking at us across the hall. I smile at Mrs. Harding, because I want her to like me, but I'm not going to let her intimidate me into not being affectionate with Lee. I've never been a psychologist, but I feel like Lee is kind of starved for affection. She has lots of friendships, and the ladies at Cherry Tree love her, but I think her husband leaving her left her just as scarred as I am. Sure. Maybe she didn't lose her kids, too. But I understand how you feel like a loser when someone rejects you. I kiss the top of her head. It makes me really happy that you want to do things with my kids and me. And I hope we can. I was just thinking that I'm not sure I would have found whitewater rafting fun at that age. So you'd rather do something else? She asks, and I kind of hate that she still seems like she's not sure if I really want her or not. No, I, I think they'll enjoy it, even if they're not really thrilled about it to begin with. Oh, I see, she says, but I don't think she does. Why don't we see if Bain has any unbooked days later this summer and see if he's interested in guiding you and me and my three kids through the beautiful Idaho wilderness? Or we could just float down the snake, Lee says, and I think she sounds hopeful. You mean you're not interested in a wilderness adventure? She raises her brows. I try not to laugh. Are we really finding out that I'm actually more of an adventurer than you? I tried to tell you it was always the ladies. I just went along with it. Her voice doesn't raise, but she does put more emphasis in her words. I grin. After spending so much time with Miss Agnes, I know Lee is right on about her friends and her. I'm not sure I believe that. I say, just to tease her. 
After all, you get pretty wild around ropes and honey. We share a smile, one of those that lovers everywhere share. Gooey and sappy and all that mushy stuff that I didn't think I was capable of. But here I am at my age, no less, making googly eyes at the woman who exasperates me, frustrates me, and pushes me, while somehow managing to make me feel more loved than I ever have in my life before. Do I frustrate you? I ask. She grunts. To no end, she says, with more emphasis than I feel is strictly necessary. Exasperate you? Yes. Push you out of your comfort zone. I'm here at a craft show, aren't I? She says, and I see the smirk she's trying to hide. That's supposed to be my line. Do I make you feel loved? I ask softer, because I really care about her answer. Not to mention, it's not really a manly question. You're here at a craft show, aren't you? She answers, stroking a bit of lace on a doll that I think is made out of dried potatoes. When Lee glances at my face, she must see that I'm not really satisfied with that answer. More than anyone ever has, she says softly, and maybe a little shyly, which makes me feel like it's the honest-to-goodness truth. We are near one of the side door exits, and I take her hand, pulling her out. It's not terribly busy in the hall, but I don't really think anyone notices that we've left. I did see her sister, Claire, across the hall, but she was with Trey, and they had two kids and two dogs with them, and I don't think they're noticing anyone but themselves. What? Lee asks as the door closes behind us, and I turn her to face me. I wanted to say something to you, and I wanted some privacy. Oh? She looks a little scared. I feel that way. I don't usually do things spur of the moment like this. All my life, I've heard that love makes a man do crazy things. I take a breath. Forget butterflies, I feel like I have several bald eagles in my stomach. I guess I understand a little better now, because I'm about to do something I never thought I would. Her brows lift at this, and she definitely looks more interested than scared. I don't know what's going to happen at work or with our jobs, and I'm tired of wondering if what you and I have is going to last beyond tomorrow. Now her eyes have widened and she's back to looking scared. Marry me, Lee. That way whatever happens, we face it together. We do it together. We work it out together. I don't want to live my life any other way. There. I said it. If things don't work out between us, at least I won't be kicking myself for the rest of my life for not taking the chance that I had and doing everything I could to keep the woman I love. Are you sure? I thought I annoyed you. Just say yes. Maybe it's the nerves, but I smile. She returns it. Yes. She says simply. We can work everything else out. As long as we're committed to each other, we'll figure out a way to make the rest of our lives work. That's exactly how I feel, and exactly what I would have said if she hadn't beaten me to it. Lee and I are not alike, not even a little. But I think we agree on this, that a commitment is just that, a commitment. I kiss her then, and we never do make it back in to see the rest of the craft show. The next morning, I admit, I walk into work with a goofy grin on my face. I'm early, as I always am, and Lee's car isn't in the parking lot yet. I'm no closer to figuring out how to save Cherry Tree, and I feel like I'm letting Agnes and Harriet and all the folks in the facility down, since they'll have to move out of good grief when it closes. I left my work phone on my desk, charging, and I take a second to look when I see that there are 52 messages. That seems a little odd. Maybe there would be more, but I think my voice mailbox is full. 
I also noticed there are a bunch of emails. After I listen to the first three messages, I'm smiling. I don't listen to more than five before I get up from my desk and walk out into the hall. Miss Agnes is an early riser, and I'm pretty sure she's up. I bet she knows exactly what is going on. I don't go far. All ten residents are in the common room right down the hall from my office. They're all waiting for me to appear, apparently, with Miss Agnes standing in the doorway, her eagle eyes watching my every move. Well? She says. I wish I could mess with her, tease her a little, act like I have no idea what she's waiting on me for. But I can't. I have to smile. I can't believe you're exploiting my relationship with Miss Lee. I say instead, which isn't exactly what she's done, but it's close. I'm not above using every weapon at my disposal to get my way, she says, her stern expression easing. I know she's kidding, just as she knows I am. I see. Does Lee know? I didn't tell her any more than what I've told you. Which is nothing, I supply in case she's forgotten. Exactly right, she says, and I don't think this woman has ever forgotten anything in her life before. My personal cell rings and I pull it up. It's Lee, I say for the benefit of the people staring at me. Every single one of them smile, and I feel, even though most of them are sitting down, like they all move closer. Hello? I say, trying not to sound like I'm ecstatically happy. Have you been on any social media this morning? Lee asks breathlessly. No, I say honestly. We are viral. Oh? I try to sound innocent. Yes, the coverings, the prom dresses, the hole in the front yard, even the romance novelist mix up with what's her name and our whitewater rafting trip. The honey, the ropes. Hey, don't go saying anything against the honey and ropes. I thought I'd bring some of those along on our honeymoon. I can't keep from grinning because Lee has gone from breathless excitement to stunned silence. Then she laughs. You know. I didn't know what caused it, other than Miss Agnes had something to do with it. Caused what? She asks, humor still lacing her voice. I think she thinks I'm kidding about the honey and ropes. No way. Caused me to have over 50 phone messages and more emails from people asking to move into Cherry Tree. Apparently, they think not only are we the hippest senior living facility in the West, but love is apparently, in the air. Or maybe I should say, on the ground. Because the messages I listened to specifically mentioned us on the ground and you looking at me with stars in your eyes. It's you looking at me that way! She exclaims, with more than a little exasperated humor in her voice. I love that I've found a woman who will take my teasing. Funny, because I didn't even realize I wanted that. So, I say, looking at Miss Agnes, who looks very pleased with herself, Miss Agnes and her granddaughter have made more work for us today. When you get in, we have a lot of contacts to chat with and some applications to process. We also have some tours to give. Oh, we can help you with that, Chubb says. Miss Agnes nods. We're very helpful. Lee is such a great example of that. Maybe you should just let us completely handle the tours. We can tell them what life is really like here. Oh, I say. And what is it really like? Living in a hurricane, Miss Agnes says. I think she winks at me. Are you having second thoughts about me? Lee asks in my ear. I laugh. No way. They're confirming everything I already knew and making me want you more. I'll be right in, she says. I can't wait. 
Epilogue Bane As a tour guide, it's funny the way you bond with people when they're out in the wilderness, away from their normal lives, experiencing a bit of danger and discomfort. People you barely know invite you to their wedding. I have to admit, having Doug and Lee and the seniors at their living center on a tour with me was a lot of fun. I wouldn't have guessed older folks could be so interesting, but it was one of my best trips ever. Of course, Doug and Lee did stuff with honey that I'd never even thought of, so there's that, too. But I guess, most of all, there was Kimber. She and I were about as different as two people could be. Me, being raised in the backwoods, never even went to an actual store until I was in my teens. I was homeschooled in the winter with actual book learning, but most of the rest of the year, my parents taught me to live off the land and be content with very little. Kimber is pure city sophistication. Why are we always attracted to people who are as different from us as space rocks are from pudding? She's at the wedding, too. As honored as I was to be invited to Doug and Lee's nuptials, I'm not sure I would have come except I was hoping to see Kimber again. Not that anything will happen between us. Even I, as backwoods as I am, know that. I've been in society enough to know that a lot of the way I was raised is considered strange, at the very best, and child abuse at worst. They can think what they want. I suppose, until they've experienced it, they don't really know what they're looking down on. And honestly, I love that I don't need stuff and people's approval in order to feel happy and satisfied in my life. Still, I am moved in some odd way by Kimber, and since I probably will never see her again after today, I think I might ask her to dance. I don't really know how to dance, but one thing about the way I was raised, I've never let a little thing like not knowing how stop me from going after what I want. Kimber was just conversing with an older gentleman who was just asked by Miss Agnes to dance, so now is my chance. I get up and walk towards my destiny. This has been Me and the Helpful Hurricane Sweet Small Town Romantic Comedy in Good Grief, Idaho Book 3 Written by Jesse Gussman Performed by Jay Dice Special Appearance by Jesse Gussman Executive Production and Cover Art by Julia Gussman Editing by Heather Hayden Copyright 2021 by Jesse Gussman Production Copyright by Jesse Gussman